Preface to In Quest of El Dorado by Stephen Graham. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Quest of El Dorado by Stephen Graham. Preface. Having voyaged twice to America from British ports and once from Copenhagen, I determined on my fourth visit to approach America from Spain and try to follow Columbus's keel over the waters. This study of the quest of El Dorado is mostly on the trail of the Spaniards. The motive of the first explorers and pioneers was generally the quest of gold, and even today most people who seek America do so to make money, many to make a fortune. There is, therefore, a continuity through the centuries of the quest for fortune. My wife and I took Spanish ship from Cadiz in Spain to the Indies, landing at Puerto Rico, whence we visited, in turn, Haiti and Cuba. I saw San Salvador, the first land Columbus found, and was also in the Bahamas. We proceeded to New Orleans and then to Santa Fe in New Mexico. I visited Panama, however, alone, and climbed a peak in Darien, to realize once more what it meant to Balboa when for the first time his eyes lighted on the southern sea. After the Panama Exposition, I was joined by Wilfred Ewart, and with him we followed out some of the fantastic adventures of Coronado, and it took us to the famous Chaleco Dance at the center of the earth. With him, my wife and I rode to Jemez, and later we visited Mexico, where, unfortunately, Wilfred Ewart was killed by a stray shot on Old Year's Night. In Mexico, we followed the trail of Cortes, visiting the places which are most memorable in his conquest of Mexico. This took us to the ancient pyramids of the Anahuac Plateau and to the ruins and buried cities of the south. Throughout the descriptions and interpretations, Endeavor is made to measure the quest for power and the quest for gold in all these countries and territories. I have not visited the Republic south of Panama, but have confined myself to what an American general has called the Necklace of the Caribbean, the potential American dominion of the future. The drive of events is making democratic America into an empire. An imperial role is almost unavoidable. I have not, however, thought it necessary either to criticize or approve imperialism. I have made an odyssey, and I tell what I saw, not as Ulysses would have told it, but as one of those who at many points was ready to eat the lotus and not too mindful of Ithaca and home. My thanks are due to the New York Evening Post, which published many letters from far-off places, and to the American Legion Weekly, which, under the title of Panama and Panamerica, published my essay on the canal. Stephen Graham End of Preface Chapter 1 of In Quest of El Dorado by Stephen Graham This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 1 In Madrid I carried on my shoulder through the streets of Madrid Maria del Carmen de Silva y Azlor de Aragon. She was too proud to admit that she was tired, but was ready to accept the unexampled adventure of being carried in that way. Beside us prattled her brother, Javier de Silva y Azlor de Aragon, called Chippy for short. They are beautiful, evanescent-looking children, fairies rather than boy and girl, and nothing like the swarthy, barefooted urgents who beg of you, who want to clean your boots, who want to sell you water in every town of Spain. They look as if they had been studied from paintings before they were created. Velasquez painted them, and the children were created from his model, as the shade-like figures of the pictures of El Greco are reproduced in the ballet. My mind went back to that morose figure of the history books, Catherine of Aragon. Spain always makes the mind go back. Here I carried Carmen of Aragon on my shoulders, and it might be Henry VIII's first queen reincarnate as a little child. It is part of the unfairness of the history book 
that we only see a woman like Catherine soured and disillusioned and out of her national setting. She is only interesting as the wife who caused the English Reformation and the mother of Queen Mary of the Smithfield Fires. But she may have been some time a happy little child like Carmen, beautiful and innocent, a face to put with a Madonna to look up at her with flower-like adoration. The uncle of the children is the present Duke of Alva with a wonderful name of James Fitzjames Stuart and the amusing supernumerary title of Duke of Berwick, a tall and slender and haughty grandee who lives a life remote from public haunt, remote enough today from the pages of history, the Low Countries, and the scourge of heretics. So Carmen of Aragon pinches my ears as we stoop to avoid awnings and sunscreens, and she laughs like a Raphael-esque infant love, and the yellow parrots from upper windows scold us. Dark women with nine-inch or foot-long combs standing up from their black hair, and black veils, mantillas, hanging over their heads instead of hats, stare at us and smile. They survey me from my brown boots to my brown mustache to my red cheeks to my blue eyes, and they recognize the brood of the pirates. Inglesa, Inglesa, they whisper. I have not often been taken for an Englishman, but the Spaniards have no doubt. I may change my attire. I cannot change something. They have seen my like before. Instinctively, they don't altogether like me. Instinctively, I don't care too much for them, with their bull-like heads and all their somber eyes. There's something in the air which bids me think of thumbscrews. It may be the inherited bad conscience of the Drakes and the Raleighs and the dogs who harried the plate fleet 400 years ago, or it may be the horror in the bones which the association of Spain with human cruelty has bred in the mind. We walk from the Puerto del Sol, the harbor of the sun. Has not every city in Spain and in the Indies a Puerto del Sol? A confluence of streets and tramcars in the heart of the city, to a sort of baronial mansion in a narrow street. And there live a community of dukes and duchesses, marquises and marchionesses in suites of apartments. Though not castellated, the house is as massive as a castle, all of stone and built sheer on the too narrow pavement of a narrow cobbled street. The entrance is from a recess in the frontage of this stronghold, and as you step inside, you leave behind the street, its trams, its cries, and enter the stillness of history. The stone stairways and stately halls are hung with historical paintings of the families and with their spoils of battles fought long ago. Here is a great lamp clutched by a Saracen's hand. It was taken after the Battle of Lepanto. There, in cases, are the keys of the gates of the cities of Bruges and Ghent, taken in the wars of the 16th century. The gold, the jewels, come from the altars of Mexico and the idols of the Indians. The intervening centuries do not speak. Speaks only the great era of Spain. The mind leaps from that romantic time back to ours, with those wars and quarrels from which the Spain of today prefers to stand aloof. The gold which men got in quest of El Dorado, the gold which they piled on ships and guided past English and French pirates, gold which was the royal fifth, gold of the plate fleet, gold that was private fortune, the repairing of the splendor of the impoverished nobles of Castile, has been melted down and become national treasure, or currency, or personal adornment, or war indemnity, or war chest, or reparations. Some of it has been in the treasure tower of Spandau, some is in the vaults of Washington. All men have had their hands in it. Only a little remains in Spain, gilding altar screens, making showy merchants' chains, weighing in the treasures of the Escurial. Rapacity for gold killed Spain, we are told, and yet Spain has survived in a quiet, old-fashioned, dignified mode of life, and cares less today for gold than the rest of the nations. That, however, concerns very little my Carmen of Aragon, who will pass through life without ever knowing anything of reality, marrying some prodigiously polite grandee and not a bluff and cantankerous English Henry. She laughs, she imitates all I do or say, she walks away, 
and Chippy takes one of my hands in his and leads me to his mother, quiet and simple and pious and demure, all in dull black velvet. Tomorrow I shall go to the palace and see the king and queen and the grandees and their ladies wait on twenty-four of the poor of Madrid. You enter Spain through glass doors and see written up silence. You open your guidebook and find you are looking at Exhibit A. I have been told that Spain is like Russia, but there is a difference. Belief in Russia will survive the decease of Russia by at least 500 years. Something is coming out of Russia, yes. But out of Spain? No one goes to Spain to see the future. Many go there to see the past, sticking it out, as it were, through the present. And so with me, to make a sentimental journey and trail an idea geographically across the world. I should like to see Columbus again, see him in the midst of the courtiers and mocked by them, and see upon him the smile or frown of Ferdinand and Isabella. My eyes would like to feast on the cloth of gold of the grandees of Spain, go back four centuries, and yet be in today, and see, as it were, in a vision the gold of old Spain and the gold of the Indies, the beautiful bright gold that may be sacrificed but must never be worshipped. So I am pleased to go to the royal palace at Madrid on Maundy Thursday and see the king and the queen and the court in the gorgeous ceremony of the washing and the feeding of the poor. Once every year it is done. The queen tends twelve poor women. The king tends twelve poor men. They are usually all blind. It has been done for centuries. Ferdinand and Isabella did it also, and Columbus must have watched them in his day, saying of those who mocked him, they are blind, wash them and feed them also. As we stand in an interior court of the palace behind a row of halberders in quilted coats, the chime of eleven o'clock seems to blend with southern sunshine, and there breaks out from a hidden orchestra mysterious eastern music heralding the approach of today's king and queen. Searching, questing strains tell of mystery, of aching loneliness, and hidden loveliness the haunting introit of Milpager's Jerusalem. Erect stand the stately halberders in their scarlet coats, holding at arm's length their bright halberds of Toledo steel. And along the corridors of the palace come carelessly, and as it were at random, in twos and threes, talking together the Duke of Alva, the Duke of Medina Sidonia, the Duke of San Fernando, the Marquis of Santa Cruz, the Marquis of Torresia, and other nobles, all dressed in gold-embroidered coats and wearing orders and insignia and medals. They are the grandees of today, and their faces peer out strangely from the midst of their grandeur, peering out, as it were, from their family trees, from time itself. Come the king and the queen, and the king is wearing the uniform of an infantry captain, for this king is democratic, but over his shoulder hangs the magnificent collar of the Order of the Knights of the Golden Fleece. I wonder if the Emperor Charles V, Cortez's Emperor, instituting this Order of the Golden Fleece, thought first of his Spaniards as the Argonauts of that age, the youth of Spain aflame with a vision of gold. The golden collar hung in a long V on the king's back and seemed to have worked on it some noble history, reminding me that there, in the midst of the crush of the palace, of that perfect Spenserian verse, it framed was of precious ivory that seemed a work of admirable wit, and therein all the famous history of Jason and Medea was writ. Her mighty charms, her furious loving fit, his goodly conquest of the golden fleece, his falsed faith and love too lightly flit. The wounded Argo, which in venturous peace first through the Euxine seas bore all the flower of Greece. Columbus was a Jason of a later time, and there were many other Jasons and would-be Jasons, Cortes, Pizarro, Balboa, Coronado. The democratic King Alfonso wears his collar, however, with an easy grace, and there is upon his visage a whimsical expression which remains. The queen looks more like a queen than he does a king. She is wearing the diadem, and she walks like a queen in a picture, her long cream veil of lace enveloping her, trailing downwards and backwards as she walks. 
Her ladies are in luminous silks, with high combs in their hair and long lace mantillas like the queen's, cream-colored, hanging from their combs to the hems of their robes, giving them the mystery of beauty which is in part hidden and part revealed. Following them go the diplomats of all nations, all differently dressed in the full court dress of their respective nationalities, and they wear their stars and their ribbons, too. There goes the Chinese ambassador with embroidered golden dragons on his velvet coat. There goes the American ambassador in spotless lawn and glimmering white tie. The French and the Italian ambassadors look like diplomats, men with old secrets, profound players of human chess. Even the English minister looks as if he knew more than he would ever say. But the American is quite different. A new piece of cloth on a very old garment, as it were, upon Joseph's coveted coat of many colors. His fresh, clean-shaven, and young face surmounted on its stiff linen collar may have been recruited to diplomacy, and quite likely was, from a guileless Christian brotherhood. Though why turn the light on him, unless it is because the power he represents is the power in the new world, which today affects most the liberties of children of Spain overseas. Their representatives are here also, of Mexico, of Nicaragua, of Cuba, of Colombia, and here in state comes the Patriarch de las Indias himself, and with him the papal legate to Spain, the leaders of the Cortes, the prime minister, the government. All pass, and the halberders close up and the public follows. The chosen public ask to witness the monarch's charity. It is so arranged that all take up their places in the chamber where the poor are waiting, and then the king and the queen come in. I stand away at the back and look through the veils and screens of the hundreds of ladies' mantillas which hang from the high combs in their hair. It is as if the scene were too gorgeous and had to be viewed through a glass darkly. But yonder are the poor blind waiting in stalls, twelve black-shawled old women waiting for the queen, twelve empty-eyed men in silk hats waiting for the king. In front of them all stand golden ewers with water, and the ritual of washing commences. One spot of water is dropped on each foot, one rub of the towel to each, and then, stooping, the queen kisses each woman's big toe. The king kisses each man's big toe, too. Stately Queen Ana never changes her devout expression, but democratic King Alfonso who rules by smiles, makes a comical face all the while. Follows the feeding of them. All the grandees and their ladies take part. The queen takes the center on one side of the room, the king on the other. Vast quantities of viands are brought from the kitchens and pantries of the palace. Begins the comida de los pobres, and every helping is enough to feed a family, and every helping is given personally by the king and queen to the chosen poor. The king smiles all the time, and eats bits of what he gives, and tries to persuade the archbishop to eat also, and so break his fast, part of the king's prevalent facetiousness and jollity. Did he not make a wry face over kissing each old man's foot, as if it really were disgusting? Does he not on purpose break up the solemnity by dropping around rolling cheeses on the floor, and letting oranges slip out of his hands? That makes all feel happy all except the blind, they see nothing, they do not even eat. All that comes to them is taken away and packed into hampers to be sent to their homes. Their happiness is deferred. It is always so with the blind. They enjoy it later what those who see enjoy in anticipation. As the king and queen moved to and fro in that gilded crowd, it seemed I saw Columbus there. He saw and he gilded the grandees in time with a deeper crust of gold. Spain's positive contribution to civilization is a sense of human dignity. This is shown in private life by elaborate manners and the instinctive respect of man for man. Other nations used to have it. It is a marked characteristic of Shakespearean drama, but revolutions have removed it. In Spain, there is a delicacy of approach to strangers and even to friends which is unknown in the rest of the world. The bows, the marked detentions, the gravity and stately style of the Spaniard contrast remarkably with the self-enwrapped sufficiency of the Germans, 
the unrestrained to the americans the humorous slap dash of the english and the devil take the hindmost of the scotch the spanish houses too with their noble portals interior courts patios fountains bespeak a sense of dignity it is not a country of deal front doors and bottleneck passages like england nor of porches and porch swings like america nor of doors on the street like france it is true that the interiors are devoid of fancy upholstery there is a barrenness as of a castle an asceticism which expresses itself in straight-backed chairs but there will be flowers blooming and birds singing there will be a graciousness which is often missed in the seemingly overcomfortable over hospitable interiors of english and american houses gravity goes so far with the spaniards that he hardly will be seen wearing tweeds loud attire is an offence the spaniard wears black and seems to wear it out of general respect the women moreover do not flaunt their fashions in the churches or the streets in madrid the reproach cannot be made that you cannot tell the monde from the demimonde the latter is always more indiscreetly dressed the queen of spain has no legs you still drive with horses in madrid it is more decorous than the ill-mannered car bursting with speed even when going slowly and the rudeness of the klaxon and the tooting horn are distasteful to the spaniard behind fine horses at ease leisurely and graciously there it is true the women will show what paris wears then in the ways of men to women the spaniard surely has the first place for real politeness and regard the french say place dame but do not give it the englishman is gallant with women when they are good-looking or if they remind him of his mother but a spaniard's politeness is invariable doubtless the french at their best come nearest to the spanish in the respect for one another just as the north american yankees are furthest from them the french are the most humane people in the world because the most tolerant and ever so much less cruel in temperament than the spanish but their cotonniere the ribaldry of their burlesques the wretched homes the open and stinking conveniences of the capital of civilization decency forbids in madrid with all that however let a caveat be entered the spanish hold something which is increasingly valuable in our modern human society because it is all the while getting rarer the gold of good manners that is true and must remain after all adverse criticisms of the race but the spanish have a negative characteristic which through the centuries has outraged the fellow feelings of the rest of humanity and that is a cruelty a lust for torture the auto de fe the ordeals of the inquisition dungeons those in the past the survival of the bullring in the plaza de gallos these today and remarked at all times the spanish inhumanity to horses seems to outweigh good manners and the behavior of the crowd about the bullring hideously burlesque and unrestrained may perhaps have marked the crowds who in sevilla in the sixteenth century watched brother men burn to death for the good of the holy father at rome and the greater glory of god spain lovers had said to me do not go to the bullfight but in facing spain as in facing any other country with some desire to know it not merely to be struck by it one must face what is dark and sinister as well as what is beautiful and annunciatory hence a visit to the square of the bulls at madrid on easter sunday and the king is there and the president of the sport and a vast populace in sun and shade christ rose this morning this afternoon six bulls must die he rose indeed fifty thousand church bells told the world lilies triumphant rose from bare boards in every home we and all the children ate eggs of peace this afternoon easter is gone the populace will watch the bulls next to me on one hand sits a japanese artist with a score of paper fans in front are madonna-faced women with high yellow combs in the crown of their hair and cream-colored lace hanging therefrom in an exquisite effect the japanese has crayons and decorates his blank fans rapidly group after group he sketches in on these fluttering fans 
and then the grand parade of toreadors and all their finery and then the picadors and then the fighting he is concentrated he seems to feel nothing but when his twenty fans are done he gathers them together picks himself up looks around him circumspectly and departs i suppose bullfights are seldom described except in spain and the latin american countries in these the descriptions may exclude all other news and cover whole issues of daily papers with colored supplements as well but for people other than spanish there is something that is intolerably cruel in the bullfight it is even thought a little compromising in a public person to have visited one a british prime minister on holiday in andalusia indignantly denies that he went to a bullfight it would lose him votes in england yet spain is part of the civilized world and her conscience seems untroubled great crowds flock to see them and in madrid or sevilla on a sunday afternoon all the town is moving one way every city in spain has its permanent amphitheater for bullfighting and you may see as many as ten thousand spectators in the circles tier upon tier around the arena on no other occasion could one see as many spaniards together the bullfight is for them a great national turnout the bulls which have led a happy country existence up till now are waiting each for his last gory twenty minutes the picadors will prick him the staff will plant the banderillas in him the matador will endeavor to plunge a sword into his heart the public will hiss or clap the asses will drag the stiff carcass around the arena and away a great door opens into the arena plunges a big black bull into this universe and why not knowing he is full of mad energy and bolts for any red flag at any distance that his short sight will show him the elegant toreros save themselves by hiding behind screens or jumping low walls and while the bull stands thwarted and puzzled in comes a doleful procession from the wings the picadors arrive men with long lances mounted on starved jaded spectral looking horses the horses are blindfolded they also have their vocal cords cut and whatever happens to them dumb animals will be dumb the men mounted on them have strong wooden saddles with hooded stirrups and their legs are cased in iron the toreros with their red and blue capes and the attendants dressed in deep scarlet try to lure the bull towards the horses they stand in front of them and then nimbly step out of the way when the enraged bull charges at them the picadors drive their lances deep between the shoulders of the bull the bull murders the horse lifts horse and rider in the air the first picador saves himself his work is done the second then comes forward pricks the bull and has his horse disemboweled the third does the same the fourth horse refuses to come into position to be butchered and escapes with a laceration the time allotted to the picadors has run out anyway one horse lies dead the remaining horses are beaten till they rise and the picadors mount them again though their entrails are hanging out of them and they ride them out of the arena the bull is bleeding he is greatly enraged he paws the ground like a dog seeking a bone he bellows he charges here and there and always misses but the toreros plunge colored darts into his back till he is hanging in a clatter of them and he cannot shake them out then comes the matador dressed like a gentleman gold embroidered gallant with his hair in a tiny queue behind with his blood-red cape with his straight flashing blade of toledo he faces the bull alone and tempts him and fools him it is part of his art to perform various showy tricks and deceits jump the bull's back and the like on these his repute as a bullfighter depends then he must beguile the bull into a convenient attitude for dispatching him in the right way it is not too easy the impatient crowd which bawls and guffaws and cries out witticisms now hisses and taunts the fighter and claps the bull when the bull makes an aggressive onslaught the matador must take a risk and make an opportunity twice he essays twice he loses his sword new swords are brought him and at the third attempt he puts two feet of steel into the lifeblood of the bull the bull pauses stares 
still flourishes his horns, keeps his enemies at a distance, and then, beginning to lose consciousness, kneels down on his front knees like a cow taking a rest in a meadow. The toreros are all around him. He stares at them with glazing eyes. Then the matador plucks out his sword and the bull rolls over dead. Trumpets blow. Out comes the troika of asses, and one set is harnessed to the dead horse, and the other to the body of the bull. In the circles of the amphitheater, ten thousand voices are busily discussing it, but ere they have got far in talk, the arena has been cleared, and all are hushed as the great door opens, and bull number two comes rushing on to die. It makes a devastating impression on the heart of the northerner makes you, for that afternoon at least, hate Spain. It is so depressing that for days you cannot get over it. The horror of it haunts one as if one somehow had learned that humanity had gone wrong and that no life anywhere was worthwhile. Curiously enough, however, you meet Englishmen and Americans who have been many times. I sat next to an Englishwoman who somehow had come to enjoy the fight thought the matadors so elegant, so wonderful, thought they ran such a risk, and so they do, excused much on the ground that the meat was sold cheap to feed the people of the slums. And now some time has elapsed, and I can well understand it. Despite all the horror and pain of it, I also feel a persistent craving to go again. There is a fatal fascination in this brutal sport, you want to see those fearsome bulls killed, want to look on at death. The last Englishman I met had been to twenty-two, yet at his first he was so ill he had almost to be carried out. Cruelty, like other lusts, grows on what it feeds on. Englishmen, though naturally they at first reject it, can take pleasure in cruelty also. On the Texan border, where under United States law bullfighting is forbidden, the Spanish population still have mock bullfights at religious festivals. In these you may see Sancho Panza mounted on a turbulent ass as picador and a lot of very broad farce. But there is often a religious element, the matador coming forth as Christ and the bull all in red as Satan. A remarkable reversal of Christian symbolism, this. He who returned to Malchus the ear which Peter had struck off will destroy evil with a sword. Still, it is only a game and well in keeping with the spirit of church plays in olden times. The parody of the bullfight is much happier than the fight itself. A deficiency in Spanish character is humor. The Spaniard is very witty, usually apt at repartee, but he does not easily smile. This is especially noticeable in the children. There is something of the morose in them which does not readily dissolve in laughter or tears. Perhaps this can be taken as a partial explanation of Spanish cruelty. They have somber minds. Of course, one ought not to make the mistake of placing upon the Spaniards the whole of our iniquity. There is no race that can show a history devoid of cruelty. If the followers of Cortes burned the soles of the feet of the last of the Aztec kings to find out where his gold was hidden, did not the barons of England do the same to the Jews to furnish them with money for the Crusades? Though the Inquisition caused men and women to be burned to death for heresy in Seville, are not people to be found in Georgia ready to do the same today to Negroes for a smaller offense? Is there a page in Spanish history which shows more inhumanity to man than has been displayed in the Russian Revolution? The Spaniard is cruel, it is admitted, and he is cruel in ways which are particularly obnoxious to the Anglo-Saxon, who, when he sees a man ill-treating a horse, is almost ready to rush in and kill the man. But other people can be cruel also. That does not extenuate the Spaniard's fault, but it is permitted to remark without offense, he is cruel, but he has remarkably good manners. He has a greater sense of the dignity of life. End of chapter 1
Chapter 2. En route for Cadiz. Traveling by way of Rouen and Chartres to Burgos and Toledo, and by way of Bordeaux to Cordova and Cadiz, prompt certain comparisons. Spain is grander than France. France has more life. The note of the Gothic is aspiration out of stone, but that of the Moorish is barbaric splendor within the stone. The asceticism of stone reigns at Durham, at Rouen, and is somehow transfigured into the loveliness of dove's plumage at Chartres. But in the Spanish cathedrals speaks chiefly gold. It is the same at Burgos, gilded with some of the first gold of Mexico, as it is at the Cathedral of Toledo, architecturally unremarkable, but interiorly oppressed with riches. As you enter by the old doors, it is not so much into the presence of God as into the power of the church. Spain is the most faithful son of the church, and France the most reprobate. France, like the prodigal, may nevertheless be nearer to salvation. France is germinative and, if cynical, yet eternally curious, whereas Spain is incurious. Spain does not want to know. She is the last of the democracies of Europe to rebel. Probably the state of society in Spain could not be defined as a democracy. The great ports of Spain are, however, different in temperament from the cities of the interior. Boisterous Bilbao in the north and Barcelona in the south are insurgently democratic. In these is a revolutionary movement pointing against church and monarchy. In these there is an energy, a commercial hustle, a will to power, which reminds one of the cities of northern Italy. Geographers, mapmakers of Europe, seem very much at fault in the way they print the names of Spanish towns. The faint print usually reserved for villages is used for Santander and Bilbao, but these are great and stirring cities with modern buildings which for beauty and strength of design can be compared only with the architecture of the greater cities of the United States. Again, how absurd it is to print Bayonne and Baritz in a large type and indicate San Sebastian, their neighbor across the Spanish frontier, in faint italics. San Sebastian is a magnificent city and a most beautiful resort. You can see Spain there in the season at its grandest. But one would not have been surprised to find Toledo printed fine, for there, truly famous though it be in history, we have an obscure, unchanging seat of the past. Toledo is more truly Spain than is Bilbao or Barcelona. It is the Spain that was. Toledo is a close-packed, mountain-built city of winding, narrow, shady ways and high, overhanging ancient houses. It reminds one of the Saracen villages high up on the cliffs above the sun-bathed Riviera. It was Moorish and Jewish before it was Spanish, famous throughout the Middle Ages for its steel. They try to sell you Toledo swords in a score of little shops today, and in the past, has not Toledo steel pushed its way through the vitals of innumerable duelists? And Spanish mail, Spanish armor, Spanish shields, and Spanish swords have had an immense repute. It was the southern counterpart of Swedish steel. But Solingen has gone on and made domestic cutlery for the teeming populations of industrialism, whilst Toledo still makes swords. Toledo has no streetcars. Toledo has no cinema. It has no cable office. Its hotels, spacious and quaint, have no rooms with bath, no room telephones. There are barber shops, but the poles do not revolve. Nothing revolves. There is a pack of some of the most persistent beggars I have ever seen. Blasco Ibanez says they live on the English and American tourists who visit the cathedral, and he sneers at the tourists' stupidity and credulity. But if the tourists cease to come, the beggars would not cease to be. This beggary is a disgrace to a rich country like Spain. That small boy should rush in to beg the sugar you have left over from your morning cup of coffee is unseemly and out of keeping with the otherwise stately ways of the people. In Spain, thousands beg who could quite well be earning a living, and the mendicacy of these defeats the case of the paralyzed, the blind, the aged, 
from whom few would otherwise turn away. In Toledo, however, lurks the great cathedral, like some strange rare monster of the past. It is horribly cramped, and seems to be trying to hide its vast, aged form from modern gaze. There lies the dust of kings, emperors, archbishops, undisturbed, unprovoked. It seems the low notes of the organ should never swell to anything clamorous and new. All is hushed as you walk around. Gloom of unlighted centuries is upon you. From this to the blue sea, what a change! From this to the fresh and breezy harbor of Cadiz, to Spain's window onto the new world, her most romantic starting point in all her history. It is a long journey. I prefer to go third class. It makes a tremendous difference, for the carriages are always full, always emptying, changing, filling again with Spanish humanity. The second and first class coaches are more or less empty. Empty also that curious apartment called the Berlin. There is a train deluxe from Madrid to Cadiz. In that, of course, you can travel in comfort and sleep at night sleep also by day, and pass the scenery in Spain as rapidly as a millionaire could wish. This train is called a mixto, like the Shmeshani in Russia. When it comes to a halt, the engine driver gets out. A man on an ass starts off to tell the village that the train has come, and that if anyone wants to catch it, he had better begin packing. It doesn't matter where you get to or when you get there. I took my first day's ticket to a name of a place at random, Vadoyano. The booking clerk bade me repeat it, and then sold me the ticket. I occupied myself trying to imagine what sort of a hotel I'd find there. The train commenced its uneasy retardation onward, crawling upward over Spain. Dark but gentle-looking folk filled the carriage, always saluting with a buenos dias when they entered, and an adios when they got out, and never starting to eat or drink anything without offering all around to do the same. My wife and I kept a nicely filled basket and a bottle of sherry, and we joined very happily in the children's game of offering our food, knowing it would be declined. We found, however, that two invitations to a glass of sherry usually overcame the modesty of the peasants, who, surprised and pleasantly shocked at finding the wine to be of Zeri's, seemed upon drinking it to become our friends for life the men wore close-fitting black caps or those broad-brimmed box-topped hats that one associates with pictures of west indian planters the women wore long earrings commonly of tortoise shell the men and the children wore many rings they traveled with birds frequently bringing their canaries of which they seemed very fond into the train with them in came beggars in came singers a blind boy sang folk songs in a strange, wild tone, rather harsh at first hearing, but growing on the ear. His melodies went from the guttural into the minor and touched one's heartstrings truly enough. Girls are wearing flowers in their hair, and here comes a sight that reminds me well of the Caucasus, a tight pig of wine. From out the little window we look upon many vineyards, brown, stubbly, scarce shooting green though the season is advanced. It is high land and bracing, and yet also a wine country. Men come in with wooden boxes, and in these boxes are bungs which they withdraw to drink from the hole. How people talk, as if there were springs in their mouths, and each sentence was rapidly and mechanically let loose from the lips. No one has any interest in the view from the window. The only interest is human interest. However, we pass at points through bull farms, herds of Andalusian bulls waiting for their testing for the bullring, or, having been tested, waiting for that gory last half hour of torment and red flags. The bulls always take the eyes of the people. They have an enormous interest in them. One might almost say that the Spaniard had got a reflection of the bull in his countenance now. The bull is his national animal. It was very dark by the time Variana was reached, for the train was late. I got out and was followed by a half-naked beggar boy who answered no questions, being so intent on begging. Outside the station there seemed to be nobody and no town. I sought a shelter and could find none. 
In dismay, I returned to the station and found the ticket checker of the train, and he advised me to take another ticket to Baeza. The old train was waiting, had not budged, and would wait a half hour more. And so to Baeza and a mosquito-caged bed in a hotel which smelt as hotels smell when they are the worst. Next day we went on to beautiful Cordoba. Here was a new vision of Spain, one less ascetic and fierce than that of the north. The sun had driven out the somber. In Cordoba, with its white houses and fresh-blooming flowers, its beautiful gates and doors and interior courts with palms and fountains, we had a vision of beautiful living. The whole of Cordoba is like a precious work of art. I suppose everyone who learns to love it must be loath to leave it. But we are making for that window on to the new world, longing for that new way to India, the new Spain. The train goes on along the Guadalquivir Valley through all the sherry vineyards and growing green for miles, the town of Zeres itself, and onward to Gibraltar at the end of the world. And there at the end, far out on a loop of land on the loveliness of the sea, was Cadiz, the city of the Armadas and the going and coming of the plate fleet, a city now of white houses, Spaniards, cats of all kind, and innumerable parrots who out-talk humanity on its streets. All of that, but a few ships. I walk along the seafront on that street that bears the proud name Vasco Núñez de Barroa, and I see three ships, and among them the one that is waiting for me. End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of In Quest of El Dorado by Stephen Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three: The Columbus Journey. We left the beautiful harbor of Cadiz with its white houses and palm trees and its daintily silhouetted towers and turrets, and the shores unclasped the blue bay, and we rode upon the billows of the ocean. The ship was a Spaniard and all the people on it were Spanish or West Indian, and the voyage we were making was the one Columbus made, seeking a new way to India and coming upon the Indies. And the very first evening, and every evening, we pushed our prows into the setting sun, not seeking, of course, but knowing, with the romance of the first journey mostly forgotten. The passengers are mostly Cubans, and they kiss their hands to tell me what a fine place Cuba is, how perfect their capital. They put salt in their café au lait, plaster salt on their sliced oranges before eating them, and pour from the salad oil bottle onto every dish they eat. Their children, with bare legs, black hair, gold earrings, run around all day with little dogs on strings, and shout. There is no dancing on the ship, no orchestra, but instead mass three times a week, and the saloon is made up as a chapel. The ladies are very big, if young, and lie in deck chairs doing nothing. The men play dominoes and smoke cigars. We put in at Tenerife and take on crates of onions for 24 hours. Boys and boats beset us with canaries in cages, pups in sacks, and fat, wise-looking parrots on perches. The reek of onions drives out the stowaways from the hold. Onions litter the bottoms of the empty barges. Squashed onions disfigure our decks. Indeed, everybody and everything smells of onions for two days. The food is Spanish, and of a sort the sailors of Columbus must have known. All is cooked in olive oil, and I notice the Cubans and Puerto Ricans are not pleased if the plates do not gleam. Heaped up plates of rice and chicken, rice and little bits of rabbit, rice and bits of beef come nearly every day, and Spanish omelets and olive stew and remarkable dishes of highly spiced fish covered with flaming pimento. There is an excellent table wine of which there is an inexhaustible supply, and it is as free as air, and there is a glass of sherry for everyone on Sunday evening. The Spaniards do well on this. Even little Maria Luisa, aged ten, and Isabel, aged eight, my two best friends, have their wine and sherry, and disperse with vigor the oily heaps of food. 
One evening, these precious little girls borrowed some matches. What to do? To finish smoking a fat Havana cigar which one of the men passengers had left on deck. The children talked to one another more by gestures than by words, and I shall never forget how one of them, Palmira, described a bullfight she had seen at Barcelona and the horror of it, lowering her head between her shoulders and looking out with gleaming eyes to imitate the bull, jumping to indicate terror and assault, putting her little hand before her eyes at the thought of the disemboweling of the horses, and showing with a horrified twinkling of her fingers the impression of the flowing of the blood. Bullfights are forbidden in Cuba, but these children had been to Spain on a holiday, and so had seen the national and traditional festival for the first time. In fifteen days on a little ship with two dozen passengers, one naturally learns a great deal. An English person is a rarity on such a ship, and everyone sought to engage me in conversation. They were as much interested in Cristobal Colón and Ponce de Leon and Núñez de Balboa as I was, and had pictures of Columbus in their pocketbooks, and thought how greatly he'd have been struck to be traveling on such a boat as ours. This one is a beautiful voyage, so serene, with blue skies every day and a just waving sea and a breeze behind the boat that wafts our smoke ahead of it. It is delicious to sit up on the very nose of the vessel and be a Columbus now. We are splashing at new, splashing at white, in stars and white balls and darts of surprised foam. Green and yellow seaweed sags up from the depths of the ocean, and, like untraversed liquid glass, the sea is ahead of us in curving lines and natural wild parallels to the sun. It is afternoon. The sun is going over and will go under. He is drawing us on, and I could almost believe our steam counts for naught. He is illuminating the wide empty ocean, and we stare till we veritably see latitude and longitude upon it. We ascend, we lift, we rive away o'er the mirror in virginal V's of new frothing foam. We are making for the center of the far horizon, the sun ahead of us. We are making a new way to India. We are going to make west-east. Each still night we seem to pass through something, as it were through mists and veils which are hiding something new. Each morning we rush on to the decks whilst they are still wet, and the Castilian sailors are swabbing them. We peer with glasses over the virginal, fresh, foaming blue. The sailors go. The sun dries the timbers. We partake of coffee and smoke a sweet-scented Habana cigarette. The sailors return and pull up white canvas awnings at the cracks and at the sides of which glimmers blue sky and brightness of sea. The children come out from their cabins to play, tumbling over their pet dogs. All is happiness. The men indulge in a new sport to while away the time. They try to catch the fast-passing seaweed which lies in sponges and coils in the limpid sea. While Columbus took heart of grace because of the banks of seaweed his ship encountered, believing it a sign of the proximity of land, we, on our Spanish ship, making in prosaic fashion a bought and paid-for passage to the Indies, find the same seaweed a means of fun. Four or five Cubans and Spaniards take a bottle and a rope and a tangle of wire and fish for seaweed from the bows. The weather side gets quite a little crowd upon it, for the crew also take part in the joy of throwing out a bottle and wire to entangle floating green tresses of sea maidens or big floating sponges of their toilets. Often the bottle flies through the air and often goes up the chorus of disappointment as it hits a wave instead of a bank of weeds. But the exultation is great when a tangle is caught and brought up on deck. It is very pretty and hair-like, and the little children press it between the pages of Ibanez's novels which form the only literature on board. That which heartened Columbus diverted us. Then we entered the tropics and slept in the hot noontides, waking to clatter up on deck into the freshness of afternoon breezes. The evenings were very beautiful, sunset always giving a pageant. One night there came the most flaming and devastating sunset 
described beyond perilous and mountainous clouds and from the north all the way to the west a grand processional mass of shadows was seen fleeing like the pageant of the world's vanities going to judgment to us it was poetry but to columbus and his companions it might well have suggested a growing nearness to the actual place of doom to where the sun actually dipped down and went under the flat earth a terrible thought yet for a daring spirit a haunting and alluring one also i suppose there came a point in columbus's voyage when he might as well keep on as turn back turning back became more terrible the longer they kept on and curiosity must have fed on itself and increased at any rate it is still terrible to stand in the stern at night and look back there in the darkness lies the past like a book that is read or written and a door that is shut it breathes silence the clamorous old world is far behind and cannot be heard we started with a young crescent moon and she grew to the full with us over the still ocean the stars seemed to wave and our mainmast jagging to and fro seemed intent on sighting and taking aim at the loveliness in the sky we are escaping we are going away we are doing what they did we are shooting the moon all the cubans and puerto ricans and haitians seem to take on more life become more vivacious there is no mistaking it they are nearing their homes they have been as homesick for the indies as the mariners were homesick for spain it's all in reverse order you'd like havana it's bigger and better than barcelona i am told yes better than madrid the ship comes into more humid airs and in the evening all the passengers begin to croon spanish songs they are all together and happy men women and children and they feel they are getting near their blessed islands it infects the crew infects everyone like an extra idleness till we come at last one night to a balmy and dreaming coast where the coconut palms like cobweb dusters rise up to the low clouds of the sky and the full moon through the mists shines in silver from the waves to the shore we are there at last we have got to the other side the ship goes still and hoots we have our last supper together there is plenty of wine drink deep cry the cuban passengers to those of us who disembark at puerto rico it is ultimo vino your last glass of wine puerto rico is not dry oh yes say the puerto ricans mournfully you see it belongs to the united states cuba is only under the supervision of america but puerto rico belongs to her and is dry seca seca they cry explanatorily in spanish well with the last glass here's to christopher columbus who discovered the island he made the bridge from old spain and incidentally brought the first fire water too all we who arrive arrive after him we enter the harbor of san juan de puerto rico and leisurely pass the old stone castle on the rock and the spanish fortifications they look to be several centuries older than they are and are not unlike the weather-beaten ruins at the entrance to old ports on the east of scotland they mounted spanish guns but were without power to repel the north american invader of eighteen ninety eight the island was then wrested from spain and added territorially to the united states natives of puerto rico are now ipso facto american citizens it was novel to me to realize that a whole population of american citizens was without english and that many did not know george washington from abraham lincoln the boat was hailed by the quarantine authorities and stopped the spanish captain the doctor and the officers all seemed very nervous this was apparent to the american doctor and immigration officials who strove to keep them calm there was nothing to worry over the inspection was only a formality the crew and the passengers lined up and showed their arms to be free from skin disease the aliens were vaccinated the immigration officers were remarkably polite they brought copies of the new york times on board and those who could read english glanced at the news they sat us one by one in front of them and asked us all those funny questions what is your nationality 
what is your race are you a polygamist do you believe in subverting an existing government by force have you ever been in jail how much money have you got where is your final destination are you booked through imagine old columbus being questioned by an immigration officer there's something humorous about it and spaniards whose forefathers manned the galleons of the plate fleet and lorded it on land and sea now pay in addition to ten dollars for a passport visa a head tax of eight dollars ere they land but all that is prose there is no poetry in it as there is little poetry in the white books of the united states lies damned lies and statistics as we say in england the americans are a light-hearted humor-loving people but they are dull and forbidding as officials the spanish even in an old spanish harbor felt nervous at last the ship is free and moves upon the silken water toward the palm trees and the white houses and the brigantines and schooners and sailing boats beside the shore negroes all in white with fat cigars in their mouths handle our luggage and in ten minutes the passengers are dispersed to hotels and to their homes end of chapter three Chapter 4 of In Quest of El Dorado by Stephen Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico was discovered by Columbus in 1493, and he entered the port of San Juan, naming it San Juan de Puerto Rico, St. John of the Fine Harbor, hence the name of the island itself, Puerto Rico. The Indians there were in a low state of civilization and showed little sign of wealth. The island seems at first to have presented less interest than its neighbors. Santo Domingo became the beloved of Columbus. Cuba became the chief Spanish base for exploration and conquest. Puerto Rico enjoyed, therefore, comparative peace for 16 years after its fatal discovery. Then came Ponce de Leon, and after him, plunderers and pacificators with sword and hemp, killing, ravishing, enslaving. The despoiling of the Indians of their gold and jewels was followed by dispossession of their lands, and then the capture of their persons for the slave trade. Ships were fitted out in Cuba, with sole mercantile objective of capturing the Indians of the islands and selling them into bondage. Slaving may have proved profitable, but in the long run it was unpractical. The Indians entirely disappeared, and at the beginning of the 17th century were reported to Spain as extinct. There were no longer enough servile hands to do the hard work. So, in place of the lost Indians, the Spanish colonists felt forced to import Africans. The Negro slaves throve under conditions which killed Indians, they increased, and the Spaniards mixed their blood with them and bred from them. Hence the large Negroid population of the Indies at this day. The same happened in Darien, Panama, Costa Rica. Negroes largely displaced Indians. In Mexico, however, Africans were not imported to any extent, as the Indians, though rebellious, were in large numbers, and there were many tribes accustomed to slavery. The Spaniards settled Puerto Rico and grew sugar and bananas, which they brought over from the Canaries, and tobacco, which was indigenous. They lived in a humdrum state, taxed, of course, interfered with a great deal by Spanish governors, but generally enjoying the wealth and ease of a luxuriant tropical island. Thus, for three centuries, when suddenly all the Spanish colonies followed the example of the North American Demarch, and endeavored to throw off the yoke of the mother country. Mexico, Guatemala, Salvador, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Colombia, Ecuador, Venezuela, Peru, Bolivia, Argentina, Paraguay, Chile, all gained their freedom before 1825. Puerto Rico fought for three years and failed, 1821 to 1823. Spain remained in possession. Fifty years later, slavery was abolished. The free republics of Central America had abolished it in 1824. However, in 1873, the Negroes of Puerto Rico became free Spanish subjects. 
In 1897, Puerto Rico even obtained home rule under a Spanish governor general. But next year came the war between the United States and Spain, and Puerto Rico was annexed. Cuba had also failed in 1823, and for the rest of the century remained disaffected. The Cuban is of a much more violent disposition than the Puerto Rican. Cuba has never been wholly in a state of peace and contentedness since it was discovered. A widespread guerrilla warfare lasted from 1868 to 1878, and in 1895 Maximo Gomez led another revolutionary war. By that time, despite constant unrest, foreigners had acquired considerable property in Cuba. There were American, British, and French planters besides Spanish ones. Naturally, in a state of civil war, as in Mexico during 1910 to 1920, there was much damage done to foreign property. At this, the United States took umbrage. On February 15, 1898, the U.S. battleship Maine blew up in the harbor of Habana. The Spaniards say it blew up accidentally. The American impression given in the American press was that the Spaniards, to whom the presence of the vessel was thought to be distasteful, had blown it up on purpose. Others think the Cubans blew it up to instigate the war. On the other hand, some Cubans aver that the Americans themselves blew it up, but that is not credible. Probably it was an accident. But this was the spectacular event which an emotional public needed, like calling down of the flag at Fort Sumter in 1861, like the supposed onslaught of the Mexican army upon the forces of General Taylor in 1846. The sinking of the Maine was just what was needed to rouse democracy of the North to war. An ultimatum was presented to Spain. Spain must make immediate peace in Cuba. Spain was very polite and promised to do what she could. But the war feeling demanded more. On April 19, 1898, the United States Congress voted that Cuba was henceforth an independent state and called upon Spain to give up Cuba. Next day, the Spanish ambassador left Washington and there was war. In the arbitrament of force, Spain stood no chance. There were a few months of one-sided warfare, and the honor of Spain was satisfied. Spain faced her challenger, shots were exchanged, Spain was wounded and retired from the field. Cuba was given liberty, Puerto Rico was annexed. Does one need to stress the annexation of Puerto Rico? Is it worthwhile inquiring whether the Puerto Ricans should also have been given their liberty? Perhaps not, generally speaking, as the government of states and empires goes on today. Puerto Rico has only a million and a quarter inhabitants, is only 3,400 square miles in extent. But I stress the annexation in this study because it seems especially important in the development of the power of the United States of North America. The Spaniards took Puerto Rico for greed. No tears need be shed over them. The United States did not take it over from that motive, but it was a step forward in her quest for power. The Castilian flag went down, the flag of the quest for gold. The American flag went up, the flag of the quest for power. San Juan de Puerto Rico is a gay and pretty little city, without crime, without dirt, and without much poverty. Revolvers are not fired promiscuously. Heaven's water carts lay the dust each afternoon. There is a luxurious American hotel, and Spanish ones which are less luxurious. You eat to music, and can be fed in airy restaurants by eager Italians. Babbitt orders his stack of hot cakes and soft-boiled eggs for breakfast. Francisco Morales sits down meekly to coffee and a small roll. The well-fed, broad-faced businessmen of the States walk with India rubber step. Happy, tubby Texans, lordly lumps of Louisiana. The tropic, which dries the Spaniard, does not reduce the North American. The young men are clean-cut and handsome, but soon sag, owing to lack of exercise and the habit of bathing in hot water instead of cold. The Puerto Rican is not so dependent on a car, eats less, and certainly bathes less, be it in hot or cold. 
You know the ex-Spaniard by his spare form and swarthy complexion. The Spanish sombrero is being chased off the island by standard American hats. Likewise, the Spanish shirt by the more expensive silk shirt of the American working man. The blue overalls or slops of the laborer are also common. It is difficult to buy an article of attire which is of local manufacture and style. Even Panama hats, it appears, have to be sent to New York and re-exported. Inter-island trade is very scanty. Once a month, a small Dutch cargo boat arrives from Jamaica, but it seems to bring very little. Characteristic of modern San Juan is the barber shop, with its striped pole revolving in glass case. There, the Spaniards, getting their hair cut, have their neck shaved also, and a bareness left above the ears, and having gotten a shave, they get an American hot towel also pressed upon their brows and temples. Truly, as you stand on the quay and watch the ferry boats, modeled on those of the Hudson River, go screaming across the harbor, you feel there is some justification for the saying that San Juan is a miniature New York. One thing, however, it lacks, and that is an adequate number of shoeshine parlors. Like Bedouins who have a monopoly of the visitors to the Sphinx, so a tribe exists in San Juan who hold the blacking brush to the world. When an imperial race arrives, there is a great competition among the natives as to who shall clean their boots. The tribes especially swarms around the town square, which, banked with flora and shaded with luxuriant palms, might otherwise be a pleasant place to rest. Even at night, after supper, when the town band is playing to a flocking crowd under a dreaming moon, you are treated to a sort of jazz interposition of shine, shine, shine. The voices of the street urchins and news vendors have the same quality of voice as those of Cadiz. Boy babies come forth from their mother's wombs howling, Democratia! The stones of the high houses repeat their cries. But there are no parrots shouting on the streets of San Juan. There used to be, for Spanish sailors brought them. But in some streets of Cadiz, one might have thought there was a riot, what with the news vendors below and the parrots in the upper stories. Coming direct from Cadiz, one notices many divergences in the detail of life. For instance, Cadiz has no cinemas. San Juan has five or six, showing all the Californian stars. In Cadiz, there were several theaters with dancing and singing. In San Juan, there was only one with a visiting Spanish artist. In Cadiz, no one rocks or swings on a veranda. In San Juan, on the other hand, there are no bullfights. Most of what bound the island to Spain has been now cut. Only a few educated people know who is king of Spain. Out in the country, however, life is more definitely Spanish and American influence is less felt. The Negro life is greater there and seems to relate neither to Spain nor to America. It hardly seems to relate to Africa either. The Negroes live in saffron and marine-colored boxes, little bigger than bathrooms, and what they crowd into these cabins makes them like Noah's arks with all the toy furniture and animals inside. You'll see them stuck right in the midst of a swamp with thousands of land crabs crawling on the tips of their claws and feeling in the air with their portentous extra talons. The mangoes hang their fruits like tassels. The palm trees rise up like vast, lissom, feminine forms, swathed to the waist, and then bright naked to their matted heads, where cluster their giant nuts. The banana palms bask in solar radiance and hot mist, and last year's shabby sugar plantation stretches for a mile of bashed canes and sprawling withered leaves and naked children improvise a throb of music with a tin can band while others dance to it a natural shimmy shake living among the colored folk are poor white spanish puerto ricans on quite an equal basis and their pale babies run about in the sun too only they are not musical and do not dance the grown girls, white and black, are beautiful creatures, dazzling with their bright dresses, their vitality, and their unthwarted curves. The Negro men are finer than the Spanish ones, however, and naturally a long way simpler. I never saw a Negro men so happy and untroubled as here. 
the negro without a complex without the blues nearby goes the military high road hard and straight and along it hoot america's cars the little island is traversed by a whole series of magnificent roads of great value from the point of view of war but now a happy means of touring the country the automobile parade from packard to ford goes past before your eyes and beside private cars fly strings of little motor buses all packed with people each bus has a name and that adds greatly to the amusement of the road thus we have coney island cristobal colon excuse my dust maria luisa and a hundred more these are worked by the spanish-speaking people for spanish-speaking people you will seldom meet an american in one i found afterwards in colon and mexico city and santo domingo and port au prince and other places these converted ford trucks swarm and are great if a risky means of locomotion the puerto rican wagonettes are if anything quieter in their demeanor than the mexican ones so they scour the ways from ports and tobacco towns over the low ranges of tree-covered sugarloaf mountains to other towns and ports and villas and resorts when far away on the verdure covered hills they show where the roads are by their turbulent dust you see almost the whole range of class life in puerto rico from the bottom to the broad top from yellow wooden cabin to the latest type of american home for whites an american standard of life has been set rich as the island is and simple and remote the artificial prices of new york nevertheless range your room at the hotel with bath and telephone will cost you from three to five dollars a day you will sit down to the characteristic breakfast of grapefruit ham and eggs corn cakes and coffee ice and water continually tinkles in glasses yonder is the ice cream soda bar the suit pressers are all busy keeping proper creases in the breeches of the islanders american men wearing their white suits and linen collars look smarter than the puerto ricans and the women if quieter in looks at least keep to the fashions business of course is king you feel that at every turn by the look of the advertisements and the trend of the talk puerto rico hums as it has never hummed before it goes it is a real live place the dominant spirit of the anglo-saxon has overcome the gentle sluggish conservatism of old spain rich puerto ricans and there are many of them live in luxury in beautiful villas with every possible means of material happiness books baths electric light fans tile floors perfect mosquito nets and the whitest sheets and the softest of pillows and the water is pure and the drains are good thanks in a great part to a quarter of a century of ownership and exploitation by the u s a the material benefit which has come to puerto rico through the annexation is considerable in 1901 she was included within the american tariff union and all her products could enter the american harbors duty free she entered the american postal unity the american dollar became her unit of currency american traders taught puerto rican middlemen how to make money and american planters from louisiana showed the proper way to raise sugar the annual output of sugar has been increased to ten times what it was in 1898 on the other hand there are material and political disadvantages though puerto rico has free trade with america she has it not with the rest of the world a high tariff excludes european goods spanish america has profited immensely by cheap german wares but the fordney tariff keeps them out of puerto rico puerto rico pays excessively for scores of articles and commodities which she could otherwise import cheaply from France and Spain, to say nothing of England. Prohibition of wines and spirits is said to have been achieved by local option, but if so, it was before the population was able to vote. Trial by jury is not given in Puerto Rico. Puerto Ricans are citizens of the USA by virtue of the Jones Act of 1917. They were enabled to be conscripted for the army, but they do not have the power to vote. They are represented in the United States Congress only by a commissioner. They have no senator. They have no part in electing the president. Now there has sprung up what may be called a Puerto Rican Sinn Féin movement, 
featured in a concerted attack on the administration. Many Americans now advocate statehood for Puerto Rico. But the Puerto Ricans clamor for independence. Puerto Rico is in the anomalous condition of belonging to the USA, but is not a state nor governed by the Constitution. She is a possession. And the general Spanish discontent which rules in Cuba, Haiti, and Santo Domingo outcrops in Puerto Rico also. Just as the popular song Es Mi Hombre, which tires the ears in Madrid, has gone through these islands and is no doubt ravaging Mexico and all the mainland, so the one insurgent Spanish emotion has infected all the islanders. And in Puerto Rico, journalists in the newspapers and street orators in the squares are flirting with the idea of a revolt. The street politicians seemed very nervous when anyone looking like an American came near. It is difficult to know what test to apply to the institutions of Puerto Rico, where, for instance, trial by jury cannot be claimed. If the test of empire, the trouble would be hardly worth considering. But if the test of Lincolnian democracy, the Puerto Ricans have grievances which could be removed. The removal would take little effort. The island is well governed and is civilized and prosperous. Given her independence, it is all too likely that her present happiness would fall away from her. End of chapter 4「In Quest of El Dorado」by Stephen Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5. Santo Domingo and Haiti Over the sea in a tiny boat to the island of Haiti, and to the eastern half of it, which is called Santo Domingo. The voyage is still westward and along the 18th parallel, and not for long out of sight of land, be it the northern shore of Puerto Rico or the southern shore of Santo Domingo. The sea reeks with warm exhalations, and in the turgid water lurk sharks. Don't fall off the ship as she lurches and rolls, and you hold to the ropes. You may not be saved if you do. Twenty-four hours brings you to the little tropic river where the massed palm trees with their bushy heads peep forth out of the jungle at the intruder and we slush slowly along the banks, through the heat to a jaded-looking dock and some clammy warehouses, and behold, it is the capital of the Dominican Republic, I suppose one of the meanest and dirtiest capitals in the world. Yonder is the government building on which flies the white cross flag of the Republic, and level with it the stars and stripes of the United States. For the Republic has the brokers in, she borrowed heavily and unwisely and then could not pay, and so the customs were seized, and with the customs, the government itself. Santo Domingo is now virtually an American possession and part of the new empire which is springing into being and promising to condition the future of the American people. On a little hill outside the city is a training camp with its motto picked out in white stones in an attractive pattern. In time of peace, prepare for war. And one wakens in the morning to the strains of the star-spangled banner played somewhere afar. Down by that tropic little river stands the stump of Columbus's tree, the actual tree to which the discoverer moored his ship when he came in on that morning of the 5th of December, 1492, and was met by amazed tribesmen. Nine months ago it was still a living tree, and it is part of the grievance of the Dominicans that the Marines tried to preserve it for all time by cutting it open and filling its hollow center with cement. That killed it. But it is a mighty burly stump, some fifteen feet high and of great girth. It sprawls, rather. It has a burly moving shoulder and a bearded aspect that suggests a sort of Rip Van Winkle Christopher Columbus, enchanted for 430 years and now stepping ashore. What a change for the old man to see. Those chiefs, those red men and women who gave jewels for beads, all killed to the last child two hundred years ago. Africans are in their place, smooth and black everywhere, as if they had come and conquered it. But they came as slaves and then won their freedom from Spaniards and from Frenchmen. Some speak Spanish, 
some speak bits of French. Further on, in Haiti, all speak French. Where are the bold Spaniards with their flashing eyes and flashing blades, their wills, their lusts? Gone like the great trees of the riverside. Gone like the Indians, gone like the French who came after them. Mixed and married with the Negroes, or else gone soft and gentle as Orientals. These strapping fellows, these giants in sand-colored clothes? Columbus might ask. American soldiers, you would reply, and then conduct the poor old white to the Carnegie Library and the shelves of the Encyclopedia Americana. It needs some explaining. Discovering America was child's play, compared with explaining to Columbus the rise of the American Republic of the North. Anyhow, here I am at the Hotel Inglaterra, and down below me is a bar where there is beer on ice and the best old rum, for Santo Domingo has not been made dry, and there sit Marines all in white and argue it over their pots. The question is, do not the Haitians eat their children at age of five? Not all of them, of course, but selected kids at festivals. Do not the outlaws and brigands of Santo Domingo need to be stamped out? Or, again, who has prior rights in the Panama Canal? Do not British warships come through without paying dues while American warships pay? Are not all vessels towed by electric mules through the canal? They bet millions of dollars. They bet their adjectival shirts because they know. Outside is the city marketplace, where are sold live crabs and tortoises on strings and mangoes and gourds and coconuts and sugar candy babies on wire. And black girls with coral ornaments and varicolored turbans or kerchiefs do the selling while purchasers on asses on backs of calves or walking with huge bundles on their head go past. The black people laugh and shout. It doesn't seem to mean much to them that they have no president and that their republic is in abeyance. They do not bet on what is going to happen, and they do not know. When you buy an orange for a cent, they say to you, Grand merci, and are ever so pleased. In the square is a fine statue of Cristobal Colon, who points west by southwest to Latin America, bidding all men still think of a new world. But I am forgetting. Did I not leave him in the library with the encyclopedia? Is it not there on the shelf that he will find his true place in a history that is past? Though at first sight the population of the capital of the Dominican Republic may strike the traveler as being wholly black, there are nevertheless a number of persons of fairer complexion, the people of the first families, the aristocratica. One or two of these are German. They keep within their houses more than do the Negroes who trade and traffic and gossip in marketplace and main street. The island has had a bad history. Columbus loved it as the first large materialization of his dream of a beyond, a transatlantic land. But the Spaniards raised Cain there, and the Negroes and French after them. The Indians were killed off early, and the Spaniards were soon killing one another. Bandits and pirates have lived there more securely than anyone else. It was in 1697 that the French came in. Spain ceded half the island to her. The French bred in rapidly with the colored people. The country became known as Haiti, and French was the spoken tongue. French Negro slaves in considerable numbers were imported. A hundred years later, the rest of the island was ceded to France. That was in the Napoleonic era. England was at war with Spain, and in 1809, British warships stood off the little tropic harbor and gave encouragement to an uprising of Spanish colonists who proved successful in wresting the city from the French. By the Treaty of Paris in 1814, French rule was confined to the eastern part of the island, Haiti. There came then speedily the great liberation movement of Latin America, 1821 to 1825. Santo Domingo was able to succeed where Puerto Rico failed. But hardly had the new republic proclaimed its independence when the Negroes of Haiti descended upon it and broke it up. Haiti by that time had also won independence. For nearly a quarter of a century, the Haitians remained in control of the whole island. In 1844, a Dominican insurrection was successful, but there was no peace with Haiti 
who seems to have always been the stronger power. Santo Domingo was forced to try to return to the bosom of Spain. In 1861, the President of the Republic became governor, and the Republic joined Spain. Two years later, war against Spain was started, and in 1865 the Republic was restored. In 1868, the Republic tried to join the United States, but America was not then willing. Insurrectionary movements followed one another with rapidity till the Negro General Ulysses Hero obtained control of the country. He, it is said, pursued the policy later adopted by Lenin in Russia of having all his enemies killed, but he himself did not escape and was assassinated at last. It is said he ran the Republic very deeply into debt. One wonders why financiers should have been willing to lend money to such a state. Some five million sterling were owing. Later it became six and a half millions. There was talk of foreign intervention. Some European power might have felt entitled to seize the country. American policy had, however, somewhat changed. In 1899, the United States entered into possession of Puerto Rico and into control of Cuba. Santo Domingo was one half of the island that lay between. Rather than see a foreign power installed, America decided to control Santo Domingo also. The Republic was asked if she still required aid from Washington, and the United States agreed to control the customs, organize receipts, pay interest on debts, and pension the government. This she has done very effectively and remains in economic and military control today. Santo Domingo, with a constitution in suspended animation, having become an American protectorate. Apparently now, most Dominicans would like the Americans to go, but they have no power to make them. The Americans, for their part, can point justifiably to the improved conditions on the island. If they went, the human dogfight would begin anew. However, let us to the country. I have heard it said in London that those who live in half-houses are the aristocrats of the slums. The quaint expression may also be applied to the colored folk who live in cabins. They are the black aristocracy of the islands. It was in vain that I pitied the plight of the dwellers in the marine and saffron-colored dolls' houses of Puerto Rico. The real underdog of these parts does not pretend to any little wooden hut. He lives gregariously in the bush like the larva of the lackey moth. He squats in the shadow and shine of tattered palm branches. He is rustling with his family just beyond the green fans of the wild bananas. In crossing the island of Haiti, only two things share the attention. The magnificence of untamed nature and the wildness of man. Not that the men and women have relapsed to primitive savagery. They are fully dressed as fully as anyone would care to be, and except for little children, seem to be afraid of nakedness. In Russia, in some parts, you may see scores of men, women, and children promiscuously naked upon a river bank, but the wild children of the son of Haiti will not even bathe in the sea unless discreetly covered. In the Africa whence they came, they wore little more than a cash sex, but the slaves learned a decorum of dress from the Spaniard in the old colonial days, and it has remained. They are very civil, too, and talk to you willingly in a French patois or in a broad Spanish, which is far from the Spanish of Madrid. But they are poor, live largely on fruit, have none of the amenities of life, and, being exposed to the tropical heat, they are also exposed to the exhalations of the jungle and to its insects. They are magnificent specimens of the human race till disease touches them. What erect and beautiful women, what positively atom-like men. My eyes fed on many pictures of human perfection. But, alas, for disease. Smallpox rages among them. You see beautiful boys and girls the color of the mahogany trees amongst which they live, but all blurred and shadow-marked as if it were a fault in the tissue and when one of them dies, he is just buried somewhere at the back like a dog or a cat. Little small pox-stricken girls with the disease still on them come up with bunches of bananas or mangoes for sale, their open faces looking out from a hundred disease eyes. 
it makes the heart ache and also prompts the thought what a place for a medical missionary the island swarms with bandits there is only one road across it and that was opened only a month before its interior is extremely obscure unvisited uncontrolled it offers in an otherwise unqualified way a divine adventure for a young doctor willing to devote his life to human beings personally i do not believe the stories of moral depravity the cannibalism which is said to have broken out among the people they are not so starved as that they have not been exploited in the way the people of other islands have cubans will eat one another before haitians but they get married without going to church it is true and have children who remain unbaptized otherwise they are good catholics some of the best i have seen there is no doubt about it the inside of a church where there is a church is one of the best social scenes in haiti the women may often go in uncovered and the holy water bowl be dry or the worshippers may not know when or how to cross themselves but the loveliness and simplicity of service are in utter contrast to the world outside, to the jungle, and to the ordinary ways of men and women. You sit in a vast sky-blue church in the evening and watch the children, with chaplets in their hair and garlands of flowers in their hands, and listen to the Spanish singing. And girls all in white go up to the Madonna with armfuls of flowers and throwing their heads and their breasts to her, yearn to her, and gesticulate, and perorate, and fling down their flower sacrifices, and go. And the priest lights the incense over the flower-heaped altar, so that every blossom smokes upwards to the virgin's feet. Oh, to live in that atmosphere always, and be at peace. You realize the sweet emotion, though you know that character and the world's reactions forbid that you shall take it far. I stayed at a pleasant city called Santiago of the Gentlemen. The Americans call it Santiago of the Bandits, but it seems to be a brighter city than the capital, having more pretensions to civilization. The steel mosquito gratings on the verandas of the hotel were commendable. How can one enjoy one's days when the mosquitoes chase you all night? It would, however, be vain to seek in the island of Haiti the comforts and conventions of Puerto Rico. The United States is in control, but it is proving more difficult to introduce new ways of living. The mahogany-colored chambermaids of the hotel smoke heavy black cigars as they work, and every time Joaquin, who waits on me, wants to light up afresh, she makes an errand to my room for the matches beside my candlestick. My bedroom is just a section of a dormitory divided off by a wooden partition. The bed is surmounted by a high-domed mosquito netting cage, which is room in itself once you are inside. There is no such thing as a room with a bath on the island. Round the corner from the veranda is a mildewed douche which drops water on your back in beneficent but not abundant trickles. It is not entirely private, and you should keep your eyes on two doors whilst you wash. And there are sometimes other occupants beside yourself to wit, the giant Roach and his family. Father Roach is very fond of water, and when you turn on the shower, he comes forth to share in the splash. In other parts of the hotel, the Roaches are portentous. One tries to find a likeness for them. They are like old-fashioned brown metal trunks, a little reduced in size. The sideboard in the dining room might be the grand terminal of some city of the gnomes and drawn up outside it are a score of brown cabs, some waiting, some moving. Or, if they are not cabs, they are little brown pups. The waiters treat them brutally, but I feed them from my plate, and they make off with a bit of bread or a quiver of Spanish omelette as readily as a cat or dog. I see little lizards also running up the dining room wall. The most interesting extra gentleman lodger, however, is the tropical spider. He is not gigantic, but gigantesque, as big as the palm of your hand, speedy, audacious, voracious. He lives not in a web, but on a wall, on a series of walls, and no other spider dare stay on it with him for a couple of minutes. Ah, here he comes, sprawling over the dusty map of the island of Haiti hanging in the hall. 
a dominican politician smiles and points at him and would whisper something about the military government of which he sees a symbol there is a steady malice against americans and as i am english the other guests of the hotel open their hearts they take pleasure in scratching crosses on the figure of liberty on the american money their own money has largely disappeared but a fine coin the size and appearance of a silver dollar is now reckoned as only twenty cents they say it is intrinsically worth forty cents and that an american bank collected some millions of them took them to new york and sold them at a large profit there are two great banking institutions on the island one is american the other is the royal bank of canada the dominicans assure me they place all their business with the royal bank they say that the dollar has impoverished them because it has raised the cost of living so terribly they retaliate by using the british bank i imagine that may be so as i pay forty cents for a half bottle of very bad hamburg beer it could not have cost more than four cents in hamburg the dinner is very simple no french flourishes of cuisine no spanish traditions either but there is enough three beef courses and then guava jelly and coffee and for this you pay at the same rate as you would at shepherd's hotel in cairo or you may pay more i am told by dominicans that the republican bondage is doing so well that the nineteen o eight bonds due in nineteen fifty eight will probably be paid off in nineteen twenty five and the nineteen eighteen bonds due in nineteen thirty eight would be paid off this year nineteen twenty three there is a certain new artificial prosperity it is due to the fact that the inhabitants have been forced to think in dollars and cents and cease thinking in pesos and gramos but the dominican it seems will not take the blessings of peace and prosperity into account when it is balanced against political liberty i go out to the promenade of the town i see the lonely american soldiers sitting bored on park seats and not one of them with a girl or a chum no one will go with them says the dominican we don't feel anything against them personally we know they are only sent by their government and have to obey but we are against their government and always shall be till they go this was spoken by one of the white spanish aristocracy who are now endeavoring to organize a passive boycott in the island santiago of the gentleman is santiago of the ladies also behold a remarkable festival takes place which brings the ladies forth in all their finery the fiesta is in honor of the new road which has joined city with city after four hundred years santiago has been connected with the capital by a road up till may of this year there was only an adventurous horseman's trail but due to the bustling united states of america the hundred and seventy kilometers between santiago and the city of santo domingo has been bridged henceforth it is undignified to be seen on a horse only the poor people the blacks the beggars go on horses all people who are people go in ford cars the superhooters tear along the highway and the sultry mango trees drooping with their fruit look as if civilization were dawning on them at last and the snakes that would bask on the way have learned of a new fast-going enemy that roars like a lion and bumps over them like an elephant and yet flies past like an eagle the worthies of the city have issued the most grandiosely worded invitations to the capitalanos to a three days general at-home banquet and ball it is a good idea santiago is up in the fresher air a wind is always blowing the mosquitoes are fewer and the nights are cool indeed the ladies of the capital carry fur wraps in the evening when the temperature drops to about seventy degrees not that any one walks anywhere by day it is much too hot for that and if i set off for the river on foot they look at me from their cars and stare many people wear green or yellow sun spectacles which look quaint against a dark complexion the light is not however so glaring as in egypt or central asia and the heat seems much easier to bear 
I have come to the conclusion that life on these tropical islands can be very good all the year round. The heat does not devitalize one, though something in the air seems to whisper that nothing in the whole world is of any importance. Those who come to Santo Domingo soon feel the lure and are ready to stay there forever. I watched the routine of the American soldiers at the white and antique Fortaleza de San Luis and the sentries, standing languidly but happy with their bayonets, smiling in the sun, and I saw the dreamy look in their eyes, though they were not dreaming of home. Drink, however, seems to be a strong temptation. I saw one never-sober warrant officer who was drinking himself to death, an educated man who boasted comically that he had been exposed for two years to Cornell. America has not enforced the dry law in Domingo, nor in Haiti. She has not suggested it in Cuba, though it holds in the zone of her territory in Panama, and it has been hinted at in northern Mexico. The fiesta, however, means but little to the garrison. It means more to everyone else than to them. Down below the earth bashed into the fortress and the deep gun emplacements foams the broad and fresh-flowing rio, and black and brown children are floating in it like luscious fruits, and there are crimson foliage trees beside the broad beach where scores of donkeys and ponies with panniers are waiting for water. Every pannier holds two petrol cans, and when the cans are filled, the boys squat across them and beat the donkeys up the long hill to the town, and then hawk the water from street to street. Thus here, as in old Spain, water selling is a trade. And the ladies of the capital need water to wash off the dust, and the boys make double profits. On all street corners, the Dominican flag is flying, and a marvelous, unwanted animation has possession of the people. Bands are playing, horns are being blown, halls are being festooned with flowers. Santiago begins to look a gay resort. Toledo in Spain has no cinema, but Santiago has two, with bi seminal releases from New York and a fitting fadeaway for blood and sin. Santiago has its shady and pleasant drinking saloons and Eden with its annex. The male guests at night, wearing evening dress, or at least black coats and white ties, all look very dapper. The grown women look stupendous. Imagine them in strawberry pink, three times as stout as a stout woman, and with loose girdles about imaginary waists. But the young women, on the contrary, are slight, dainty, with lattice sleeves and jeweled bird combs in their hair. They will dance till they drop, no matter what the heat. It is oppressive enough at eight, but the ball lasts till four in the morning, beginning very quietly with waltzes and ending with sex dances. At midnight, the town orchestra gives way to a Cuban band which beats a tom-tom for hours. In comes the drum like a storm and then subsides, or it mounts upon the music like some big-cheeked black man getting upon an elephant in front of an army while on each side of him are pagan heralds blowing dissonances on horns. Next day after this orgy, the faces of the women are a wreck, which no powder or cosmetic will disguise. Yet one of them told me that she belonged to a party club of thirty families, where they took it in turn to invite all the others. At my house, I have a hundred and fifty guests all day, all night, said she to me. The fiesta, as in other Spanish countries, is a sort of national institution. I was not fortunate enough to be present at a fete on the French part of the island, the Republic of Haiti, but I obtained the impression that the Haitians are much wilder than the Dominicans. The Negroes do not readily identify their needs, they are more ebullient, more pious, and I should say more haunted by a prehistoric past than are the Spaniards. Nothing is more serene, more utterly sweet, than Mass as sung in the great cathedral at Port-au-Prince, but the scene outside the cathedral for square miles is primitive in the extreme. It is like the low suburbs of Nizhny Novgorod in fair time, massed together and increased. Port-au-Prince is built widely on a sun-baked strand and looks more like a capital city than Santo Domingo. 
a few khaki-clad Americans meet the eye, but the black population is too striking for one to consider Americans long. It seems as if the peasantry swarms into the city every day to market their produce, and what a peasantry! It would be impossible to match them. They seem to have all the salient characteristics of the southern French and the Africans also. Their old world, alert, shrewd, rough-hewn faces, their wit and mirth, their clamorous, noisy French patois, their gay cottons and classical faces, the frankly exposed bare breasts of the women, all these tell of a people of force. Unfortunately, owing to the calling of dry American ships, there is a good deal of vice. Champagne is brought to the quay, and the thirsty, indiscriminate passengers and crew knock the tops off the bottles and pour it down their throats like lemonade. The concomitants of drunkenness are all at hand. Possibly in no port in the world will a man, will any man, receive such attentions from women, be he even a somber-visaged missionary. The black girls swarm about you and fight for you. But this may be overlooked, though I am surprised the American authorities tolerate it. Probably the soldiers like it. But Haiti is sad because she is denied her liberty. The colored people all over the world have a legitimate pride in their two independent states, Liberia and Haiti. There is no reason why Haiti should not be left to govern herself according to her lights and temperament. No reason except that Haiti furnishes a new field for exploitation. It is a place in which a good deal of money could be made if the population could be tamed. But the people are too numerous and too fierce. They are, in a way, indomitable. The French blood is vigorous in them. I venture to suggest that Haiti is not a practical possession for an idealistic democracy. The political conceptions on which America has grown will never be adopted by the black French. The time came for me to move on from an extremely interesting island. I wished a passage to Veracruz or Jamaica or Colon, but the chance of small vessels sailing adventitiously seemed to determine my way. I went to Puerto Plata and thence to Santiago de Cuba of Cortez's memory, city of which he was mayor, city which provided much of the capital for his adventure to Mexico. Here is Puerto Plata, on the northern shore of Santo Domingo, the Spanish-speaking part. Puerto Plata, the plate port, a fine ocean harbor where no doubt rested often the treasure ships of the plate fleet. Here is the place, one of the places, but where, where are the galleons of Spain? There stands the British steamer Teviot, loading tons of cigar tobacco for Marseille, all astir with British sailors, while up at her masthead three green parrots are pecking at one another and conversing, or edging off along the taut ropes. Over beyond is the Yankee freighter Dorothy, attended by waist-naked negroes and barges of fruit. A steaming smoke on the horizon and a long-distance hooting tells of an incoming hulk of the reappearing Hamburg-America line. Two little Norwegian tramps have been and gone. The fast American mail steamer from New York will come gliding in tomorrow. Spanish cripples creep aboard ships in the harbor to show their sores, their withered legs and arms. Spanish Negro peddlers squat on the stone pier with bunches of mangoes, pineapples, and coconuts. The town grasshoppers come pottering along with their wooden boxes to black the boots of sailors, and all the English they know is, Wanna shine? But the tall galleons and the flashing faces of Castile have vanished away like a mirage, like something unreal that never was. So I sit in the port and wait. None of the ships will take me the way I want to go. The quickest and cheapest way to Mexico is, after all, via New York, I am told. And that is disconcerting. The galleons have all been sunk, and now one must go via New York. But patience conquers civilization. A little Spanish boat at length appeared, a mere toy beside its neighbors in the harbor, but going in the same old way of Spanish ships, owned by a Cuban company, commercial as the rest, bearing no banner of Castile over the ocean, and yet Spanish enough, Spanish of today. 
On this, I made a romantic voyage to Cuba. I realized for a moment once more the glamour of the days of the discoverers and the piratical pioneers. The sea was like velvet. The hazy mountains were of ineffable grandeur. The ship scarcely moved, yet went on, went on, and the flying fish, silver and gleaming, erased us as she circuited and curved and planed o'er the ocean. I voyaged with Fabio Fialo, the poet and patriot of Santo Domingo, and he poured into my ears the story of his country's wrongs. He had with him a fierce-looking peasant from the interior, Cuyo Baez, who took off his shirt to show me the rose-red efflorescences and brutal channels on his body where red-hot irons had been applied to him by torturers. It was like an inverted picture from Kingsley's Westward Ho, and for a moment I could fancy I saw a British sailor victim of the Spanish Inquisition. I looked at the fierce, unforgiving, taciturn Cuyo, and then at the fine, cultured face of Fialo. How it would have stirred the blood if Cuyo had been Anglo-Saxon, had been thus treated by Spaniards. For our noble rage has an ignoble appetite. It feeds on atrocities, must have atrocities. But here was a Spaniard, alleged to have been tortured with hot irons by one of us, by an Anglo-Saxon. It was incredible. Fabio Fialo looked down into the depths of the tranquil sea and meditated, as if he were looking for the Spanish ships and Spaniards down below, and their banners and their crosses and the spoils of the Indies. He could not see them. He could only see the sharks following the boat. The sailors came out with pistols and began shooting at sharks, for when one shark gets killed, the others feed on it, and cease following the ship for a while. But it does not disturb the poet, nor the imperturbable Baez. They are thinking of all that is Spanish, hating all that is American, and they are sailing over the sea to stir up the Cubans, and eventually to stir up Washington. Cuyo Baez will show his mutilated body to many, and whether he was actually tortured by Anglo-Saxon or by one of Spanish blood, he inevitably will rouse passion and malice against the starry banner of the North. The ship glides on, leaves Haiti, crosses the windward passage, labors through a long noontide over little waves, and in the afternoon comes unto a land in which it seemed always afternoon. And I went up to the peak of the prow of the ship, and it ceased to be on a Cuban merchantman. I had raised one of the lost galleons, and behind me were no moderns, but the clamorous, audacious mariners of the first days of the New World. The treasure ship drifts westward on merely dimpled sea, and in the evening comes to the shelter of Cape Maisi. The sun sets in a lake of fire, and we traverse shadows of cloudlets instead of waves, and the shadows are blue, and then peacock blue, with black circulating lines like cobra's eyes, and then blood red, and then red gelatine, and then green. And from where in the mountains the sun made a lake of fire, a marvelous red brilliance has been enkindled, and great black radii shoot outwards across bands of red, glowing, burning color. It is a dreadful and grandiose scene, the surface of the sea so calm, and yet possessed of fast-wandering, circulating, wallowing color reflections, the place of actual sunset, meanwhile, far over the waves, made gigantic and romantic by the great black spokes of a wheel that is rolling through illimitable fires. And the treasure ship in the enchanted twilight goes on, goes on, with all the pulse of Castile behind it. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of In Quest of El Dorado by Stephen Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six Cuba. There must be twenty thousand mendicant vendors of lottery tickets in Cuba, from ragged urchins to reputable greybeards wearing straw hats and carefully creased trousers. These friars of chance know no shame, and are more persistent than blue bottles coming to you five or six times after having been sent off. They shout the number of their series and whisk the red sheets in your face, 
knowing that you have no redress against them, for they are, in a way, government servants, or at least government commission agents. Every lottery ticket they sell helps the national exchequer of the Republic of Cuba. People buy, they have not the wills to stand out against such persistence. They vaguely hope to draw a lucky number, though they may have deep doubts of the honesty of the administration. But the quickest way to get rid of a lottery vendor is to cry in a loud voice, These are no good, these draw no prizes. That scares them. It is easy to buy a ticket for a lottery that has already been drawn. Besides that, there are forgeries and unlucky numbers. If there are 20,000 ticket vendors, there must be 50,000 boot blacks on the island. Such a passion for blacking your boots. And then as many beggars. These are beggars of all ages and as plentiful as in Moscow and more active than the Russians. From the moment I arrived in Cuba, away in the east at Santiago, I was besieged with people wanting money. It was astonishing. I was sailing to a dream island, to the little lazy isle where trumpet orchids blow, to a new world, to El Dorado the Golden One, to a verdant tropic land where God and the sun and the benevolent, ever-freshening trade wind made work almost unnecessary and poverty impossible. Cuba, called the Pearl of the Antilles. And instead, I found a land made ugly and a people destitute and desperate. At the dock in Santiago de Cuba, torn to this side and to that by the clamorous ragamuffins who wanted to carry my knapsack and hung on to by beggars and lottery vendors at the same time, I plunged through dusty and filthy streets to the plaza of this breathless commercialized city of which Cortes was the first mayor. Here stand two grandiose hotels, one of them called the Hotel Venus, surely an amusing name for would-be respectability. Both hotels are expensive. No provincialism of price holds here. Dinner costs you five dollars. Cuba has a southern coast, reminding one of the southern coast of England, where Santiago would be Southampton. Santiago is of great strategic importance to the island, and its capitulation on July 17, 1898, ended the war with Spain. This southern coast faces Jamaica, from which it is distant less than 200 miles. Havana on the northern coast is over 500 miles distant, and is reached by a tenuous, rickety, narrow-gauge railway. It may be said that this railway keeps the worst of the island all the way, but that is because the railroad is naturally the artery of cane transport. Camagüey, about 200 miles northwest of Santiago, is the center of an immense sugar planting area, of which the ox teams drawing cane trucks on caterpillar wheels through deep soft earth are most characteristic. The sinister looking progress of war tanks along the alleys of the sugar plantations has a strange effect. Camagüey itself is such that no educated person would live there except for a short while to make money. When you continue your journey to Santa Clara, there is a good deal of improvement and more of the Spanish dignity of living. Havana, of course, is a well-shod city of pleasure and remarkable brilliance. Havana does not feel to be Cuba. It is the Coney Island of Key West, Florida. Of course, it is possible to see Cuba in a more pleasant light. There is much glamour over Cuba if you half close your eyes. It is an ideal place for a wicked elopement. The hero of the Hergesheimer novel, Thither Resorts. It is certainly the place for a good cigar. Cuba has become a sportsman's island, the place par excellence where an American can get a drink. The characteristic sound of the towns is the rattle of ice in the inverted metal tumblers where the cocktail is coming to birth. The cocktail and the cigar are the first emblems of Habana. Then comes the Cuban girl, sans pure, and then the gambler's dice. Horse racing and boxing and cockfighting and betting and gambling are tremendous human interests, stronger in the Cuban than in the visiting American. Even the ice cream vendors carry dice boxes on their barrels and will shake you for one as soon as sell you straight. You can go back and forth to Florida, not like Ponce de Leon, but by airplane in an hour or so. 
You read in the Havana News how over at Tampa the Floridians are trying to enforce even the blue law which makes the blues compulsory on Sundays, and you realize what a contrast the Cuban sporting resort affords. Among many places of pleasure, one stands out in my experience as both novel and fascinating, and that is the Galatea Lawn Tennis Club on the Prado. Here is played all the evening and until late into the night a game of human roulette. Gay lights adorn a pleasantly painted wooden structure which possesses a doorway but no windows, and a rapturous, thundering Cuban band clamors from the interior. Men stroll in and out all the time as if it were a drinking saloon, but there is nothing outside to indicate the nature of the entertainment. Probably a cabaret with screened rooms and suppers and dancing girls, you surmise. But once inside, you are aware that it is nothing of the kind. Instead, behold a closed asphalt tennis court and six beautiful girls in white with rackets. They play, and all four sides in tiers and in the gallery above are men gloating upon the game. There is the greatest animation. Up on its perch rattles the band. Down below, at a series of counters, men are constantly buying tickets and going back to their seats. Negroes are going about collecting money and talking to men in the audience. The girls slash the balls, the bells on the top of the net tinkle, the men cheer. And there does not appear to be one woman among the spectators. They are all men. I turned to an American and asked, what was the interest? Was it a tennis tournament? He laughed. It's a betting camp. That's all there is to it, he replied. I took a seat. The girls were named Margot, Justine, Esther, Norma, Tosca, Nina, and their names in bright colored letters gleamed on the scoring board. Before each girl's name was a square of color to indicate her favor, and this corresponded to the color of the ribbon girdle which each girl wore on her white dress. Margot was blue, Justine was white, Esther was red, Norma was green, Tosca was yellow, and Nina was brown. Chalked on a panel of slate after each girl's name was the number of dollars and cents laid on her winning, and electric starlights showed the score point by point. I at once chose Margot as my favorite, not because of her play, but because of her style, her form, her glittering dark face. I imagine most newcomers did the same, for I soon realized that though she did not win, she was a rapturous favorite of the men who applauded every good stroke she made and were almost ready to leap over the nets with excitement when she was leading. It was not the ordinary game of tennis, but one in which directly you lost a point if you returned to your seat and gave way to the next in turn. The games were singles. Six points was the game. The scorer was mounted at a table on which were electric buttons, and when a girl won a point, he pressed the corresponding button on the table, and a starlight appeared opposite her name on the scoring board. All the girls played well, but there was no winning or losing on service. The ball had to be bounced first, and then struck over the net for the service. This precluded fast skidding services. After that, the play was quick and clever and very fascinating, for each girl had a different style of play, and not one was so much better that you could be sure she would not at last miss a stroke. Frequently, three of the girls would reach four points, and once all six stood level at four, and three got to five before steady little Norma captured the sixth and took all the dollars which had been bet on the others and shared them with those who had bet on her. It seemed to me there was a greater thrill and allurement than at a roulette table, for the figures of chance were not of ivory, but living and human. If you wished strongly enough, you might make them win. But what of the girls themselves in this camp of betting men? They were always expressionless toward them. That was part of the fascination. No girl showed by her face that she knew any one of them or was interested in anything else but the game and they never seem to tire, and the courts are never empty, and two girls are always playing, and the drums and horns of the band are clashing, and the negro bookies are collecting the bets. Each man chooses his own little white goddess to win. 
six galateas and six hundred pygmalions the galatea lawn tennis club cuba is the largest and the richest of the west india islands and has attracted more colonists more financial capital and more attention than the rest it must be thought however that the spaniards from the first were ill-fitted to possess it for from the time of the crafty and mean velasquez who wrought for the ruin of cortez until the spanish-american war it is a pitiful history since that war the history of cuba has had a problematical aspect in eighteen ninety eight the united states made war on spain to free cuba and give her independence not perhaps entirely grasping the fact that the disorders of cuba were as much due to bad cuban citizens as to bad spanish governors this however became rapidly clear to soldiers and administrators and cuba has never been given complete liberty and independence now and then for a year or so she has been given freedom on a string but that is all american troops occupied the island till nineteen o two and began the great task of cleaning it up general leonard wood made his mark there as governor the measure of his efficiency is the measure of his unpopularity there was a rumor this summer that he was returning and the newspapers almost came out with black edges but he eliminated a great deal of crime and also of disease during his regime in nineteen hundred america prepared a constitution for cuba and chose the cubans who were to adopt it the president was to be chosen by an electoral college the senate by electoral colleges and only the congress by direct personal vote in this way much scope was left to an outside power controlling the presidency the constitution was adopted in nineteen hundred and next year the famous Platt Amendment was dictated by the United States and signed by the Cuban government. The chief point of this amendment was that it forbade Cuba to enter into alliance or make treaty with any foreign power if thereby her independence were impaired. It granted to the United States certain coaling stations on the island, and it reserved to the United States the right to intervene in Cuban affairs at any time to protect life or property. This proved almost too much even for the pocket politicians of Cuba, but they were unable to obtain any modification of the terms. A favorable president negotiated a strong commercial treaty in 1903, but the terms of the Platt Amendment had caused a dissentient movement which was difficult to quell. The parties took to arms, and the pro-American president was forced to resign. The Constitution, therefore, had to be suspended. From 1906 to 1908, the island was occupied by the United States Army. Charles Magoon became governor of Cuba. Then the Cubans were given another chance, and in 1909, the liberal, Miguel Gomez, became president, and the army was withdrawn. But almost at once, Gomez's political following broke up half of it demanding the withdrawal of the Platt Amendment. There was much irregular fighting, and the United States Army was held in readiness, and American political influence was thrown on to the side of the Cuban conservatives. Their candidate for the presidency was satisfactory and was elected in 1912. The control of the country continued with political storms. Cuba entered the World War with the United States voted a considerable sum of money for it, and conscripted its adult male population. By Christmas 1918, if the war had lasted so long, there would have been a Cuban army in the field. The armistice was fortunate for Cuba. After the war, sugar maintained a high price, but the Cubans hoarded their excellent crop and tried to hold up the world for a fortune but ignorance of world prices tendencies and powers of recuperation misled the people even americans failed to grasp the facts and thought prices could be kept up in nineteen nineteen came the crash when cuba was forced to sell her sugar at a peacetime price the united states in control declared a moratorium january nineteen twenty and the poverty-stricken country became blockaded by unsaleable american goods 
sixty million dollars of american merchandise poured into cuba but the consignees not being able to meet the price refused to accept delivery that merchandise in large quantities still choked the warehouses of the chief ports in 1922. It has now been compulsorily evacuated, and much of it is to be seen in shops offered at a price which suggests bankrupt stock. So at least in March 1923, when I visited Havana again. The planters and the middlemen were badly hit. But, as ever, the chief weight of the blow fell on the laboring masses. Hence the poverty and misery of Cuba enduring in 1923, despite a new rise in the price of sugar. As regards the political situation, it is controlled by an American general and a council of financial experts. Budget estimates of Cuba have to be initialed by the United States before they may be passed. The United States government chooses who shall be president, and then make sure that he is elected. Anyhow, our coming has done them all a lot of good, says an American planter. You should have seen the place before we came. Yes, said I, that is what I am trying to see. But the Cuban, says a banker, is a man you can do nothing with. He's as crooked as a dog's hind leg. Look at them, says another. Thugs, rolling necks, low and brutal brows, searing eyes that dry up any dew they pass over, vicious to the last degree, shady, underhand, corrupt. They can't govern their country. They murder one another on the least pretext. All of them carry guns and knives. There lies the way to an understanding of the predicament of the Cubans and of the peoples of Latin America. Their ways are essentially distasteful to the Anglo-Saxon. The blonde northerner feels a genuine, instinctive, moral mandate to clean up these peoples. His conscience is invulnerable, for his spoilatory business self is cased in the chain mail of the moral mandate. Though the Cuban is overtaxed and also smitten with a lottery plague, the government is ever in financial distress. Why? not only because of the failures of the markets, but because the treasury leaks in many directions and the republic will not live on its income and cannot find enough integrity to cover its activities. It is capable of buying for three-quarter of a million dollars the Santa Clara convent, which cost a quarter of a million a few months before the government purchase. State thrift is unknown. Public offices are means of personal enrichment. The government will constantly seek aid from America, mortgaging its liberty to get it, year by year, ever necessitating the presence of American authority at Havana, and upon occasion the persuasive gleam of the bayonet. Cuba is a protectorate. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of In Quest of El Dorado by Stephen Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven at Santa Fe. Judging the tropics in midsummer to be too tiring, I decided to postpone our journey to Panama and Mexico until autumn and winter. Balboa climbed that peak in Darien in September. That should be my month for going there. So we went, for the rest of the summer, to La Ciudad Real de Santa Fe, away in the southern Rockies upon the borderland of Mexico. That was no small journey from Havana. Two days in a fruit boat to New Orleans, then in a gulf train to Houston and San Antonio, half across the Texan desert to a point nearer the Pacific than the Atlantic, burning El Paso, where the street asphalt hisses when the water cart comes around then up country to Albuquerque, of which name, at least, there used to be Spanish dukes, the dukes of Albuquerque, then sixty miles through scrub and sand to Santa Fe, which is some seven thousand feet up, about as high as Mexico City, though nothing like so verdant a place. Here we hired a mud house, to be polite, adobe built, from the Mexicans, three cool, spacious rooms, a porch, a corral. We bought two horses, Billy and Buckskin, to whom I must say we became much attached, so that it was a pity when the time came after some months to part with them. 
I bought my billy from a cowboy for thirty dollars. Shorty, who sold him to me, did not seem to think the transaction complete till sealed with a drink. He had in a saddle pocket of the horse he was riding a stout bottle of whiskey, and, giving me a ferocious wink, he turned his horse into a lane and poured into a little tin can a ration of what Uncle Sam forbids. I think he'll be a useful pony when he has had corn for a month, said I. He's all right, said Shorty, wiping his lips. You can't kill him. That turned out to be true, as far as I could judge. Billy proved to be somewhat of an immortal. The adventures we had with these horses would make a book in themselves. One thing was rather disappointing. New Mexico is not such a horse country as it was. Cross the border into Mexico proper, and every man except the Tarahumara Indians and the lowest of the peons is mounted. But on the American side, Ford is surely conquering. It is more respectable to have a car than a horse. The cowboys and the Mexicans ride to their work, but pleasure is identified not with a horse, but with a car. The cowgirl is almost extinct, and the only women riders you see are visitors. In the plaza at Santa Fe, there is no longer any place to tie up a horse. Motors hold all the space. You have to seek out waste places in or about town, or else take the risk of tying to a telegraph pole in the midst of the traffic. Billy nearly pulled down several telegraph poles, and actually, on one occasion, broke his stout leather reins. Outside the city, horsemen are common enough, cowboys and Mexican farmers, and occasional mounted parties of polite Americans with hired horses and guides. Santa Fe is, or was, the home of an artistic and literary colony. It is a health resort for people with lung disease, and it possesses an excellently well-equipped sanatorium. A large number of residents are under doctor's orders. The driest air in America and a never-failing morning sun makes Santa Fe ideal for consumptives. There have been many complete cures effected. The development of the place as a literary colony started no doubt with the coming there for her health of Alice Corbin from Chicago, one of the protagonists of the new poetry movement, a sponsor of Lindsay and Sandberg and many others who rose to fame under the auspices of the Poetry Magazine. When she was ordered south, poetry moved with her. It was, no doubt, owing to Vachel Lindsay's generous enthusiasm that we were tempted to go into Santa Fe. He saw in the little city in the mountains unbounded possibilities. So, in coming to Santa Fe, we not only met the mountains, but a number of writers and artists, amongst them my old acquaintance, Whitner Biner, who once diverted five chapters of undiscovered Russia into verse which someone else later put to music. Biner had quit the world in which he was somewhat of a king for a hermit's hut in the desert. Here we met Elizabeth Sargent, who wrote up life in the neighborhood in her abusing letters from a mud house. Here, as a visitor, came William Allen White. Over the mountains at Taos lived D.H. Lawrence. A visitor also was Mrs. C.M. Williamson, gay and young despite her weeds and the scores of novels and stories she and her late husband had written. The artists were as numerous, if more difficult to place, being rather jealous of one another. My favorite question was, who do you think is the greatest artist in Santa Fe? But I never could get an answer beyond a faint blush and a slight personal embarrassment. At 7,000 feet, however, literary and artistic people are apt to be very nervous, and those of poor health, painfully so. There was more pleasure to be had riding in the hills than at the afternoon teas which were always being arranged. At these, some beautifully gowned millionaire's wife poured, the young men simpered in their well-ironed, ready-made clothes, the flappers all curled and tinted were like waxworks, and middle-aged artists with long hair sat in corners, musing on life like old frumps at a ball. Very hard on them. To one of these gatherings, a literary man and his wife came riding in one day. They walked in in sporting attire, and the wife looked very striking in a gay white jumper and riding breeches. 
I got into trouble at Santa Fe, being supposed to have said it was a shabby little town. Ladies whispered the blasphemy to one another at tea. I am to be remembered by that phrase, but in truth, I think it is a wonderful place and a wonderful district, something quite novel and fresh in American life. The cowboys, the Indians, and the Mexicans make it very interesting. Its sun and air, its mountains, its horses give it a marvelous possibility. The shabbiness lies in certain little things, such as the mean commercialism of the shops and the absence of a popular market for dairy products, fruits, and vegetables. This is an Americanization of life. Every city of any size in Mexico has its popular market, which furnishes fresh food at a cheap price. But La Ciudad Real de Santa Fe lives on canned milk, canned tomatoes, dried fruit, storage meat, coffee ground years ago in Chicago, eggs of uncertain origin and age. Fruit harvests fall to the ground and rot because they are plenty and the stores do not want the price reduced. There is something artificial and unpleasant in living in New Mexico on rations from Chicago. It militates against simple living, and it should be of the essence of a literary colony in the mountains to live simply. It raises a problem for Americans. How is one to escape from the American standardization of life? Albuquerque, 60 miles away and many times larger, is even more artificial and standardized. Possibly El Paso on the frontier, more so still. El Paso is like Kansas City in small, and that is the more remarkable as El Paso is as much in the desert as Luxor in Egypt or Merv in Turkestan. Perhaps more so than Merv, for the Rio Grande is not to be compared to the Oxus River. It prompts the thought that if America ever extended her territory to Chihuahua, the next large city in Mexico going southward, then Chihuahua would become, in a short time, a replica of a hundred cities in the north. Then might be said of Chihuahua what Carl Sandburg said of Kalamazoo. Kalamazoo, you ain't in a class by yourself. I seen you before in a lot of places. If you are nuts, America is nuts. However, at Santa Fe, my wife and I lived a free and happy life in our house of mud and enjoyed the Wild West the last West, as it has been happily called, to the full. It is all pine scrub and sand for another thousand feet up, loose sand and boulders which have, however, no terrors for the horses. Billy and Buck are sure-footed as goats and can be ridden up steep banks which English horses would merely regard as walls. But neither horse will jump anything. After a thousand feet, you enter a region of tall pines and firs and 500 feet later, you reach aspens, grass, wildflowers, wild fruits. Most of the little rain that falls seems to benefit the upper mountain region. Santa Fe itself is in constant danger of drought. Water is very freely supplied by the water company, and the dwellers in the many villas let the hose play on their lawns all day and all night, till suddenly there is a warning note, the hose ceases, and the lawns wilt. There is, perhaps, too much waste of the water of the little Santa Fe River on which Santa Fe's reputation as an oasis depends. In a state of nature, very few wildflowers bloom down below. But in June and early July, like wild roses, the cactus blossoms everywhere and its red flowers delight the eye. The eyes crave and thirst for flowers and greenery. A feature of the country is the arroyo, or dried-out river channel, dead, stony, and sandy, which wanders along in an irregular course as if it had once held a fair stream. Many of these have never known living water. The river they represent is flowing underneath the sand, and the channel is not truly a riverbed but a subsidence. In these cases, no grass will grow. There is not the slightest pasture. The only green thing that flourishes is a deep-rooted yellow flowering weed of the desert, a sort of sagebrush locally called chimesa. Riding downward to the Rio Grande Valley, the view opens grandly upon wide-sweeping desert country bounded by strange wind-carved pyramids of rock and little mountains wrought into fantastic shape. Vagel Lindsay, who like many others deplores the name of the state, New Mexico, 
wanted to call it New Arabia or New Egypt because of its natural pyramids, its prehistoric ruins, its hieroglyphics, and the sacred dances of the Indians. But he felt also that it was, first of all, cowboy country. It was, or had become, America, and it is difficult to confound the new with the old. We met in Santa Fe Jack Thorpe, sometimes called the cowboy poet, because of his collection of cowboys' songs, and for several songs he wrote himself. A substantial man, bred with, and always living with, horses and full of lore of the border. It is no doubt due in part to him that we went to the Cowboys' reunion at Las Vegas, which I here describe. End of chapter 7「Eight of In Quest of El Dorado」by Stephen Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8. Cowboys When Thorpe took horses up to pasture, we sometimes went also. That meant a ten-mile ride up into the greener heights of the mountains, the leaving of the horses in a roughly wired enclosure, a picnic lunch, and then a ten-mile ride back in the evening. On these occasions, Jack would be in old weather-beaten chaparreras, leg aprons of leather, and there would be a ready coil of rope on the horn of his saddle. Five or six loose horses would be driven ahead of us, and, like as not, a mare and a foal. It was very pleasant, especially in the early morning. Mrs. Thorpe accompanied us, a clever, smilish Irish woman, nicknamed generally Blarney. She added greatly to the general good humor, and would say with an expression of much mirth as we sallied all together into some rough and boulder-strewn defile, Here we go, the last of Teddy's bunch. Apparently Jack in his earlier days had known Roosevelt, played polo with him, or it may be, sold him polo ponies. The great Theodore, New Yorker as he was, made a great impression on the minds of the cowboys. And, again, I suppose his makeup of cowboy and rough rider fired the imagination of the East. You still have to be something of a cowboy to be a real leader in America. Curious that the Republican president should masquerade as one of the Wild West. A great nation composed entirely of clerks is unthinkable. It must have peasants or highlanders or cowboys behind it, something of the wild and primitive, something of romance. Therefore, it is that America clings to her conception of a glorious wild west behind her drab, clerical east. The multitudes of New York men and women gloating over Emerson Huff's The Covered Wagon at the cinema is forever characteristic of the east. It must have its real or imaginary covered wagons in the background as part of its romance. Nevertheless, the number of cowboys and cattle ranchers has greatly decreased, driven back by farmer's wire, and the type is tamer than it was. There are still great herds. You may see the chuck wagon going round and meet many a wild-looking boy riding in full rig out, but it is not denied that the old-time color has faded. Perhaps the last ground of the real cowboy is the Mexican border, hence Las Vegas Reunion, which eclipses the show at 101 Ranch, Oklahoma, and is only to be compared with a roundup at Pendleton, Oregon, or Cheyenne in Wyoming. The spirit of the West still triumphs over the spirit of the East at Las Vegas, where in one week the fliver is routed by the horse, and no man who is worth his salt is seen wearing a crease in his trousers. War whoops and colored silks and silver-studded saddles and goat-will chaparreras and daring faces and happy horses make up Las Vegas during the days of the cowboys' gathering. Here comes Leonard Stroud on Diamond and Little Buster, age ten, on Shetland Joe. Here comes the victor of the bronc riders, Buck Thompson, who will put the fear of God into Peggy Hopkins, an orphan boy and anarchist. Here comes a cowboy with no legs, yet mounted on a meddlesome black steed and wearing a scarlet and gold shirt, full as a blouse. He is a veteran of cowboys. The parade of the cowboys forms up, 
led by a man in a dark chestnut shirt with a belt full of cartridges and an ivory-mounted revolver sticking out above his hip. With him, the chief judge of the riding and the races, carrying a purple and gold banneret. Here comes the brothers Nephis on racehorses. Here comes a wonderful miscellany of riders in turkey red, in luminous purple, in unfaded pink, and exuberant green. Rough necks with rough hats, hairy wrists, mighty shoulders and backs, rugged faces, and the sentimental, guileless eyes of good sportsmen and daring fellows. There are cowgirls as well as cowboys, trim, modest, light, the wives and daughters of cowboys. Chief among them is Mamie Stroud, thin, almost hipless, with a waist like a wedding ring, high brown sombrero on her head, and hair hidden by voluminous red ribbons falling in big bows under the broad, shadowy brim of her hat. Idaho Bill brings up the tail of the procession in a ramshackle Ford car drawn by horse. He is greatly encumbered by his camping outfit, and he has in the car with him a black bear which he caught in Mexico after it killed his horse and had badly bitten him. At least, so he says, and he will raise his trouser to show you the scars. He has buffalo horns tied to the radiator of the car. He wears his hair long. He has a green coat and boots of alligator hide. Every year he goes into Mexico buying outlaw horses. Whenever he hears of a horse no Mexican can ride, he buys it to bring north for the cowboys. And he drove up this year a hundred or so bucking horses. He is a sort of successor of Cody, a picturesque figure and a fitting living symbol of the flamboyant spirit of the West. Some thousands of dollars have been subscribed as prizes for the cowboys in their noble sports of bronc riding, bulldogging, steer roping, relay racing, and the rest, and there are also scores of bets by cowboys on themselves. Curious, is it not, that there are few Mexican contestants and no Indians? The American cowboys can outride and outdare all Mexicans, all Indians, and are not afraid of any man or beast that breathes. As the legend of High Chin Bob narrates, if they met a lion in the hills, they'd rope him, they'd hold him fast, and not let go of him till they'd drag the spirit out of him. Ride him, cowboy, hold him, cowboy, cries one to another as the wild horses scream with rage and rear and kick and buck and bolt with the laughing boys on their backs. Riding wild horses is the favorite sport of the cowboys, and the untamed horse is a fearsome and beautiful beast. And he is not ill-treated. There is a great deal about the enclosure which reminds one of the bull ring, but not its cruelty. The men take a chance of death, the animals do not. In the bronc riding competition, the horse is beguiled into a heavily timbered narrow pen where a slip saddle and halter are put on him without his knowing it. The rider gets down gently onto his back from the wooden wall. Then, when the president gives the word, turn him out, a door swings free and out plunges the horse. The cowboy beats him to one side and to the other with his felt hat and spurs him forward, and the horse behaves like a mad dromedary, makes double humps of his back, leaps right in the air, and turns about and about. When the cowboy has been on for one minute, the man in the brown shirt fires his revolver in the air, and five or six cowboys race to the rider to rescue him from the bolting, careening horse. This is often the most exciting part of the event. It may develop into a terrific race. Sometimes, before the rider can be lifted from the wild horse to another cowboy's horse, or safely dismounted, the bronco has crashed right through the wooden enclosure. That was what happened to Buck Thompson on Orphan Boy, and the wild horse got rid of him on the fence as it pounded right through it. The little town of Las Vegas, meaning the Meadows, was crowded with visitors, some of them an outlandish type that seldom strays from home. One dame in a restaurant, dressed in the style of the early 90s, asked us what part we came from. When I said England, she turned to her husband with, Lord's sake, what do you know about that? Then she turned to me and asked, Did you come all the way by car? 
the secretary of the reunion undertook to house most people who came and he sat at a desk with a telephone and kept the town awake asking all and sundry for hospitality for visitors the secretary i discovered afterwards was a poet my wife and i were happily accommodated in a house where besides ourselves were three very eager cowboys and in the corral at the back were their horses we naturally were deeply interested in their fortunes the first day was not so good for them but on the second morning with the roping and bulldogging they shone i think all three won prizes i was very eager to see the bulldogging which is a unique western sport jack thorpe and his wife and the artist penhallow henderson who were with us at the roundup were glowing in their pride of it and told some amusing stories in connection with it the cowboys when they joined the army commonly said they were off to bulldog the kaiser bulldogging started in texas and a negro named pickett is sometimes reputed as the originator of the sport pickett one day entered the bull ring at juarez on the other side of the mexican line and interrupted a bullfight by bulldogging the bull juarez is on the other side of the rio grande from el paso americans go back and forth all the while and on sundays many are not averse to seeing a bullfight there it is a rough and tumble city the bullring is just a stone amphitheater one sunday some years ago pickett bulldogged the bull he was at the entrance to the ring with his horse and he had had enough to drink a number of white cowboys texans were around him encouraging him and they wagered him to ride into the ring in the midst of the fight then the humorous and loquacious pickett who was a famous character spurred his horse across the arena got the bull a running and then overtaking him at a gallop leapt from his saddle on to the bull's horns the impetus of the gallop he imparted to his wrists as he twisted the horns and laid the fierce animal with a thud flat on his flanks on the arena sand to the uproarious cheers of the americans present and the prolonged angry hisses of the mexicans well that is bulldogging the wild west's substitute sport for the spanish corrida i watched it and steer riding for hours in the cattle ring of the cowboys and i suppose it would be difficult to find a sport with a greater thrill in it to see a cowboy on a fine horse going full tilt after a frightened steer that has got the start of him and how these clumsy animals can go it when once they think they are being chased neck to neck horse and bullock dark mane and longhorn dirt splashing upwards as they go cowboys looking on and laughing and shouting let go of that horse on him cowboy and then the leap in the air and the rider clutching the brown bovine neck or actually sitting with one thigh across a madly plunging horn and the bullock going on with him trailing him wiping the ground with him for fifty yards or more if the cowboy has not been able to impart the momentum of the galloping horse to the twist which he gives to the horns to bring the animal down each rider is timed and the one who performs the feat in the shortest time wins the prize I saw it done in fifteen seconds, turning over the bull with the rapidity of a pistol shot. The leap from the horse and the twist of the horns and the thud, all consecutive. I saw it also done in two minutes and thirty seconds, where the bulldogger, holding on to the horns, yet lying full length ahead of the bull, was rushed part way around the arena like a toboggan. And besides this risky, thrilling fun, there was steer riding, which is also what might be called a part substitute for the bullfight. Riding at full pace on a rushing steer is a violent sport, clown's fun after the bulldogging. The bullocks are greatly enraged at being ridden, and they flounder and blunder and toss imaginary bundles in the air and glare out of their eyes like searchlights, while the wild boy above, with chaps on his legs, waves his sombrero in the air and gives forth indian war whoops all the while the great western crowd laughs so do the cowboys so do the judges and even the many horses ranged on all sides seems to look on with mirth it hardly feels like this century one thinks of medieval jollity but comparisons are misleading such fun is of all time 
the Athenians would have loved it, and bulldogging would have been a greater diversion in the Roman Colosseum than the Christians and the lions. After the bulldogging, there was roping of wild horses, saddling them and riding them. The horses were let loose in the arena, and each cowboy had to catch his. As they had never been broken, the excitement can be imagined. Excitement of the horses, of the would-be riders, and of the crowd looking on. It was fully twenty minutes before even one cowboy had saddled and bridled a horse, and he could not make the animal go round the course. Then we had a chuck-wagon race, wagons blundering around the course to given points where they had to stop, horses had to be taken out of shafts and put in imaginary corrals, rear flap of wagon to be let down, a fire lit on the ground, and a pot of coffee boiled. Then a Roman race and a relay race. Idaho Bill, in his alligator hide boots, chewed his cigar all the while as if to him all the horses belonged, and the president of the reunion galloped from point to point of the arena, judging the competitors in each race. And all the while, a brass band played I'm Nobody's Darling and Kindred Heirs. In the evening, after all these doings, there were cowboy dances and a rolling up and down of Las Vegas streets of a vaunting, leather-lined crowd. Some still rode about on their horses, but most had taken their steeds to their corrals and thrown them out their armfuls of green alfalfa for the night. The legless cowboy in his crimson shirt still rode his ebony horse and had evidently found liquor, for he rode into the main entrance of Las Vegas' only fine hotel, clattered around the stone hall, and stood with his horse in the doorway of the main dining room, asking in a stentorian voice for a roast beef sandwich. The pallor in the faces of some Easterners who had stopped off on the way to California was most apparent. Why don't they phone the police, said one old man, mopping his brow with his handkerchief. But the cowboy kept quite calm, and, unloosing his rope, made a pass to rope the old man, and roped a young girl with chestnut hair instead. She laughed, but was not a little alarmed. So the cowboy unloosed her, and lassoed the cashier at the desk instead, and then the hotel manager. Then they brought him his beef sandwich, and with a splutter of hoofs, he rode out of the hotel into the gay streets again. End of chapter 8「Indians」The story of the Indians in America is the story of the weak in the presence of the strong. Despite the ideals which reign in capitals and cultural centers, it is always the same with the main body of the human race. The strong may pity the weak, but they will not forbear to use the advantage of their strength. There is little to choose between Spaniards and English. There is little to choose between any of the races. Belgians in the Congo, Portuguese in Brazil, Russians in Turkestan. They have dispossessed, enslaved, expelled, destroyed without a mist upon their conscience. And it is difficult to think that mankind has improved. If a new world were discovered today, if the ocean delivered up a new continent, the first thought would be, is there gold there? If we found people living on it, specimens would be brought to be shown to prime ministers and exhibited in places of amusement, and there would be a rush to that new world of gold seekers, pirates, adventurers, and imperial administrators. So it may be pardoned if at this stage in American history one refuses to wax indignant over how Spaniards and Anglo-Saxon forefathers of present Americans behaved toward the natural possessors of the soil. The justification for the rapine of America, or at least of North America, is that it has been made into a going concern. We believe in our curious self-complacence that an American humanity with factories gilded by millionaires and mighty banks 
towering heavenward in mighty cities, is a greater glory to God than the life of Hiawatha and his friends. We must confess that it seems so, and it is difficult to hear the ancient whisper, Where is thy brother Abel? The Indians, however, are not forgotten. They are more remembered now that they are few. There comes a moment when the old race is mostly underground or tucked safely away in wildernesses, remote from human ken, that the new race of conquerors becomes sentimental. It has destroyed all that it adored, and now it adores all that it has destroyed. So it is now in the United States, where Indians have become the pets of tourists and the theme of poets. You have to travel far to meet the Indians, so the railway companies have used the Indian as an advertisement, not only picture but living. For at Las Vegas Station or at Albuquerque and many others, do you not see station Indians all bedizened, walking up and down before the delighted traveler's eyes? The Indian has become part of the romance of far travel. The United States have left their own primitive past behind and emerged from the mud and the smells and the roughness of pioneer days. All America treads paved sidewalks. All America goes in cars. All America is in clean linen and good clothes. There is electric light, sanitation. Baths have become more national than in Russia or Turkey. America indeed leads civilization and leads it forward. So the distance between the Indians and the citizens of the United States grows more and more remarkable. The gap is a sort of Grand Canyon in itself, a Grand Canyon in the continuity of human beings. The sentimental interest is therefore greatly intensified by the spectacular one, the paradoxical one, of one people standing still whilst all the rest of the world moves on a people who refused to budge from what they were in 1492. I suppose those Indians were most lucky whose habitat was more remote, those who were furthest from the capital of New Spain, those who were furthest from the centers of population in the United States. Probably the Pueblo Indians of New Mexico were in that position. That is why they have survived so well. The deserts have been their protection. An acquaintance buying land near Rama, New Mexico, found when he took over a new estate that there was behind his ranch house a whole village of cliff dwellings. In a like manner, when in 1848 America took over the new territory which was the spoil of the Mexican War, she found she took with it the Pueblo Indians living more or less untouched, unmolested as they had lived for centuries. Remote from Aztec power, remote from Cortez's power, remote from Spanish power, remote from the seat of power of the Mexican Empire, now remote also from modern America and all that America means, the Pueblo Indians are still happy in their traditional homes, worshipping rain gods in the desert, dancing ceremonial dances, dancing their sorrows and their ecstasies. I was at the Indian Pueblo of San Juan on St. John's Day. The Indians and the Mexicans were holding a fiesta. Broadly beat the sun on the mountainous deserts, on the wind-carved pyramidal mountains and strange rocks, on the sandy waste of the river bed, and on the mud huts of the Indians. Such a hubbub! The drums of the Indians are beating, throbbing. The many feathers of the war bonnets are bobbing over the sombreros of the dark-suited Mexican crowd which looks on. There is dancing. Let us climb on to the roofs of the mud huts and look down on it. The drums that they are beating are shaped like sections of tree trunks, but adorned with rude swastikas. Indian warriors, all painted and bedizened and armed, are dancing to the tune of the drum beats, and beautiful women with long hair hanging down their backs, broad set faces, slightly lifting feet in white curl-top boots, are balancing little feather-topped arrows in each hand. The war chief's dance is a sort of war prance, an arrow-shooting gesture, a spear-holding gesture. And as they dance, they jingle their belt bells and set earrings and rattles all a-tinkling. 
Their long hair is done up in twin pellicules of fur and hangs in long tails over their shoulders, or it is interplated with bright ribbons. Their faces are painted in various ways, the leading man carrying a pink, melon-colored, scythe-shaped banner has black ladders on his cheeks, climbing to his yellow-circled eyes. Another man has a striped face, stove-black alternating with the brightest orange. Another has yellow star-rays around his eyes and the ruddiest blood-red over the rest of his face. One is painted top-half yellow, lower-half rose-red. Almost all wear war bonnets, brown or fawn felt hats, or buckskin caps trimmed with selected black and white feathers. All the feathers are white-tipped, except those which have been dipped in the war paint. On one warrior, this headdress is adorned with small circular mirrors the size of watch lids. They circle his face and gleam in the sun, but they also continue downward at the bases of the long stream of feathers to his ankles. For these feathery bonnets, starting as a broad crest to the brows, finish only short of the ground, and how they dance in the wind as their owners dance. All the men carry weapons and shields, spears with bright ribbons, imitation bayonets, revolvers, pistols, swords, bows and arrows. One, having on his shield a blood-red star and a crescent, slews in the air with a great curved sword. Several are naked to the middle, but all are powdered or dabbed with white paint. They have large, feminine-looking breasts, deep-cut navels, smooth skins, and no hair. They perspire profusely and fan themselves occasionally with feathers. One almost naked pagan has the stars and stripes for a loincloth and prances about with a sham rifle. Occasionally, the semi-naked ones seem to obtain furs from somewhere and appear with their backs and bellies quite covered up. The drummers are older-looking men, very stern in their expression. They know nothing of tradition except its binding force. One of them has a crown of fresh-cut stems of the cottonwood tree. They beat their throbbing drum taps. They sing, they chant, they mumble, 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 dum, dum, dum. It is hardly a tune, but a sensual appeal. The men do the dance, plunging back and forth. The women throb and quiver with their broad-booted feet and short, broad, brightly enwrapped bodies and wide, wood-like faces, low, broad brows framed in sharp-cut ebony hair. Their front hair is cut Egyptian-wise, sphinx-wise, while down to where the waist should be behind hangs a great cloud of untrimmed waving tresses. They quiver, the men prance. All the dancers are in fours, the men and the women in alternate files, thirty men and thirty women. The men are the fighters, the women serve them with arrows. The men prance in front of the women, the women are protected by them. The women scarcely change their positions the whole time, but the men diagonalize between files and prance forward in front of them, lifting high their weapons and emitting curious little cries and yelps. As they kill in the ritual, they give the death cry of the victims. They dance six long dances, and after each, in a processional bacchanalia, leave the scene of the dance, and with splendor of waving color, file upward on ladders onto the roofs of the houses, and disappear through holes in the roof into the two kivas, or council chambers of the men and of the women. It is also a Mexican holiday, and nearby goes a dilapidated merry-go-round, worked by hand by two men, with a wretchedest burble of music, a torn canvas roof, and a flag. Somewhere, also in the background, a cowboy is riding a bucking bronco while dark-eyed Mexican youth looks on. But the mud huts of the Indians and the freshly made, green-branched street shrines of St. John and the Madonna are the real background of the fiesta. The last dance of the afternoon is danced bowingly and worshipfully into a green alcove where stands a little silver and white virgin and an old Mexican is sitting beside her, playing dreamily on a violin. In one respect, at least, the Indians are not as they were. 
they have become Catholics. I am told that it is merely a polite acquiescence on their part, and though with their faces they bow to the Madonna, their hearts know her not. In the course of the summer, we rode to seven or eight Indian villages, sometimes to dances, sometimes just to see the villages themselves and the normal way of life in them. And we were much besought to buy turquoise rings and bracelets and brightly woven saddle blankets and rugs. Some visitors to Santa Fe bought great quantities of these things, and one of the poets disported five or six large silver and turquoise rings on his fingers, and had more still in a drawer. Nearly all the ladies of Santa Fe had waist belts adorned with silver conches. The Indians worked the same turquoise mines which have been theirs immemorially, and they mine also silver, though I think not a little of their silverware is now derived from molten dollars. Paper money seems always inacceptable to the Indians, so one always carries a weight of silver in one's pockets when traveling in these parts. Each Pueblo is a community and lives a communal life. Their land is held in common and is inalienable. I believe their title derives from the King of Spain, legalized by the Mexican Republic, and recognized by the United States when they conquered the country. Much of the best land, however, has been stolen from them. There are many squatters, both English and Spanish-speaking. In many places their water has been diverted, and they have been left stranded on yellow sands. They have never been able to defend themselves in civilized courts, being incapable of grasping the procedure, and they have suffered accordingly. All this summer and autumn, their rage to campaign fostered by the artists and literary colony in Santa Fe for the protection of the Indians and the institution of new works of irrigation to give them back their lost water. Thanks to this campaign, a spoilatory measure which passed the United States Senate, commonly called the Burson Bill, was recalled. The object of this bill had been chiefly to give legal title to the squatters. There is a good deal of hope that, having frustrated the passing of this bill, the Indian Committee of Santa Fe will have been able to introduce into Congress a highly practical measure which, at the same time, would help and protect the Indians, benefit the squatters, and pay for itself. This is a bill for new irrigation works and compensatory land grants to the Indians. The great problem of living is that of water and more than half the Indian dances are prayers to a nature god for rain. The description which I give here of our ride to Santo Domingo Pueblo, to their greatest festival, may give some suggestion of the desert and the Indians praying for rain. We rode down from the mountains where the green pastures to the parched valleys and plateaus, and were told irrigation had ceased for want of water. The river beds and channels and dikes were yellow and dry and scorching. Rivers, instead of broadening out, grew less as they flowed, attenuated. They became trickles, they became the mere witness of the tongue in the mouth, they disappeared. Even the cactuses withered. The rose-like cactus blossoms of the higher mountains are no more. The fresh green spiny stalks are brown and frightful in death. There is no grass for the horses, and the only green things on the waste are rank, poisonous, deep-rooted weeds which draw their sustenance from the moisture which is far below. The bones of dead cattle tell a melancholy tale of thirst. Woe to the herd of the cowboys who do not know where water is to be found. They are driving their herds over vast distances, from California into Texas or beyond. They are taking their time, feeding well as they go, or they ought to be feeding well. And the cowboy's mind map of the world is one of hidden springs and constant pastures. So they have driven the herd upwards, even though that be out of their way, for there is no water or pasture below. Our horses would fain return. When we rest them at noon, they trail their reins after them and start homeward, and are not easily captured. We have found alkali water in the depths of an arroyo. The horses try to drink it, but lap up bitter sand instead. 
they quit trying to drink it and lie down on it instead and try to roll in it. We climb black, boulder-strewn cliffs and look painfully once more at the bleached bones of cattle. We walk our horses all the afternoon over a sun-blazing prairie toward a horizon that seems infinitely removed, and we see in the distance the bright, gleaming wheel of a water windmill, and the wheel is surely revolving. Though not our way, it means water, and we will go to it. We are soon on a cow trail, a goat trail, a human trail, all making for the windmill. How gaily the wheel flashes in the sunlight. It is truly a delight, a token of happiness. But, alas, when we get to it, we find the cisterns and the troughs all empty. The wheel is revolving, but it is drawing forth no water. All is desolate. We dismount and sit on the wall of the concrete reservoir, and the horses wonder why they are there. But up above us revolves the wheel, once descried afar, now over our very heads and actual, and it cries as it revolves, no water hell creek granger hell no water hell and all strewn around on the ground are discarded bottles and cans and a cross of new wood marks somebody's grave no water well on to the horses again we'll be on to the great rio tomorrow far away low down below this sun-cursed moor the horses will drink deep when we get there, and we shall join the Indians who on the day of St. Dominic are going to intercede and dance for rain. On the evening of the second day, we rode into the mud hut settlement of the Indians of Santo Domingo and admired their large new church with its external fresco of horses. The horse came to the Indians at the same time as the cross, and perhaps to them is as holy. We rode along the broad street, three times as broad as New York's Broadway, and hoof-marked and wheel-marked from wall to wall. The squaws were ascending and descending ladders to go in or come out of the doors which they have in their roofs. On strings along their rooftops, chunks of meat were desiccating in the sunlight. But in front of many houses were portals of green branches and boughs brought up from the woods along the bank of the river. The Indians neither saluted us nor welcomed us, but their dogs barked at us, and we passed on, away through their cornfields, down to the Rio Grande, the great river. And there we camped, where the rapid flood rolls down from the Rockies, red with the color of Colorado. It was the eve of the festival of St. Dominic. Indians in their covered wagons were coming from all parts, him as Indians, Tesuka Indians, Navajos, Indians on horseback, galloping along the opposite bank of the river and plunging their horses to the ford. All night long the moon among her clouds looked kindly down upon the river and listened, as it were, to the galloping of the horsemen and the crunching of the wheels of the wagons on the valley sand. Indians encamped in the valley and let loose their horses built fires beside ours, and fried their corn and broiled their coffee, gay men and tittering squaws and wild-eyed little ones. Up in the settlement, the guests slept in the streets on the roadways, though all night long music never ceased, nor the throb of the drums for the morning. On the white mud church where the horses were painted on the outside walls, they lit seven flaming altars which blazed into the night sky. It looked then like an Aztec pyramid lit for human sacrifice to Quetzalcoatl, the god of the air. Perhaps to the Indians it was. Who knows their minds? As for us, we slept in the bush on the verge of the red flowing waters, and our horses neighed to one another and whinnied the night long. Next day, as on the night before, we swam in the river, its rapid current flattering our achievement. It was red and warm and mighty, rolling us in waved motion ten feet at a thrust. Yet it was weak. It would be a strong Indian who would swim the Rio Grande when it is at its strength, for then it is capable of washing away villages and towns as it goes. 
Has not the old church and half the pueblo of Santo Domingo been swept to limbo by the river? Three beautiful youths come and sit by our campfire and smile at us. One is in a black velvet coat and with a crimson ribbon in his long ebony hair. He is handsome and romantic as Bonnie Prince Charlie. Following him, we ride up to mass in the church of the painted horses, and we find the pueblo arrayed in the many colors of gorgeous Indian life. And on top of the kiva or council chamber is a banner crowned with a cluster of many-colored painted feathers. An Indian takes our horses into his yard, and we go into the church. What was there? more impressive than the service in latin completely in latin with not a word of spanish or of english or the indians singing the chorus of praise and serving at the altar a giant as it seems in terracotta colored coat and neatly tied voluminous black hair standing constantly at the altar steps saint dominic is waiting he lies prone on the ground St. Dominic will be invoked at the breaking of the bread. Sanctus, Sanctus. O Santo Domingo, where art thou at this hour? We'll reach thee. Tinkle, tinkle goes the church bell. And then, suddenly, dum, a dum, 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 caroa, go the drums and horns of the Indians, and splooge, splooge, they fire their rifles in the air. The bearers raise St. Dominic on high. He seems veritably to rise from the dead as he gradually ascends above the worshippers' heads. He is golden and patriarchal and benign, and they carry in front of him a little gilt dog. Dominicanes, the dogs of the Lord, the Dominicans used to be called, and the pun has endured. As St. Dominic is carried to every Indian house and byway of the gray mud-built pueblo, the horns and the drums accompany him, and splooge, splooge goes the accompaniment of fired guns. And when all the visiting has been done, the figure is placed in the alcove of green boughs, the street shrine before which two hundred Indians will dance a prayer for rain. And now onward, all the day the Indians dance. First comes the koshare, who represents the spirits of their ancestors. All but naked, they are painted a dull gray to look either like corpses or invisible as ghosts. There are strange black bands and traceries on their limbs and bodies, and their faces are painted to a fright. They grimace, they insinuate, they strike terror, and also they make mirth. They have corn stalks in their hair and sandals on their feet. As for the rest, they all wear their long hair hanging so that men look like women, but the men have branches of green tassels on their heads, and the women wear green wooden crowns. The men have armlets of green with pine twigs in them. The upper parts of their bodies are all exposed, but are painted dark brown and seem as of stone. The men wear fox skins hanging behind them like tails. The drums beat, the men encant, the koshare wave their hands to heaven and make every gesture that means falling rain. The living dance in ranks, but the wild koshare, the spirits of the dead, dance in and out at will and seem to improvise all they do. They lead the dance, they dominate. It becomes an orgy of marvelous beauty, dimpling, dazzling, a great moving phantasmagoria. It is like the manes of a hundred black horses plunging together on the prairie. It is like running shadows and sunshine over mountain meadows of flowers, and all the while the drums, and all the while the incantations. Strangest of all is the body of earnest old men at one side, not dancing, and yet somehow contributing to the dance. They are all farmers. They want the rain for their crops. They are terribly intent. They never cease turning from the heavens to the earth and back again, and making with their fingers the gesture of trickling water and dropping rain, calling all the while something like, Aki, aki, you, you, aki, aki, ya, ya, aki, aki, yum, yum, aki, aki, you, you. How they want it to rain. There's no doubt of the sincerity of their prayers. The dance is in two sections. 
One represents winter, the other summer. They dance separately and then come in together in one grand bacchanalia, the koshari exceeding themselves and yelling at visitors and sightseers, booing into their faces and kicking their shins. Little children come, bringing loaves to place at the feet of St. Dominic, who stands benignly in the silver and green shadowland of his bower in the village street. He seems to be listening to something. He is altogether remote from this time. He is thinking of something else, trying to remember something. But be that so or no, little loaves have been placed in front of him, and outside the shrine, in an astonishing frenzy, the dance goes on. The beautiful Indian girls, so young, so dark and jewel-like, lift all their naked feet in perfect time, in hypnotic time, and balance their bodies, balanced to the rhythm of the great dance, with half-closed eyes. The Rio Grande, away below, rolls on in red waves from Colorado to the sea. The clouds that are above are merely messengers, fleet-footed mercuries whose message is not to be delivered here. And yet, what is that which is forming a way to the north? Surely a thundercloud. The mountains have stopped the clouds. It is raining. The clouds are broadening and enveloping. Ucky, ucky, you, you, the old men clamor and point back to their crops. Ucky, ucky, ya, ya. Don't stop for a moment. Ucky, ucky, yum, yum. The koshari become the spirits of the storm, making the most astonishing leaps and crying out and pulling the rain out of the heavens toward them. The ardor of the dance redoubles, and there is no rest. And the heat, as of an oven, is not tempered by the breeze. Suddenly, glimmering white ribbons are pulled through the clouds, and it is lightning, a sign at least that the prayers are being heard. These people know how to pray for rain. No idol, may it please thee, O Lord, sitting on plush, but a terrific dynamic appeal by one force of nature to another. What wonder if year after year the Santo Domingo dance brings rain? But what drama! It rakes one's soul. You are torn by it. Will it rain? Will it rain? See the dance. See the clouds approaching. See the old men. See the waving fields of green flowering corn. See the maidens like jewels. See the young men like princes. See the dreadful and marvelous koshari, all gray and stove black with mask-like faces, grimacing and simpering and yet somehow compelling. See the emblem of Christ. See the church. See the kiva, white magic and black magic, all together, all toned up, all compelling. Throb, 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 dum, 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 ucky, ya, ya, ucky, ucky, you, you. Ah, uh, it comes. Yes, a spot, a wind-carried token of a storm somewhere else, a black tooth mark in the Pueblo dust. See the koshari drop to it, lick it up with their tongues, dust and all, and cry, more, more, all hands to the sky, all hands to the earth. Aki, aki, you, you, aki, aki, ya, ya. But it does not rain. It rains all around. It will rain. Cool airs creep in. The dance ends at last, and all who danced in it are exhausted. Candles on long poles are lit. St. Dominic is raised again, and he and the little gold dog are borne away to the church. A bell rings quietly in the evening air, and the streets begin to empty of all but the Mexicans and Americans. In the distance, you hear the river rolling by, hear also the hoofs of the horses and the splashing of those who are fording the Rio Grande, homing into the night. End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of In Quest of El Dorado by Stephen Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten Mexicans of New Mexico. New Mexico is the only Catholic state in the Union. Maryland has a tradition of Catholicism, but New Mexico has the verisimilitude of a Latin country in Europe. When, in 1848, it was annexed to the United States, or, let us say, in 1850, when it was organized as a territorial possession, 
or in 1863, when it was reshaped, it has had many birthdays. It was entirely Spanish-speaking and Catholic. The population now is five times as great as it was then. The Mexicans have prospered and multiplied. The Texans have colonized the South and East. State consciousness is remarkably undeveloped. Those of Texan origin are proud of Texas. No Anglo-Saxon or German-American seems ready to call himself a New Mexican. It is the Spanish-speaking people who are the real New Mexicans, and they do not care to be confounded with real Mexicans. The visitor, therefore, has a sense of being in a foreign state and one decidedly Catholic. The atmosphere is rather that of Spain than of Mexico for Mexico has been exposed to 65 years of anti-clericalism wherein the church has been fought by the state, shorn of its possessions, and greatly reduced in pride and power. It has meant much to the new Mexican that his church has not been humiliated. In Mexico, also, the strain of race is much more mixed. Almost every Mexican has Indian blood, and the onslaught on the power of the church was obtained by her great Indian president, Benito Juarez. The converted Indian is a much less faithful son of the church than the Castilian, and it may be that the spirit of revolt in Mexico derives more from the aboriginal strain than from the Spaniard. In what is now New Mexico, however, there has never been much crossing with Indian blood. The Navajos, the Apaches, the Zunis, and the rest were never subjugated the way the Aztec tribes were. Deserts lay between these races and the main bodies of armies. Their wealth was not enough to tempt great numbers of adventurers. The Spaniards who settled were mostly peaceful colonists. They set up churches, they built new villages, they tilled the soil or herded cattle, and they were content to forget higher ambitions. They lived to themselves. There is now a remarkable difference between the Mexican proper and the Mexican who has become a United States citizen, and that, although New Mexico only became a state and was admitted to the Union in 1912. It is not simply the moderation of the size of his sombrero and his abandonment of tight breeches, nor the disappearing of the mantilla as a headdress of the women. It seems, first of all, to be a difference in soul. The faces of the Mexicans are furtive, restless. Their round, staring eyes tell of a primitive nature, simple, stupid, and violent. The new Mexican is of a much calmer countenance. He is steady, he does not fear his neighbors, he has civilized ambitions, and he does not drink. As Mexico and the United States might be called a jungle in the park, so the Mexican has the restlessness of wild nature and the new Mexican the calm of an ordered and domestic life. Prohibition has doubtless had a beneficent effect in New Mexico, but even before the dry regime, the drinking of pulque had almost died out. But pulque, the juice of the maguey cactus, is a curse of Mexican life. In its effect, it is more like a combination of alcohol and cocaine and has a highly destructive effect on nerve and mental organism. Like tequila and mezcal, the other cactus drinks, it is a strong provoker of violent lusts and is reputed to have destroyed whole civilizations before the Spaniards came. Legend tells of a virgin who brought some of it to the eighth king of the Toltecs who took both it and her and had a cactus-born child, and all his people took to the new drink and were then fallen upon by the Chichimecs and destroyed. It was working havoc among the Aztecs in Cortez's time and is responsible for much from then until now. But from that evil power, the Mexican of New Mexico is surely protected. Blood is thicker than water, and it is therefore surprising that there is so little sympathy between the New Mexicans and their kindred over the border. One must seek reasons not only in the better life under American rule, but in the sparsity of the Mexican population on the other side of the line. There is no flood of people in Chihuahua or Cohila or Sonora ready to overflow into what is now American territory. 
New Mexicans do not seem to have kith and kin on the other side. They do not read Mexican papers or take an interest in Mexican affairs. In the case of a new war with Mexico, they would prove as loyal as the bold Texans themselves. The word gringo is not on their lips. They, for the most part, show a marked dislike of being referred to as Mexicans, and if they must be hyphenates, they would rather be called Spanish Americans. They are proud of their citizenship, and are imitators of Anglo-Saxon America so far as their natural conservatism permits. They have fallen into the ways of American business, and have seized upon American politics with great enthusiasm, canvassing Republican or Democrats with the same fervor as the most ardent politicians of the North. In their religious life, however, they are not inclined to change. The piety of the state might be a pattern for the church. The New Mexicans preserve the religious solemnity of a Burgos or Sevilla. All the villages and little towns have beautifully kept churches, and the homes, mud-built as they are, are all adorned with sacred pictures. Here one may see the remarkable santos, pictures of saints painted on wood, not unlike some of the domestic icons of the old believers in Russia, at least in their weird and strange conceptions of the Godhead. Painted without art, smudged onto wood, these santos nevertheless convey the deeply seated religiosity of a race. In New Mexico, there is not the extent of superstition that is to be found in Old Mexico. That is because Indian converts have been fewer. The Indians in Mexico have imported all manner of pagan ideas into current piety. That is natural because they possessed elaborate nature rituals, fetish worships, diabolisms, and the missionaries seldom denied practice or belief if they could change its name to Christianity and induce the pagans to be baptized. But the northern Spanish people kept their religion fairly pure. One remarkable phenomenon, however, in the state is the widespread prevalence of asceticism. Lent is observed with a rigor unknown elsewhere in America. There are thousands of people living in the mountains who practice self-flagellation and beat their bare backs with cactus or with whips till they are streaming with blood. They carry heavy crosses in procession. They even permit themselves to be tied in crucifixial attitude and hung on a cross till they are exhausted. These are called the penitentes, apparently an offshoot of the Third Order of St. Francis, which was inaugurated in Mexico in the first year of Cortez's conquest. These are no longer safely in the bosom of Mother Church, neither are they excommunicated except by their own choice, but they are without priests and practice their rituals in windowless chapels called moradas. Of these, there are many on the mountain sides of the country near Santa Fe. The penitentes cannot be considered popular, and they, for their part, do not ask the interest of outsiders. They are secretive, and some of the Texans are all for cleaning them up. There is no 100% Americanism in their practices, perhaps not 1%, and I doubt that they can long endure. They are likely to be forced into the conventional orthodoxy of the church within the century. Santa Fe is in one way remarkable for its religious processions. Open-air rituals, ceremonies, processions are forbidden in Mexico proper, and the monasteries and convents have mostly been dissolved. A monk is a rarity in Chihuahua, but a common figure in New Mexico. Sacred images repose in churches in Old Mexico, but here nothing so usual as to bring them out into the street in a grand parade. When carried out, the little white de Vargas Madonna in memory of the succor given the Spanish troops in the 17th century in the recovery of Santa Fe from the Indians who had risen, killed the priests, raised their churches, and sacked the country. The procession may easily have been a mile long. Brass bands, sacred banners, mounted candlesticks, choir boys and clergy, Knights of Columbus led by someone with a long bared sword. Indians wrapped in their blankets, squaws with black hair hanging in a cloud to their waists, children carrying garlands of flowers, Mexican men in their clumsy clothes, women in a long array of black. 
Such a procession is memorable and a moving sight. It has missionary power also and draws converts who thirst for color and emotion in the dullness of the Protestant sects. I was urged by some Americans to think that Romanism without the Pope might become the new religion of America, and that it might start its great evangelism and revival from Santa Fe itself. Perhaps I am too much of a European, but the idea of Romanism without a Pope seems that of a tree without a root. I used to go to the Church of the Paulist Fathers in New York every day of my life, said Vachel Lindsay, who comes from an ardent free church stock. I am 70% with them. Get rid of their politics and the Pope, and I would be with them heart and soul. Possibly as America swung free of England and Mexico of Spain, and as the whole of America today with its Monroe Doctrine has cut adrift from European politics, so also its Catholicism might one day say, we will build Rome afresh in the new world and put away the old Rome of Europe as something which has been outlived. There might be a religious war of independence. The Roman adherents of the United States, with its Irish, its Poles, its Czechs, its Southern Germans, Austrians, and Italians, and its Spanish-speaking peoples, is an enormous multitude. They obtain an increasing hold upon the control of America, and they are regarded at present by Protestants as an increasing danger. But that is due not so much to the religious expression of Romanism as to what it implies politically. Of course, there is a very telling reproach to Catholicism, and that is that in Catholic countries one always finds what Protestants call backwardness. It is a common objection in New Mexico, where it is difficult to get enough money to carry out an advanced educational program, where natural ambition seems somehow thwarted by a satisfying religion, where men do not think that their women can have opinions or use a vote, where ethical standards are low and the conscience seems to be encased in proof. Intermarriage is regarded with disfavor by Americans. Many are ready to say that these Spaniards are not Americans, that they cannot be till they become Methodists or Presbyterians and speak the language properly. Even those who emotionally admire the processions and rituals go home to cool off and become disparagingly critical of the people as of foreigners. For such, a trip over the border into old Mexico would be the best medicine that they might see how far New Mexico had progressed from what it used to be when it was part of New Spain. End of chapter 10。Chapter 11 of In Quest of El Dorado by Stephen Graham。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Chapter 11 From New Mexico to the Isthmus from the dry, bracing upper air of Santa Fe, where you may ride for long without raising a moist particle on your brow, down to hot and humid New Orleans, where, without stirring a muscle, you perspire at all pores and your body flows away from you to the wide Mississippi, it is a striking climatic transit. The latitude is much the same, a difference of five degrees north, but there are 7,000 feet, and the desert behind you, water's edge, the Mississippi Delta, and the Gulf in front. From the pine sentinels of the mountains to the rank heat of the sugar plantations and the rice. New Orleans in summer is hotter than Panama itself. Visitors on holiday from the American Panama Territory complain of the heat, the mosquitoes, and the dirt, but revel in the shops, the sweets, and the Creole cooking. What is the most wonderful thing you saw in New Orleans? I asked of a schoolgirl on the boat going to the isthmus. The ten-cent store, she answered without hesitation. And did you have pralines? I'll say I did. Our boat, which accommodated chiefly Americans returning from vacation back home, took five days over the serene blue Gulf of Mexico and across the no less serene, unwavering Caribbean from the great southern port to Colon. 
we passed the vague shadows of mountains in yucatan we stopped at a tiny tropic island to pick up a banana merchant who like robinson crusoe lived there with a good man friday a dog and many goats other ships passed slowly on our horizon trailing their smokes in the sky many of them ships which had come through the canal steaming from chile and peru or looping the new loop from los angeles and the pacific ports of mexico to new york passengers scanned each in turn with their glasses and made surmises of identification as when at home they lived in the view of the slowly passing traffic of the canal they had got to know many ships and of these they spoke as a sort of moving scenery of their home windows when the passing ship faded from the mind the passengers and especially the children would return to clamorous games of deck quoits rope rings on board and foam rings on the sea foam rings and the rising of fish the flying fish leaped like living silver out of the sparkling waters and planed in air and dipped and rose again in long travelling curves keeping pace as it seemed with the speed of the ship all the passengers wore white and the ship itself was painted white everything was white except the faces and the hands of the colored stewards they were mostly a dark mahogany these black men several of whom were from dutch guinea gave perfect service and one of them my waiter brought in every dish at dinner in a sort of cakewalk step keeping time to the records which another sedulously watched and changed whilst we ate the passengers when they were not playing quoits played cards the only conversation was of ships and men in the canal zone of life they knew and others didn't the sort of exclusive talk into which it is difficult for an outsider to enter nevertheless i obtained much useful information about the isthmus and the jungle though none could tell me of balboa except that he must have climbed the hill called mount balboa up which picnic parties now go on sundays to eat their luncheon that hill of course was only named in honor of balboa yet it is strange how even denizens of the zone will tell you it is the one he climbed as for the jungle outside the ten mile wide strip of united states territory they told me many stories of shooting expeditions of men who never came back of men who were liars who said they had penetrated into the interior i learned for the first time of the forbidden country which is held against all comers by the indians whose forefathers balboa and his men fought and enslaved i heard of the lost treasures which lie in that country sacred treasures of indians lost treasures of the conquistadores hidden loot of pirates of the spanish main almost all now guarded by supernatural powers and the ghosts of those who once owned them the adventure of going into the jungle and climbing balboa's peak began to take on a more parlous hue why not go to it by airplane i was asked the columbia aerial post from panama would take you without getting your feet wet quite an idea it must be a beautiful sight from an airplane, the two oceans rolling gently towards one another, the attenuation of the two continents to the isthmus, and the silver thread of the canal. With such thoughts, the last day was fraught, and when I carried my knapsack out on the clean, dry dock of Cologne Harbor, that quiet, unflurrying, unflurried place, I was much amused by the difference between a gilded imagining and bare reality. The Spanish main is indeed changed today where their stars and stripes flies over it. There are perfect arrangements for the convenience of travelers. No haggling porters, touts, sharps, money changers, no bewildering noise, no excitement, but instead a laconic customs officer, chalking bags and trunks, a gateway, and a few horse cabs ready to take you anywhere for a shilling. End of chapter 11chapter twelve of in quest of el dorado by stephen graham this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twelve climbing a peak in darien columbus sought first a new way to india and glory for spain 
and then his followers sought gold and gems. Spain made a rapid transit in time. For as a young man has visions and the mature seeks fame, so the old and disillusioned turn cynically to gold as the only substance which in the end will not disappoint its possessor. Spain became old suddenly. Was it rapacity bred decay or decay rapacity? Even the Indians, who admired all else, laughed at the Spanish lust for gold. It was given to the most faithful son of the church to discover America, given to the conqueror of the Moors to despoil it. In a time of growing heresy, word-of-mouth heresy, mathematical heresy, Spain in action wrought out one of the greatest of heresies, proving by discovery the existence of a new world. Yet Spain reposed spiritually on a medieval faith, and the spirit of Protestantism rising at that time was the negation of that faith, saying no to the sword of the Lord and the triumph of the saints. And Spain could not partake of the new, for she had not that Teutonic self-questioning about conscience that stirred the north. Scandals did not scandalize Spain, and the pother about indulgences was merely disloyalty to God's vice-regent. Spain had no quest after truth. It was enough to apprehend the beautiful and the true. For the rest, she had a blind faith of the church. Hence the ferocity of the Inquisition. Hence, at a later time, the rise of the Jesuits, ready to give their undivided wills to St. Peter in charge for God. New history marked the old when Spain began to prove that the world was round, and that the little old sheepfold and pasture in Mediterranean Lake made only a particle of God's creation, and that the first fifteen centuries of the Christian era had been blind to half the world. Mankind was groping through the medieval forms toward a life more unconfined. On the one hand was the anchorite in his cell in the wall of the church, on the other Columbus sailing to the west. The navigator seemed a daring free thinker to his sailors, an impious man who ought to be restrained. Nevertheless, in a spirit of profound religiosity, Columbus and his crew found first land and named it San Salvador, the Holy Savior. Devout wonder, devouring curiosity, fantastic credulity, lust for treasure quickly followed one another in the Spanish mind. The visions ruled in the heart of Columbus, glory rose in the eyes of the monarch behind him, cupidity itched the fingers of the multitude. But the world wondered. The old world paused whilst a new idea entered it, and a new seed of life was sown. Four voyages and sailing ships, tempestuous, troublesome, anxious, with ever more credulous and violent crews, but Columbus clung to the last to the hope of a new way east. How mysterious, how haunting and pathetic, and yet visionary, the fumbling and nosing of Columbus's vessels along the coasts of Panama and Darien in that last voyage of his, sensing a place where a passage must be made. It is like the trouble of nature before sunrise, a thought before dawn. San Salvador is a long strip of low-lying shore, a platform above the sea, and at night a lighthouse beaming over the dark ocean. It is a shore, and it is a light. That is what it was then, the other side, and the light of salvation. The story of the first islands, those bits of paradise vouchsafed to lost mariners, is pitiful and tragic. The story of the mainland, the Spanish main, is violent and sinful. Adam voluntarily banished himself from Eden a second time. With the banners of the church and the spirit of Cain, the discoverer set foot in the new world. In the name of God, let us remain here, cried the tempest-tossed Diego de Nicuesa in 1507, when he found the quiet water of Nombre de Dios Bay. In the name of God, in the name of God, Nombre de Dios, Nombre de Dios, cried his followers. And there they made a colony which endured, and in time made the first base for the treasure fleet. Balboa discovered the Pacific in 1513. In 1519, on the shore of the other ocean, the city of Panama was founded. 
In 1520, Magellan rounded Cape Horn. In 1521, he reached the Philippines, where he was killed in battle. But the survivors of his ship sailed on and reached, with no small astonishment, the Cape of Good Hope, and then made Europe, thus circumnavigating the world. Magellan called his ocean the Pacific. In 1521, Cortes got to the Pacific, crossing Mexico to Tehuantepec. In 1524, Pizarro set sail from Panama City to the conquest of Peru. Then commenced the building of the Royal Road, the Camino Real, through the jungle of Darien for the safe transit of the treasure caravans, and Spaniards enslaved Indians and made them hew away with knives and carry the blocks of stone, cobbling it a yard wide, all the way from Nombre de Dios to Panama itself. Pearls and gold came from the South Seas, gold and silver ornaments, gems of all kinds, and then gold and silver in massive bars. The pack trains, led by the muleteers and guarded by men in armor, toiled through the dank, hot jungle. There was built at Nombre de Dios a great stone treasure house, where the spoils were heaped up or stacked to wait the coming of the galleons. The plate fleet, bearing to Spain its precious cargoes, became the astonishment of the ocean, firing the thoughts of pirates and adventure seekers, and, not least, England's Elizabethan sailors. The plate fleet was harried. Nombre de Dios was attacked. Nombre de Dios was burned. Nombre de Dios became known as the Spaniard's Grave. I sailed there in a little boat with a weazened old man who was owner and skipper and cook and sailor all in one. And as we rode over the curling waves, his talk was all of gold. There were a score of tatters and the only pair of trousers he had in the world. I advanced him ten dollars to buy provisions and oil for his little cooker. He wore a twenty-year-old straw hat. He collected newspapers, which he seemed to regard as precious in themselves. But he said, my God, he was very profane. When I get someone to put capital into my mines, I shall be king. A cross between a German and a Panamanian Negro, he was at once credulous and calculating. I could not convince him that I was not seeking gold or oil or at least manganese. The German in him made up his mind about me. I was made to correspond to the description of my type in a Leipzig encyclopedia. The Negro in him was fantastically imaginative regarding the treasures of the Spanish main. He had sailed for forty years, seeking gold, seeking treasure. Far from it being a pestilential coast, Darien was paradise. It was a health resort. There were no mosquitoes. This land is Aden, he kept saying, filling me with mirth, for he meant Eden all the time. We passed, or were passed by, many schooners manned by Jamaicans, proudly and superfluously flying British flags, and by the San Blas Indians in dugout canoes surmounted by the most rudimentary sails. We came alongside and looked on the mean cargoes of coconuts and bananas and on the Mongolian features of the untamable Indians. The same Indians whom the Spaniards treated so ill have long since recaptured their country and have established a feud with white man and black man. Nearly all Darien today is called the Forbidden Country, and no one who is not an Indian dare remain there after nightfall. But the Indians come down to the shore, or even set off in canoes to trade fruit and monkeys and parrots for, one thing mostly, powder. The Spanish priests tried to teach them to pray to God, but the other Spaniards brought a more convincing gospel of powder. My skipper evinced great contempt for them, however. They'll never be no use till put underground, he averred. All this, he pointed to the entangled jungle of the shore, is white man's country. Only white men can do any good here. We called it tropical islands, all gnarled rocks and upstarting palms, places for pirates, places for loot. We called it inhabited islands, trading islands with great general stores. On these were white men making a fortune by intercepting the schooners and bartering fruit with canned goods, tools, guns, cartridges. But the wild shore of the mainland held the eyes. 
Green hands of the jungle reached out from the tangles, as if all the trees and shrubs were also savages locked in some orgy in which the young and slender were being suffocated or trodden underfoot. Hands of despair were stretched outward to the sea. But when we came into Nombre de Dios Bay, the barbarity of the vegetable kingdom seemed to have receded as age and depravity stepped back for innocence. The gentlest of waves rippled forward on a fine half-round of sand, and there might well have been many children playing on that long curve of shell-strewn beach. It was peaceful. It was sunbathed and blue and gleaming, and it was empty. Even the two schooners and the three dugout canoes were hidden from view by the breakwater and dam. A huddled village with thatched roofs looked out from under isolated, fringing palms, like gray women with shawls about their ears. In the background, a ruined church of stone. Time stood still in the mind whilst I turned back the pages of the chronicles and saw this bay of childhood and romance as the Spaniard's grave. Here, then, lived Francis Drake in disguise, watching how the Spanish shipped the treasures of Peru on the plate fleet. Nombre de Dios was built in stone then, but you will search in vain for that stone today, unless it is in the structure of the church or in the roadway of the treasure trail. I have brought you to the mouth of the treasury of the world, cried Drake, when in 1592 he captured Nombre de Dios and led his 73 English sailors to the stacks of bars and gold and silver there, so heavy no man could take any of it away. Even at the moment when El Dorado's gold confronted them, the Spaniards rallied and Drake was shot in the thigh and his companions driven off. But the English seamen returned several times and at last destroyed the city so that it never recovered. Drake, after many adventures, returned there to die. He ambushed the treasure caravans, he waylaid the plate fleet. With his little ship, the Golden Hind, he captured the greatest galleon called Cacafuegos, he burned Santo Domingo, he fought the Armada, he sailed around the world, he singed the King of Spain's beard. He played at bowls in Devonshire part of the time, but it was Nombre de Dios in the Spanish main that held him at the last, for in a leaden coffin his body lies there somewhere under the quiet sea. The people who live in Nombre de Dios now are in themselves the ruins of nations, Chinamen married to Negro women who are themselves partly Spanish, partly Indian. Moslem traders from India living with Jamaican girls who are half English. Here lives a Polish-American trader with a mulatto. And the children, they swarm and are just savages. Even the missionaries avoid them. Even the Catholicism to which nominally they belong has no hold. Its church has no roof and a padre to brave the mosquitoes is not there. Neighbor to Nombre de Dios upon the Spanish main is Puerto Bello, which afterwards became the anchorage of the treasure fleet. But Puerto Bello was also destroyed, and also by one of Albion's hateful isle, though he was by no means a true hero of romance. Henry Morgan the pirate. He blew it up. He marched with his crew, cutlass in hand, across the isthmus, and fired Panama, too, or caused the Spaniards in defense to fire it, thus wrecking the fairest city of its time in America, a city of 7,000 cedarwood houses, 200 treasure houses, and threescore churches with golden altars, a city already of 30,000 souls. That was in 1671. He was rewarded by his king, after he had bought a knighthood, and was made governor of Jamaica. He had, in fact, quite a modern career. They point his grave out to you as you sail along the shore, and every half-savage in Panama knows more of him than of Drake or Balboa. And at Puerto Bello there has remained untouched for two centuries the spectacular ruin which he wrought. The rusty guns lie where they lay the morning after, beside the massive stone fortifications. Spiked, useless, and yet impressive in idleness. It is surprising that they have not been taken away for use as ornaments of some new city square, or at least for the value of the metal that is in them. 
Puerto Bello has a mixed negroid population and many bamboo huts, but it has also stone houses. It was once well laid out and has beautiful little stone bridges and pleasure seats. The fortified part is extensive, and as one walked the ramparts, the only European, indeed the only person about it all, once more time, as it were, stopped in the mind, and one realized the night when the pirates came, and drunk and idle the Spanish soldiers, and dire the fate they met. But I left behind me the thought of Morgan at the old portal of the city, where, scarcely molded over, stand the three crosses which mark the place where, for nearly two hundred years, the treasure caravans came regularly and made an end of their long, arduous jungle journey, and the priests gave blessing whilst enslaved Indian coolies toiled and soldiers and sailors swore. And the old, disused, cobbled roadway plunges through sedges under the marsh and into the vegetation and darkness which has long since swallowed it up. From Puerto Bello, Morgan crossed the isthmus. From Nombre de Dios, Drake crossed it, and from a goodly and a great high tree looked on the waters of the South Seas for the first time. Where exactly Balboa crossed it, no one knows, for no one has come that way again. But it was certainly in what is now called Forbidden Country, which the Indians have long since recaptured, and now hold by force of arms to the total exclusion of all who are not Indians. It was in the forbidden country that William Patterson landed in 1698 with 1,200 men, gentlemen of Scotland, clansmen, old soldiers, traders, and uncovered on Darien shore the banner of St. Andrew, blessed at Leith at parting. And they mounted 50 guns and called the fort New St. Andrew, and proceeded to organize a trade road through the jungle, a mere fifty miles to the other side, convinced that thereby the trade of the world would begin to pass through their hands. The expedition failed disastrously. It seems the Scotsmen were greatly discouraged by King William III, who loathed the Scots and ordered his governors at Jamaica and elsewhere to refuse them supplies. They were strong enough to keep both Indians and Spanish off, but they lacked adequate food and were soon sorely stricken with fever. Their relief ship foundered off Cartagena. Patterson became temporarily deranged, for which, in my opinion, he was much to blame, having no right to go out of his mind whilst his responsibility was so great. Apathy, or was it despair, seized the Scots, and without realizing a doit to their expectations, they returned to Scotland. They had been eleven months on the Spanish main, and some they left behind will lie there forever. Though many died, you will search in vain for Scottish graves. Only the imagination, going back once more, may yield a whisper of the pipes played on that desolate shore. They all sought gold. Poet discoverers, conquistadores, heroic sailors, dastardly pirates, Scottish shareholders, El Dorado was their common goal. Even Balboa himself, raising human eyes on the Pacific, was accompanied by those who looked no wise but downward with a muckrake in their hands. Balboa had settled at Salvatierra in Haiti and sailed across to Santa Maria de la Antigua on a shore of the Gulf of Darien, and was joined to a group of men whom he captained, making fantastic expeditions into the interior in quest of a massive gold idol, it, the golden one, El Dorado, and they fought continuously the warlike Indian chiefs and their retainers, generally making the conquered their allies and seeking out another chief against whom the conquered Indians nursed some grievance. The Indians wore ornaments of gold, as they still do today, but they placed no value on the metal itself, until it had been fashioned to some end. But the jewelry of which the Spaniards ravaged the tribes led them to believe in some great source. Comagra gave Balboa 4,000 ounces and told him that on the other side of the mountains was a great sea and cities and ships and wealth inexhaustible. And the explorer pondered the matter in his heart, and he said, God has revealed the secrets of this land to me only, and for this I shall never cease to thank him. 
an astonishing idea that god the spiritual genius behind all creation should be taking thought to reveal gold to thieves and yet it was sincerely held it was not exactly humor that the spaniards lacked when the first jackass made his first hee-haw on american soil appalling the indians who appealed to know what this strange animal was wanting a spaniard replied he is saying that we need more gold still more gold do you understand material desire and fever of exploration drove balboa on and with a hundred and ninety followers in chain mail he sailed from antigua to the lands of the subject chief careta whose daughter he espoused this was at the beginning of september fifteen thirteen he traveled two days along the shore to the domains of ponca and then after a fortnight they started inward to the heart of the jungle cutting their way with their swords sweating under their armor and in four days of unbelievable difficulties they came to the foot of high tree-clad slopes there they encountered porque and the indians of Quarequa. porque they slew the indians they dispersed the gold they took that was on the 24th of September, and on the next morning early, Balboa set off to climb the mountain of the world with his Spaniards behind him and Indian guides ahead. There was with him also a priest and the lawyer and a dog. The priest was for God, the lawyer for the king of Spain, and the dog for himself. Little Lion, the bloodhound, held military rank and drew rations, it is said. He was alleged to be worth any three men. Where is Quarequa? No one knows. Perhaps it is even an invented name and the fight put in by the narrators to give feature to the story. How many hours Balboa's party struggled from the Indian village to the top of the Sierra has not been calculated. Did Balboa look upon the Pacific at noon, or was it in the glamour of a later light? Possibly with his Indians to lead him, it was still morning. And it was still morning in the soul, the morning of new life and light, the morning of discovery. Balboa halted his party and then advanced alone and saw the sea. Religious geography is part of the art of living. To come to each new place on the chart called Earth, not in a spirit of mere jollity, but with some reverence, gives a richness to life. Whilst some seek gold, others seek spiritual gold, the soul's possession, which is neither sentimental nor unreal, but is indeed the one substance out of which, in the beginning, all things were made. The apology of a world traveler that he did not see the Pacific before, from the heights of Tehuantepec, from the Golden Gate of San Francisco, from the stone eminence of the new city of Panama, he preferred to see it with Balboa's eyes, climbing a peak out of the jungle and looking also, and in like manner for the first time, in that way to perform a geographical rite in the world temple. I traveled with Cecily Lucares and Victor Morales. One carried my pack and a gun, the other, with his long knife, slashed the passage clear of jungle growth. It was icy cold and burning hot at the same time, dank and steaming. Perspiration soaked even through the leather of one's knee boots, but small cold airs crept out of the profound green shadow on either hand, chilling for moments the very marrow. Underfoot were innumerable water currents and mud and slime, and the giant trees above us dripped water all the while. A grave-like coldness crept up about everywhere, and now and then a draught of air would lift my wet shirt and make it flap against the skin. Yet it was burning hot. The Spaniards plunged across the isthmus in chain mail. I was in my shirt. My guides were without even a shirt. How the conquistadores did it in complete armor gives a measure of the physical endurance of these men. The ground is strewn with rotting yellow plums, which have fleshy centers and bittersweet taste. Monkeys hang from the trees looking at us. Parrots innumerable flutter about the open spaces. And when we come to open spaces, how painful the sun. I am dazzled by the gleaming points of my eyelashes. Eyes want to get right in, temples throb. It is easier to cross the isthmus in January or February, the dry season, but Balboa crossed it in the wet. 
It is his September and rains every day as no doubt it did then. Up to the knees in soft mud, up to the waist in water each day, and the feet all swollen and broken by the treatment. The guides, with their bare feet and legs, seemed able to take the floods more easily, and Morales, in midstream of a rushing torrent, with my knapsack balanced on his head and his gun on top of that, whilst water foamed against his bare breast, is a sight not easily forgotten. Apprehensions of a lost knapsack stamped it on the mind. We rested in a jungle village. I sat on a clay floor with a wild monkey on a string and noisy children and scarcely less noisy parrots. We were regaled with cola wine and grated coconut and oil and rice and bits of fat pork and some of the ugliest preserves I have ever encountered. It was the time of the rice crop, and rice in the husk was drying in baskets in every little palm-leaf hut. Every hour the women took the rice baskets and shook them to help dry out the grain. Next day an aged negro with grizzled wool led me on, and we found in the depths of the thicket that which I could not follow from Nombre de Dios, part of the Camino Real, now moss-covered and green but unmistakable, a massive cobbling of large stones with a lateral upturned stone along the edge for curb, just room for a panniered ass and no more, but now so overgrown in places that even a monkey could not pass on it. Trees have shot up and split the cobbling, the scrub has met over it, and for many miles it climbs amid the mahogany trees high up into the mountains. It would be worthwhile for someone to employ natives and spend a month cutting clear and tracing this great treasure trail all the way from coast to coast, for there must have been resting places and perhaps even taverns on it, and possibly a chapel halfway. The Spikades, the colored people of the jungle, all believe in lost treasure and are superstitious regarding the evil spirits which are guarding it. Some have even bits of Spanish gold which have been found. Indeed, true treasure trove is frequent if the treasure be not great. We made but slow progress in the jungle. Rainy weather and consequent mud held us. I changed my guides three times. None cared to go far from home. Two nights were spent in the scantiest shelter. Thousands of flaming fireflies lit the floating mists which along the edge of a jungle clearing looked like phantoms living in dark houses. The wraiths were of unstable dimensions, now swelling to a bank of mist, now tailing away to nothingness. But the fireflies lighted their way, myriads of fireflies. I lay in all the clothes I possessed and in my boots and wearing gloves, but still the mosquitoes bit how to combat a foe that you actually take in with your breath. Tongues of fire among white mists in intense darkness, howling of monkeys, the creaking and wailing and prolonged noise of insects in the trees, mosquitoes as noiseless and attentive as breath, the air not vital, suffocating, of such were the nights. In a hotel you would turn and turn, but something in the jungle constrains you to lie like one dead all the night long, and that something also banishes thought. There breaks out the throb of a native drum, one only, but you cannot say where it comes from. It is far away, it is close at your ear, it is wandering in the jungle. Who could be beating it, and why? But it is no matter, your eyes close. You fall into a light slumber and lie dreamlessly. You cannot estimate how long. But suddenly horror breaks upon your soul. You start up, you look around, you fall back in a cold sweat. A roaring as of lions has torn through your consciousness. You think a puma has found you, and then as suddenly you laugh and relax. It is a pack of night howling monkeys beating their hairy breasts high among the branches and howling like lost souls. A vague thought enters the mind, the lost souls of those who murdered Indians for their gold. Morning comes and proves that each bad night was but a bad dream, a nightmare, and not God's creation. For even over the white man's grave it is fresh with fair rose colors in the sky. The natives think that I am a gringo surveyor planning a new road, and are quite pleased. 
They have never heard of Balboa or of Drake, or indeed of anyone except Morgan. They think the Camino Real was built about fifty years ago. They know nothing, but I found them extremely dignified and courteous. The women seemed especially modest and discreet, and those stories of the Spicades telling their young girls for a few dollars and of the Indians selling their children are not true, except to the people on the coast, those corrupted by traitors. The men and women are not married, but then there are no priests. Religion is nothing to them, but something of ethics is instinctive. They are said to be poor workers. It is hard to tempt them out of the jungle to do a day's work for pay. They do not want a Victrola or a five-foot shelf of books. A few bright cottons for the women and powder for the men is all they ask. Money is scarce. In the depths of the jungle, Chinamen keep little stores with a daily turnover of about 25 cents. An open packet is a stock of cigarettes, and they sell them, one at a time. They will even sell half a cigarette, the only people in the world who would undertake such a trade. I wondered at the swarm of children of these Chinamen, begotten of their black wives. What will you do with them when you make your fortune? I asked one. The best boys I take with me to China, the rest I leave behind, he said. I found that in the native huts I never had to pay for hospitality. It is true, however, that whole families enjoyed my provisions, gloated over tin milk, drank mug after mug of dense nombre de Dios coffee, ate chocolate as a wonderful novelty. In return, they would put in the midst of the red mud floor a large pot of rice and pieces of smoked fish and forest berries soaked in brine. They brought down branches of fat, little cream-colored bananas from the roof. A parrot would lift itself by its beak on my fingers whilst I ate, and in the same way up my coat to my shoulder, calling and out-calling its mate, who was perched on an ox-limbed woman in colored overalls. In such a hut I met Martinez, a man with no arms and only one eye. He had lost his members dynamiting fish. Martinez had hooks tightly corded to the stumps of his wrists and had learned to do all that most of us can do with hands. Thus he struck a match and lighted a cigarette, he shouldered my knapsack, he lifted down an old gun from the wall, he slung it on his back. Even using hooks for hands, he was a good shot with a gun. Martinez was, by temperament, a hunter, and was less interested in getting me to the Pacific coast than in following trails of wild beasts. He showed me a tree sloth hanging in the hammock of its own body high up among the branches, showed me a boa coiled like a cable and sleeping like a babe. That did not interest him, but the jaguar and the puma were ever in his thoughts. We came upon the footprints of a tiger, a grande gato, a perfect six-spot in the mud. With bent back and staring eye, Martinez was for following it, and he gave me his long knife. But I said, no. No carry? he inquired, raising his bows. No quiere? No, Martinez. Grande gato makes a nice meal, you and me. Sabe, Martinez? I made signs to him, pointing down my throat. Ah, you no carry, he rejoined sadly and set his face toward the sun. He threaded his way to an isolated hunt surrounded by bog where lived a bachelor acquaintance more ready to follow up the trail of the tiger. There we brewed coffee, and as I sat in the doorway sipping it, I saw fly past like a flame the most beautiful bird I had seen in the jungle. The sportsman missed it, but heavy as I was with clinging mud, I started up to follow it. I was tired enough of tramping, wet to the waist, mud to the knees. I had fallen down several times. Armless Martinez had offered to carry me across one or two morasses and torrents, and had actually raised me on his shoulders once, but I felt him waver under me and took my two hundred pounds down from his back. I was glad when we came once more upon a stretch of the Camino Real and could actually walk upon it. We stepped steadily upward and I began to meditate climbing that goodly and high tree, for there were many such starting out of the marsh and the scrub and going straight to heaven. But then, suddenly and unexpectedly, coming out on a scarp of a commanding ridge, I saw the ocean. 
I did not need to climb a tree. From this ridge, I also saw the Pacific for the first time, far away, a blue triangle of water beyond the hills and the forests and the ridges. There was a wide and majestic view, and the great trees of the jungle made a framework on either hand like the extended plumage of an eagle. To my one-eyed guide, it meant nothing, and he could not understand why I paused in the way and called him back. But it was a great moment. A warm current ran through my veins, and something seemed to lighten heavy boots. Wings came out from my heels, and I stood on tiptoe and stared. That phrase of Keats, a wild surmise, came very near to naming the feeling of rapture. The eyes of Vasco Nunez de Balboa, the eyes of Francis Drake, the eyes of one of the many. It was all for this, I whispered. Martinez restlessly waved his hooks and peered at me one-sidedly. Grande Oceano, he said reflectively as we resumed our tramp, and he led me to the sea. It was many hours, but they went easily, and we came out to the shore in the peace of late evening. There, in a little inn, we drank Blanco Seco and toasted Vasco Nunez de Balboa and Francis Drake, whom certainly the one-eyed man did not know, but I then counted out silver dollars for Martinez and paid him off, and he was pleased. Balboa, it is said, knelt on the mountain alone, and then his comrades came and planted a cross. And the pious chronicler avers that the Te Deum Laudamus and Te Dominum Confitimur were sung. The dog, Leoncito, barked for joy. Balboa, in a loud voice, claimed all that was visible for the king of Spain, and the lawyer whom they had brought along drew up a deed which was signed by sixty-seven Spaniards, all that was left of the original hundred and ninety. Balboa then marched to the sea. Pizarro, one of his companions, afterwards conqueror of Peru, was the first to reach the shore, and with two others they entered an abandoned canoe, and were thus the first white men to sail on the Pacific. Next day, Balboa took possession of the ocean for the king of Spain. He did not throw his ring in the water like the doge of Venice taking possession of the Adriatic, but clad only in his shirt, he marched with twenty-six of his comrades into the waves. In one hand he carried a banner of Castile, in the other a naked sword. They stood around Balboa, Pizarro, and the rest. They made crosses of steel. They kissed one another sword hilts. They lowered the crimson banner to the water. It had been morning on the mountains and was sunset on the sea, the light of vision and then the many colors of glory sinking toward oblivion. With me also there was some of the light of romance in the glamour of the evening on the shore of the southern sea. End of chapter 12「In Quest of El Dorado」by Stephen Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13. Republics of Panama and Nicaragua. From the jungle to the canal is almost as great a leap as to New York itself. Out of barbarism to the most advanced post of civilization, the place where in all the world the stars and stripes wave most proudly. President Roosevelt obtained almost as great prestige by the Canal of Panama as Disraeli did by that of Suez. In England he would have had more, but America ten years ago was not as sensible of the value of an ocean key as she is now. Disraeli never needed to make speeches on how he acquired the Suez Canal for the empire, but Roosevelt tired the platform echoes with, I started it, I made sure the Panama Canal for the American people, I let Congress talk, but the work of construction went on. Roosevelt was ready to go down to fame as the man who was responsible for the canal, for he was, by temperament, a strong imperialist, and the canal, he knew, must prove a great factor in the future development of American commerce and in the increase of American influence in Latin America. Roosevelt confirmed the Monroe Doctrine in his political practice, 
and by achieving the construction of the canal, he gave the doctrine an extension of application. He reserved the commercial exploitation of America for the American nations. The circumstances of the acquirement by the United States of the trans-Isthmian strip of land, ten miles wide, the canal zone, are of minor importance today. The Colombian government, to whom it belonged, haggled long over terms, as usual with the Spanish peoples trying to get as much out of the rich Yankees as they could. Colombia grossly overdid it on this occasion, and in 1902 an insurrection was arranged by the United States in that part of Colombia, now called the Republic of Panama. Roosevelt ordered the fleet to prevent the landing of Colombian soldiers. There was, therefore, no bloodshed. It was one of the happiest of revolutions, and a new nation was at once recognized by Washington, the Panamanian. A constitution and a government for the Panamanian nation were soon obtained, and the long-desired treaty for the acquisition of the zone was signed. The Panamanians, that is, the families of its aristocratica, did well. They received $10 million down and a rental of $250,000 beginning February 1913. They have become pensioners of the United States government. What they do with the money is not very clear. The speakities in the jungle do not seem to share in it. Wages of police, firemen, postmen, and the like are said to be greatly in arrears. The Colombians, however, remained in sore dudgeon. Not only had they lost territory, but golden gain, and the rebels who had stolen the territory were those who were receiving the dollars. The government of Colombia must have felt foolish, for it is they who would have had the money. They sent north a general to seek redress. This general tried to have the matter submitted to the Hague for arbitration. As Secretary Hay saw, that would hardly have proved satisfactory to the United States, and he refused. The general then returned home, and despite failure, was elected president. In 1909, he made a strong effort once more to obtain redress. The United States then proved willing to do something to right the wrong, and a treaty was drawn up whereby the Panama Republic should pay Colombia a quarter of a million dollars annually. The paucity of this amount so shocked the Colombians that they turned their president out and the treaty was not signed. In 1914, a new president of Colombia made a new attempt to get a settlement with the United States and sent his envoy, Urrutia, to arrange a new treaty. This he did, but it was seven years before the talking died down and in modified form it was signed. It provided for a $25 million indemnity for injuries, and an amendment provided that $5 million should be paid within six months of ratification. Colombia also was accorded special privileges in the use of the Panama Canal and Railroad. In exchange, she recognized the state of Panama. It was signed in December 1921, and Colombia is now once more on friendly terms with the United States. The Republic of Panama, it seems to me, has little future. Its habitable territory is scanty. In the interior are the Indians who refuse to recognize it. It could improve places like Puerto Bello and Nombre de Dios, but it leaves that to the United States. Article 2 of the treaty they signed provides that the Republic of Panama further grants to the United States in perpetuity the use occupation and control of any other lands and waters outside the zone above described, which may be necessary for the construction, maintenance, operation, sanitation, or protection of the said canal. Whenever necessary, therefore, more territory can be added should oil be found or new harbors desired. The importance of the Panama Canal lies not, however, in the jungle which abuts it on both sides, but in itself. Though I did not visit Nicaragua in these journeyings, I think some notes on its position necessary to this study. It is the state next but one north of Panama, and is separated by the small state of Costa Rica. Though Nicaragua is broader than Panama from ocean to ocean, 
it has always been considered as possessing an alternate territory for a canal. This is owing to its large lake and existing waterways. British capitalists have, in time past, considered the feasibility of financing the construction of such a canal. The United States, bargaining with France for the price of de Lesseps' handiwork at Panama, used the idea of a Nicaraguan canal as a persuader. It was used also with the Colombians before the Panama Revolution. Nicaragua is, therefore, a state on which the eyes of America have more frequently rested than on the remainder of Central American republics. She has felt constrained to advise and help her, lend her money, and finally entered into virtual control. In 1907, a war between Nicaragua and Honduras was settled by the joint efforts of Roosevelt and Diaz. The president of Mexico, who had succeeded in quelling the spirit of revolt in his own country, was ready to help in making Central America safe for democracy, and under the auspices of his ideas, a Central American conference was held in Washington, and a sort of League of Nations tribunal was set up. Soon, however, fights broke out again, and Nicaragua started against Salvador, her northwestern neighbor, 1909. The United States then sent down the Marines to hold the Nicaraguans in check. Nicaragua was annoyed with the United States, but instead of showing it in action, appealed ingratiatingly for some advice and money help. Next year, the United States yielded a loan secured on her customs dues. It is like the story of a fallen woman. A little indignant at being ravished, she looks to the ravisher for advice and a little money. He says, you can earn a good deal under my protection. I will advance you a small sum and take it back in dues upon your custom. In 1914, Nicaragua was $14 million in debt and much embarrassed. It was, therefore, not difficult for the United States to drive a new bargain. In exchange for $3 million, the expenditure of which the United States would supervise, Nicaragua was to grant the said United States the exclusive right to construct an interoceanic canal. This canal, the United States naturally had no intention of constructing. The significance of the deal is that no other power should be granted powers to construct a canal. No competitor against the new Panama Canal. Besides this concession, by the same treaty, two small off-coast islands were leased to the United States. Nicaragua's debts today, internal and external, are greater than ever. She buys all she needs in American markets. A controller sits at the receipt of custom. She is indeed still a little annoyed and corresponds with the patriots of Domingo in Cuba. The Central American nations, including Nicaragua, have, however, concluded a new pact which brings them nearer to unity than they have ever been hitherto. This is based on the common ground of Latin sentiment, but its binding power is that of the dollar and a mutual economic interest. The relationship of these republics with the United States is friendly enough to be called domination with the consent of those dominated. It is a remarkable contrast to the belligerency of Mexico. The Central American Pact in 1923 came with a fanfare of drums heralding the Pan-American Conference at Santiago de Chile. End of chapter 13「In Quest of El Dorado » by Stephen Graham This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14 – The Canal They tease the American children born in the canal zone and call them speakity babies, but the same children, when they grow up a little, are proud of their birthplace and say, I'm a calzone boy, I'm a calzone girl. And there's a crowd of them, a real new generation of imperial Americans, rising in health and pride from what was once jungle and pestilence, the white man's grave. The Spanish Negro natives, now generally called spigs, are slow to learn English, and to what they learn they commonly add the letter Y, thus, me no carry for you, and their commonest remark to an American is, me no speakity English. 
Hence, speakity babies and speakities, the word has come to stay. Calzone, which vaguely suggests to the mind undergarments, is very suitable to a swimming population and to those who live in a latitude of steam and heat, but is, after all, only a derivative from canal zone. But calzone also has perhaps entered the language. The children of the canal zone are numerous. Almost the chief characteristic of the ten-mile-wide strip of the territory is the children. This is, first of all, due to God and the government. The United States government has from the first encouraged the canal employees to marry, has given rent-free houses to married couples, and generally made it more comfortable for a married man living there with his wife than for the bachelor. The bachelor is always thinking of vacations back home. The married man identifies home with the place where he sees his wife and children. The zone, therefore, is practically settled by people who are at home. That does not entirely account for the swarms of children. Families are unusually large. There is room for children to kick about in. Children fill a larger place in the affections. And then, as a doctor explained to me, the American woman, tending rather to sterility in the north, is much more fruitful in the tropics. You cannot raise children in India, said he, but we can in Panama. But do look around. The children are muscular, uncommonly active in wrestling and fighting and leaping and swimming. They afford a surprising contrast to their parents, who show some marks of climate. The children run and struggle with one another and are not annoyed by their profuse perspiration. The parents sit and watch the thousand beads of moisture forming on their bare arms. The parents do not stir but to take a cab. The children chase hoops and hop along with scooters. Certainly the children show a surprising development. Many of them learn to dive and swim at four years old, but at nine years you'll sometimes see boys and girls with limbs surprisingly hairy. Children also reach maturity earlier than in the north, and perhaps this brilliant rising generation of calzones will be as pale and passive as the grown-ups by the time they are thirty. There are men here who have missed many ships, I was told. They book a berth, and then when the time comes, forget. Go to the shipping company's office in exchange for a berth on the next ship, and then forget again. Most Army and Naval officers carry notebooks to aid their memories on routine. Apathy, listlessness, no doubt, is the chief danger in Panama, and that being a spiritual danger, it is more to be regarded than the material danger of disease. You notice the difference when you arrive in Panama from the north. You stride, you rush, you soak out your clothes with perspiration, you overtake everybody, you hustle the shopkeepers, drink a whole glass in a bar, whilst your neighbor has merely sipped. You are completely out of step. Then you pause and reflect. You decide to slow down, and the heat does the rest. You are soon going as slowly as any man who has missed ships. Nevertheless, the American flag does not wave listlessly. The stars and stripes is no jungle flag. It is a flag of business, of hustle, of enterprise. It will not droop in the tropics, but lift to the trade. Whilst the climate slows down the Anglo-Saxon American, it can never slow him down to the level of the Spanish American. The Panamanians and the Spigs, the lighter and darker Spaniards, breeds, half-breeds, or forest mongrels, have had all nationhood sweated out of them. They claim no affiliations with Spain or with anything bigger than themselves. But the Americans of the zone are one with a hundred million of kith and kin, one with the union of 48 states, one with their president and with New York Times and with the army, which is always with them, and with the navy, which comes and goes. The Calzone people are prouder of America than are most Americans who live in the States themselves. They are like the British colonials, the Australians, the Jamaicans, and the rest, who are prouder of the Union Jack than those who think their empire still is the bank in Holborn Hill. Curiously enough, 
the United States is fast becoming a mother country, and those who were originally colonists are becoming home people, having colonial kith and kin of their own. The Stars and Stripes at the Panama Canal has become the flag of empire. It is the flag flying at the outposts of English-speaking America. It is more rousing and significant there than anywhere else at this time. It may droop at Washington. It may look ridiculous in the hands of Mr. Babbitt. But at Panama, it is the flag of America's inevitable destiny, the flag of her sway and of the triumph of her language, her character, and her business. Even the mere commercial mind has grasped something of the significance of the Panama Canal. It is the greatest advertisement of America in the world. Its construction was a superhuman task, and its achievement shed a light of glory on those who carried it through. It is true that the French started the work and failed, and that Ferdinand de Lesseps and the French nation have grandiose monuments erected to them in Panama City. Frenchmen say Lesseps failed for lack of capital, but everyone who has studied the work of the French there has understood that the French could never have succeeded in cutting through the isthmus. It was not only capital the French lacked, but character and imagination. America began her great national task in a spirit of human kindness by a magnificent effort to save the health of the workers. She made the canal, but she overcame the forces of death first. She overcame the idea of the white man's grave. She rolled away the stone from the sepulcher. What was one of the most pestilential swamps in the world is now something like a health resort. Not only is the mosquito a rarity, but also the domestic fly. After a myriad flies and two tanglefoots a day, it was strange to arrive in an even hotter latitude and find no flies. I was told, if you find a mosquito in your room at the hotel, telephone the office. Not only are there no flies, but no smells, no decaying fruit. You may be arrested if you drop a banana skin in the street. The Chinamen and the Spigs and the Jamaicans who live in rows of double-story frame buildings, the sort of ramshackle places always associated with filthy living, have been terrorized into cleanly living. Hygiene has been forced on them at the point of the bayonet. Even the red light streets are clean, and all those places of low pleasure designed to empty the pockets of seamen are at least sterilized. The women are also under control. The consequence is that the Panama Canal Zone is now a remarkably safe and healthy place. In fact, a memorandum was sent recently from Washington, part of an economy campaign, asking that the expenses on sanitary work in the zone be cut down somewhat until the death rate reached that of the general average of the states. American sanitary science has shown the world that any pest hole can be cleaned up. The sad fact is that few nations have the energy to prosecute such a work of sanitation. Greeks at Salonica, Russians on the Black Sea littoral, Negroes on the Gold Coast, Cubans at Havana. America has a passion for cleaning up. She is the self-constituted universal cleaner, Babbitton Excelsis. It cannot be denied, however, that the United States is the home of graft. America has a long-time reputation for graft. Votes are bought in blocks. Police, jurymen, judges know the meaning of in God we trust, others pay cash. But paradoxically enough, the standard of American character is high. Compared with the personal character of Mexicans, Panamanians, Cubans, it is lifted into an exalted sphere. The Latin Americans stand around waiting for cash, that is their curse, and they are ready to sell rights, liberties, lands, children, everything for cash down. Truth to say, if America were so eaten up with graft as her reputation says, the Panama Canal would never have been constructed. It was too big a job to be carried through by people of debauched wills. It is a monument of America's executive power, of her technical knowledge, and of her readiness to use that knowledge and stake millions upon it. Every foreign ship, 
passing through the canal, bows to the stars and stripes, and, though paying a money due, yet acknowledges a debt of civilization to the American people. Engineers, captains, tourists, crews, all obtain a new impression of America. America ceases to be a land merely of canned goods, Yankee dialect, and oil kings. Its flag comes nearer to the Union Jack as one of world civilizing power. The ships pass deliberately through with processional slowness. Ever more ships, ever more diverse in nationality. There is a great dignity about the traffic of the canal, like the stately manners of a bygone age. The ships represent their nations and come as guests through American waters. America is the hostess of the world. After all, that which is most respected in the world is visible achievement, and whilst bad manners generally accompany sham strength or actual weakness, good manners are enjoined by the sense of power. A prophecy of more than two hundred years standing, made by the founder of the Bank of England, hails the possessor of these doors of the seas as the coming lawgivers of both oceans and arbitrators of the commercial world. The Panama Canal delivers Central and South America to Wall Street, to the American commercial commonwealth, to the American people. Every month just now sees the traffic record broken. More and more ships pass through. More and more business is being done. What will be the normal average traffic, no one can yet tell. The canal was opened in the gloom of war. There were slides of silt which closed it again, and a war menace which overcast its importance at the time. Its real significance has been overclouded, and all praise has been under praise. It must necessarily now shine forth more and more as one of the maritime gates of the world, looked to from England, China, Australia, from the Pacific coasts of North and South America, and from all the islands of the South Seas. It automatically doubles the trade of the Southern and Central American republics of the Pacific coast with the United States. The latter can make up all European losses and most efficiencies in raw materials by way of the canal. Whilst the American flag certainly waves less on European waters, it waves more on the Pacific Ocean. Pan-Americanism, the dream of Stephen Douglas and many others, is carried nearer to realization the dream that America should rule all the way from the Canadian line to the Isthmus without question and without regret. That the United States will ever rule south of the equator seems questionable. Such a rule belongs possibly to the next century but one. But for the time being, she has an economic hold even upon South America. As regards Mexico, Nicaragua, Panama, and the rest, she begins to have a very strong control. Despite the noise of protest, there is not much real patriotic stamina in the people of these countries. They have less sense of nationhood than Austrians or Eskimos. Almost everything can be bought from them for cash down. So they necessarily go under the influence of American capital. The old world is greatly jealous of America's imperial march forward, and will naturally follow the progress with much malignity. And the radical and liberal idealists within America have already raised a cry which must yet sound much louder. Empire was never foreseen by the fathers of the Republic. It is opposed to the historical conception of American liberty. It makes the Declaration of Independence more out of place than ever. But what is to be done? America, by her big business and the system, is betrayed to an imperial destiny and cannot help herself. Her vast surplus of capital, her gold accumulations, must in the human way of necessity find an outlet for use. The West has been exploited. The old world is distrusted. There remains, inevitably and obviously, the South. Go south, young man, is being substituted in the consciousness of the American for the old cry of go west. The inwardness of the idea that Jamaica, Barbados, Bermuda, and the rest of the British island possessions of the Indies should be assigned to the United States 
in part payment of the war debt much talked of before the baldwin settlement of the debt question is part of the new american march to the south the control of cuba haiti and santo domingo is part of it the sapping of mexico and nicaragua is part of it without the canal as an inalienable possession these things might be overlooked might indeed be gone back upon by america itself but a mere visit to the canal is said to have power to change an american radical into a patriotic expansionist in fact with regard to the direction of policy and the achievement of national destiny the radicals in america seem more negligible than the german socialists proved to be in nineteen fourteen they do not deserve the persecution they have had they live by the system and are carried along by the system and the system leads to imperial power it is urged however that empire means war it means bloodshed and sorrow and despair for thousands in every decade of its history that is generally true and yet america is remarkably free from enemies the latin americans have a practice of hating americans calling them gringos mejos and the rest but it is a weak hate easily transmutable to respect and warm regard there is nothing to fear from it great britain is of course a mercantile rival on the high seas but america and england are too much intermarried and too much intertwined in business interests to fight a war moreover we speak the same language mutual abuse is merely partisanship the slang of the fanatics and we are no more likely to fire on one another than the giants of new york and the red Sox of chicago as regards the canal that is a sort of strategic position britain has historically seized when she had a chance but one thing is sure britain rejoices in the fact that the waterway is in the hands of people who speak english and have the standard anglo-saxon point of view in the case of war even with japan great britain would probably lend her aid to the united states to keep the canal open and to safeguard it from destruction japan remains as the only serious potential enemy on america's horizon and despite ill feelings and hot words one cannot but remember that that horizon is several thousand miles away there is a great stretch of cooling water between the nominees for the next great fight the only real danger lies in the brains of some heady politician who at some future date may decide on an aggressive war against Japan in her own waters. Such a war might conceivably be fraught with disaster and humiliation for the United States, for the vast Pacific will always aid the side which is in defense. In short, as far as America is concerned, nature is on the side of peace. I foresee five hundred years of prosperity and peace after which no doubt america will weaken the growth of the american empire is the greatest fact in the world today more significant than the decay of europe russia one must remember is smashed with her whole nation down on a gypsy level of culture germany prostrate under the heel of france nears the condition of russia france is self-centered and contented with the mediterranean empire britain marks time alone america goes on she stands now with her hundred million educated population with her vast wealth and serried ranks of millionaires with her unsurpassed technical equipment and industrial organization and she has an enormous appetite for power and zest for life the imagination ought to be given free play in thinking of the coming time bearing in mind that america has finally and absolutely rejected bolshevism communism and all other disjectory theories of government has in fact affirmed in absolute fashion the rights of property and her loyalty to the capitalistic system one can almost forecast by mathematics the state of her wealth at any given date what a stupendous aggregation of material splendor if in the last sixty years america has risen from the civil war level to what she is today to what will she rise in sixty years from now to what will she rise in six hundred years the mind refuses to give the answer to the sum 
but instead whispers the lines, Lord God of hosts, be with us yet, lest we forget. It is so easy to forget. How the soul of America will fare in all this, I have not sought to know. The soul abhorreth the golden treasure house, preferring greatly a humble and a loving heart. America is one thing not answerable to God. Americans will find themselves in America as Romans found themselves in Rome. Individually, now as ever, and like the rest of us, they will have to find their personal way to salvation. One thing which the Great World War seems to have revealed is that we are physically subject to forces over which we have little or no control. These forces are generally called economic and are thought to be academic and theoretic. That is a mistake. They are elemental and primitive. Lloyd George's and Wilson's do not divert them. On the contrary, they themselves sweep statesmen away when the time comes and sweep other statesmen into power. Such a force drives the American flag southward, and the cry is heard, Go South! End of chapter 14「Chapter fifteen of In Quest of El Dorado by Stephen Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter fifteen Panama to New York. I sailed to New York from Cologne on one of those transports designed for the use of canal employees. When the berths are not all taken by officials and their wives, the remainder are sold to the general traveling public. The distance of the voyage in nautical miles is 1,974. In dollars, it is a hundred, and in time, it is six days. The accommodation is one class only, with no steerage passengers. It meant six more lazy days, similar to those spent sailing from New Orleans. The passengers seemed merrier going to New York than the others did coming home. Most of them had the money for a good time in their pockets, but the others had spent theirs and were sobered. There is little that need be said of the voyage. Though late in September, it was sultry and breezeless. We kept expecting a coolness and a change, but it was not until the fifth day that the north touched us, and that was a day of packing, of coming out in shore clothes, of putting on unsuspected overcoats and bowler hats. The ship's company changed itself from white-clad Central Americans into somber New Yorkers. The sky itself grew overcast. More serious expressions crept into people's faces as, late next afternoon, we steamed up the Hudson into the presence of Manhattan, grand and gray. I had promised to meet Wilfred Ewart in New York and return south with him to Santa Fe. He would buy a horse and ride with us, study the Mexican border, and write. I would spend some time there before going on to Mexico. During the last few years, he and I had been something like inseparables, at least in London. I knew, as I waited in the harbor, that he was there somewhere in the great city. I knew also that my friend Vachel Lindsay was there, and it was a special pleasure to think of meeting both friends. The three of us had sat at a table in a café in Regent Street late one night two years before, and the project of Ewart's going to America had been mooted. Lindsay drew a map of the United States upon the table and marked Santa Fe on it, and then drew radii from it. A mud house and a pony are all you want, and you will see America, said the poet. Paradoxically enough, he asserted that America could be studied to better advantage in her deserts than in her cities. I believe that in the ordinary course of life, Ewart and Lindsay could hardly have met for mutual benefit. I was the human link, assuring Ewart of Lindsay's genius, assuring Lindsay of Ewart's promise. The reserved, almost inarticulate young guards officer brought forth in due time his way of revelation and Lindsay hailed it with delight and advised his New Mexican friends that the author of it was coming. The idea of America, and especially of the South, certainly fired Wilfred Ewart's imagination. 
he longed to go to new orleans that city for which in a way he had been bound when later he was so tragically killed the idea of my journey to the spanish main also caused him to crave and share in its adventures i remember our last dinner together in nineteen twenty one it was one night between christmas and new year's wilfred ewart raised his glass solemnly and pronounced a toast to 1922, and may we both stand together on that peak, where in one view Pacific and Atlantic meet. I had been talking to him of Darien, and then of Mount Sempoaltepec in Mexico, whence at one moment you may see both oceans. I smiled, we talked, and in my heart I doubted he would come, but he did. Alas, now for the train of circumstances. He came and he is lost. I was waiting in the harbor, and he was in the city. It is so, perhaps, still. I was answering once more those endless questions. Are you in favor of subverting existing government by force? Only in such a case as that of Colombia in 1902, I reply. That will not be taken as an answer. Am I a polygamist? Ever been deported? The questioning is interrupted by the discovery of an abduction case hours pass. It was nearly eight when I got free. As I walked out of the dock gate in white coat, riding breeches, and knapsack on my shoulders, an impatient cabman cried out, Now the caballeros are coming. But I hastened to a streetcar, and then to 42nd Street and the Hotel Commodore, that temple of the calf, in which my poet had chosen to stay and he knew where Ewart was staying, so we were joined again, the three of us, as we had been in London two years before. Vachel, at that time engrossed by classic art and modern American politics, was an enigma to Ewart. The Americans' enthusiasms were bewildering to the Englishmen, just fresh from our no-enthusiasm-for-anything-that-matters atmosphere of England. One thing, however, both admired and that was Broadway at night, all lit up from the color reflections on the road crowds to the stars in the sky. But they admired it in different ways. Ewart admitted the grandness of America, but never felt its greatness. For New York, he obtained an admiration which had not learned its bounds. He knew it as the greatest piece of human magnificence he had seen. Central Park was his favorite haunt, and many an afternoon he walked there and watched in the evening the fade out in the dusk, and then the lighting, the starring, the flaming, the rising of the brightness, and then, at last, the fast-pouring floods of electric illumination. Life for me in a giddy New York week changed incredibly from the languor of the tropics to the ardor of the north. It was meetings at luncheon, meetings at dinner, theater every night, business letters, telephone messages, and consecutive half-dozens rolling about in overheads and undergrounds and cabs. I knew I should be glad to get away. Halfway through my time, I had to leave the Commodore Hotel, that temple of the calf, as I have called it. It had been requisitioned for the Bankers' Conference. The poet had been installed longer than I had. They could not turn him out. But me, they could I went across to the quieter, old-fashioned Murray Hill to be still near my two friends. It was a great sight at the Hotel Commodore next day when the bankers had arrived from every state in the Union and every banker wearing a crimson silken tag which told the name of his bank and his little town. Thousands of little bankers, scores of big ones, swarmed in and out of the vast hall of the hotel, and they all walked with becoming gravity and aplomb. It was the greatest conference of the century. On the table was the question of Europe's unpaid debts. The bankers felt, and indeed they had been told by their leaders, that upon them depended the solvency of the old world. One afternoon, whilst we paced the stone hall and talked, the orchestra began to play the parade of wooden soldiers, and this set thirty or forty canaries who perch in their gilded cages above the foyer palms, all a-singing. Such a joyous hubbub then ensued in that great hall of golden birds and bankers' tongues and tinkling brass. Somewhere afar, a bank president was orating ponderously. 
but added to that a man with a megaphone upon the mezzanine balustrade described a baseball game in the world series the architecture of the place with its color and lighting effects the frame of our gilded society was superb the human attendants behind marble bars were busy bowed attentive all that man could wish every banker in america seemed to be pulling his weight every facial expression was at par there was a sense of the coffers behind them and the business and power they represented so the afternoon band kept playing its elaborately orchestrated tune child's tune from the chauserie not exactly the parade of the wooden soldiers sometimes grander and yet delightful titillating perhaps the parade of the little golden bankers instead it was well to go to new york if only to refresh one's memory as to where the power all comes from the cranes swing around the great crates from the ships to the docks at puerto rico or it may be at colon or puerto plata or havana or vera cruz american agents take them off they go to the warehouses thence to the shops to the houses the gold that buys them goes to the banks and the banks send it on to new york gold in new york gold in america one may say to new york the gold and above the gold the power some may whisper what of washington washington is new york's stenographer or what of chicago chicago is new york's young brother or san francisco san francisco is the reflection of new york skyscrapers in the pacific with this the poet both agrees and disagrees new york is the crown of the america of this age it is babbitt's work the bankers are the big men now but they have not all the power they think a turn in political history and the bankers influence might be gone lindsay will demonstrate this to me if i will spend a summer harvesting westward from texas to alaska ewart is ready to accept the idea in the deserts of the southwest we shall see more of america than in new york that i doubt but ewart and i will go my wife is at santa fe and awaits us to santa fe then spiritual lodestone of artists and poets to the capital of the new state of new mexico merely a conquered territory until nineteen twelve now capable of being thought the spiritual hope of the united states End of chapter 15Chapter 16 of In Quest of El Dorado by Stephen Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16 America of Today Viewed from New York. We don't know where we are going, but we're on the way, runs a light hearted popular saying. Heaven or hell, which? the evangelists ask in one breath. No national answer will be given to the query. But if someone replies hell, no one will be greatly shocked, whereas if someone replies heaven, his neighbor will turn upon him with a smile and a rude handshake and a I'm with you, so glad that you're on our side. If you say roses spring up in the footsteps of America, Americans will believe you. But if you say curses follow the gringo in his march of destiny the american interest in your opinion will rapidly grow less america's faith in that america is doing right that she has a divinely appointed mission is short of nothing save the faith of the catholic church naturally such a faith is the main vital current of her existence the saying i believe therefore i am may be changed for america into I believe, therefore I do. This faith, however, reacts badly upon critical literature. Many books on America are written for an American public which demands praise. The rest of the world is profoundly affected by what America does and will be even more so by what she will do. For as she plunges forward along her way of destiny, be it blindly or with open eyes, she not only achieves for herself, but makes way and changes the way of other peoples in other nations. Some study in a scientific spirit seems necessary at this hour, 
not one tinged with the spleen of France or the self-conscious spirit of comparison of England, not a pro-Latin study nor a study conceived in parte pris from a socialistic or capitalistic end, but a dead-level dispassionate facing of things as they are and as to honest eyes they tend to be. In England and Scotland, the working-class population far exceeds in number the middle and upper classes. Enfranchised as it is, men and women both, it has the political power to seize the reins of government and take control into its hands. In America, the situation is considerably different. Numerous as is the working class in America, it is outnumbered by the middle class, and the middle class is more comfortable, more self-assured than that class in England. In England, many middle class people are so cramped and pinched economically that they are embittered against the rest of society and are ready to throw in their lot politically with socialists and radicals. In British journalism, there is much talk of the have-nots, but such an expression would mean little in America. The haves are so numerous that other people are not heard. What I mean is, the sense of property is capable of being more widely and more strongly developed even than in Britain. With other nations, one might make even more striking comparison. Russia is a nation of have-nots. Germany is a nation of a few rich and of broad, poverty-stricken masses. Or, to come nearer to the countries now under view, one may say of Mexico that poverty is national there. In America, possession is national. The dollar is, in America, almost a national emblem. There we have a very marked fundamental condition for future development. Britain is in danger because her masses do not obtain a fair share of the prosperity of the country as a whole. America is not in that sort of danger. It may be urged that America has a violent labor element and that she has been harassed by such prolonged strikes as that of the coal operatives, the steel workers, the railway men. It is true that there is a violent element, but that element is foreign and illiterate. The real underdog in America is the foreigner and the colored man. He is not regarded as a fellow citizen, but as a hired mercenary, one in a gang of Chinese, a member of a slave caste. Even if he has his papers as a United States citizen, he finds, like Eugene O'Neill Stoker, the hairy ape, that he does not really belong. Skilled men, craftsmen, artisans, shopmen, what in England we call the respectable working class, have in America no consciousness of inferiority. They have their Ford cars and their Victrolas. They dance, the men wear iron trousers, the women bob their hair. They are affiliated to religious organizations. They are also Masons of some right, probably not Rotarians or Kiwanis, but Red Men, perhaps. In politics, they almost infallibly vote Democratic or Republican. Labor politics make no progress because in the many millions they have only many thousand votes. The American government machine is guaranteed against radical interference for a long time for republicanism is founded on the banks of America and democratism on the industries. Both parties are based solidly on the rights of possession, the rights of property, the rights of capital. American commerce, therefore, enjoys a remarkable sense of security. No draft blows from Russia or elsewhere into the comfortable interior where the game is being played. Production on an ever grander scale is achieved, the wealth of the nation is enhanced, the buying power of every individual is increased, the triumphs of salesmanship are eclipsed, the glory of the great firms is brighter and fuller, their advertisements more extensive. The enormous production is a fact and not to be gainsaid, but in their commerce as a whole there are certain very important artificial elements which show it in part not as a reality, but as a great game. A number of fortunes are made. That, again, is not to be gainsaid, and material luxuries are widely distributed, but the picture of American comfort is not quite so good as it looks. There's a catch somewhere. 
The catch is in the tariff. The tariff makes sure that Americans shall buy American-made goods at the American price. Salesman and buyer are tied together in a three-legged race, and the tariff is the binding matter. For if the tariff were removed, there would be a bad falling apart of producer and consumer. All prices in the United States seem to me higher than world prices. Therefore, if the tariff were removed, cheap foreign goods would naturally rush in. America can make a good article at a good price. It is yet to be proved that, like pre-war Germany, she might make the best article at the lowest price. This not only affects manufactured goods, but food. The tariff plus commercial organization has raised the cost of food to 50% above world price. The mere food budget of the American housewife is nearly double that of her European sister, though the food be of the same quantity. I say not quality because, in my opinion, European food is generally more fresh than American food. Storage is the enemy of good quality. American salesmen outside of the New World fail to obtain the quantity of business which their enormous commercial background would suggest. It may be said, if with pardonable exaggeration, America is not as aggressive in world markets as she is at home. In finance, she has become a world power, but the bulk of her trade is in North and South America. Within America, within the American empire, in Latin America generally, the American salesman has matters more and more his own way. It may well be asked, if he possesses the new world, what need has he of the old? The old world has not, however, necessarily finished with America, and European business only awaits its chance to descend upon American lands. A great economic competition between East and West is not one of the least likely developments of the future. But let Europe find peace once more. Meanwhile, American prosperity increases on a grand scale, and the chief sign of it is increased leisure. The leisure class grows. It far outnumbers the leisure class of England or of any other nation. There are more Americans than English at Monte Carlo, more Americans in Switzerland, in Egypt, on the Norwegian fjords, in Athens, in Rome, in northern Africa. There are many thousands of leisure Americans in London, and at the shrines of England, and ensconced in English country houses, or enjoying the hospitality of country gentry, very greatly more than there are leisure Englishmen or Frenchmen or any other nationality at the shrines or country houses of America. In America, the leisure appear everywhere. The East is larded with leisure. The West runs on it as on oil. Carefree children in tens of thousands get educated, graduate, and have leisure. Something has to be done for the children of leisure to make life more interesting. A life of cars and country clubs will not suffice, especially for the women, who are almost always more ambitious than the men. There is a demand for careers by those who do not necessarily demand pay, a demand for greater interest. The Astors have found admirable scope in British politics. Such success as Lady Astor has attained is doubtless open to a few more. Americans range in surprising numbers behind successful British politicians, delighting in entertaining them when they can. Various very good-looking and capable Americans hold, as it were, advanced posts in English society life. The competition to be presented at court is greater each year, though greater numbers are actually received. The American embassy is broadened out to an extensive social platform crowded with people whose estate and position in American life is such that they can hardly be ignored. The diplomatic service, generally in Europe, is greatly used by the leisured Americans, and there come people with academic missions, advisory people of various kinds, who, for one reason or another, obtain interviews with distinguished men, and then arrange dinner parties and talk, obtain impressions, get inside, have a finger in the pie. 
that same force drives in american politics at home by intrigue and by lobbying trying to find a way of life a larger interest for the leisured the american republic the old united states affords little scope for the new ever-increasing class but america as an empire america with a great army and a great fleet america with a deep foreign policy which kept foreign powers all speculating on her next move america as a world power would give scope most abhorrent to the leisured class is the primitive state most desired is the state in its highest development for a leisured class is not compatible with pure democracy the present commercial system however is producing a leisured class in ever greater numbers does it not therefore follow that the commercial system itself is incompatible with pure democracy but of course it is not the four hundred of new york who are new york but as o henry briefly and brilliantly suggested in his book of stories it is the four million and no upper four thousand or upper forty thousand can be america indeed in many vital matters the forty thousand have been thwarted by the hundred million the forty thousand did not want prohibition and were not eager for the enfranchisement of women the forty thousand at least professed themselves in favor of the versailles treaty and ready to help europe to peace the representative american in europe nearly always treats prohibition as a joke or blames it on the women's vote and as regards our european tangle is all optimism and happy encouragement english celebrities visiting america are usually entertained by one of the forty thousand who make a display of liquor warming the vitals of our said celebrities who come back to england with an idea of a new drunken america you would not think that america was a pious god-fearing country with some millions of people leading sober and righteous lives and yearning for the establishment of the kingdom the moral passion of the american masses is kept out of sight as if it were something pitiful or disgraceful the forty thousand would not care to see america defined as the nation which voted itself dry it would rather define america as the nation which built the panama canal there is in a way a conflict between the claims of moral achievement and material achievement thus again in some minds america is the nation which won the war but in many more minds she is the nation which fed starving europe to many she is the nation of roosevelt but to many more she is the nation of abraham lincoln still today the moral passion of america identifies america and it is a pity that the world outside and even parts of america herself should be deceived by the noisy jazz band exterior by which america seems to choose to signalize herself to the world to what extent america has been cleaned up has never been divulged to the outside world the forty thousand are ashamed of it the others do not travel much and have little means of comparison it is not only that drunkenness has been eliminated but vices of other kinds what an extraordinary moral city compared with paris or london was wilfred ewart's surprised remark to me and he had been walking broadway at midnight without remarking a single filet de joy and in order to make a test of the alleged wetness of america vachel lindsay and i made a tour of the old barrooms of new york the poet was for several years a y m c a worker and he had a round of barrooms visiting them all regularly and distributing literature relating to activities other than the consumption of beer we made a remarkable pilgrimage together. By every reckoning, New York and Chicago are the richest fields for the bootlegger that America holds. If you can prove that these are relatively free of liquor, you can be sure that the rest of America is very free. What did we find? In one old bar, one bartender, four or five loungers with pots, and in the back a solitary foreign woman resting her bare arms on a sodden table, waiting for a customer everyone regarded us suspiciously and nervously another bar has been converted into a restaurant 
There was a lookout man at the door, and he worked a stop-go indicator in the restaurant. When the indicator turned to stop, the customers put their drinks under the table. When it returned to go, they brought it out again. That seemed to us a pretty flagrant case of wetness. But, as Vachel remarked to me, even there all the objectionable aspects of the saloon have been removed. No one objects on moral grounds to people having wine with their meals. It is the filth, the vice, the point of view of the barroom that America fought, and these can never come back. Five or six large saloons have been converted into shops. Sometimes one saloon into three shops, leased for considerable spaces of time and quite lost to drinking. Those bars which remain, shut or selling root beer, seem to be holding on to valuable sites in the hope that, after all, there might be a reversal of the prohibition law. But, as Lindsay pointed out, prohibition is now part of the Constitution. It was adopted by many states prior to 1917. It has been enacted separately by all the states as well as by the federal government, and to go back on it would have to be voted out by a majority of the states of the Union once more, which is unthinkable. Wilfred Ewart made many jests at the expense of the Statue of Liberty. All newcome Englishmen do. How can it be a sweet land of liberty when one's liberty to have a drink is taken away is a favorite query. The true answer to that question is that America, like England, is governed by majority opinions. The majority of American citizens wanted the abolition of the saloon, and they got it. As regards the advantage of it, I saw New York in 1913 and can compare its huge gin palaces of that time, the swarms of unfortunate girls going in and out, the police exploitation of them, the night court for women on 6th Avenue, with cleaned up New York in 1922, the advantage seems inestimable. As regards the reality of prohibition, I will say this. Even near the Mexican border, after a 40-mile ride in the snow, when one would give a good deal for a stiff drink, not a rancher, but was a teetotaler. The little cities of America are now totally devoid of public vice. The prisons of Kansas are empty. In the large cities, the police are notably impoverished. It is no use the foreign tourist going to the police and saying, show me the vice of your city. There is nothing to show. Go around to the ice cream parlors. Yonder, in a small den, loving couples are eating hot tamales. On a corner, a youth is surreptitiously lighting a cigarette. The nation is on a high level of morality, and this is reflected in the physique of its children. With all this, I ought perhaps to make a warning. There is almost no religion. Moral fervor stands instead of religion. The note of wonder, of awe, of divine praise is almost entirely absent. The upper 40,000, as I have said, take little heed of this. They believe that they control the springs of action and can make the hundred million do what they want them to do. The party system in politics, with no other choice but that of Republican or Democrat, seems to facilitate their influence. Cleaning up is a passion of the hundred million. Very well. It can be harnessed to the designs of the 40,000. Let them clean up Cuba, clean up the Central American republics, clean up Mexico. One thing the hundred million will not tolerate in their midst, and that is a foreign point of view in morals. The Dago will do things no white man will stand. So also will the Hun and the Hunky, the Slav, the Greaser, the Nigger. An associating of foreigners with unnatural vice is all too common. The fair-skinned Anglo-Saxon, despite all admixtures, remains the dominant type. He rejects the melting pot. He alone is the 100% American and will not be adulterated. He is opposed to color, to all dark skins, be they Italian or Ethiopian, and he is opposed to European religions which seem to permit low morals. Out of this has arisen on the one hand the spirit of Hearst's newspapers, 
on the other the new development of the ku klux klan it is this movement largely which has shut the door to further immigration from europe the idea was obtained during the war that american ideals and standards had become endangered by too great influx of foreigners into america the germans the russians the irish all forgot that they were americans first all the hyphenates waved their flags of origin this naturally caused the lurid limelight of the press to be turned upon the foreign elements in the midst and it was seen how differently the foreigners lived and how much lower were their moral standards even while america seemed to be fighting for europe her opinion of europeans never high was suffering a severe depression it is a national fact today that america trusts no foreigners provincialism is widely spread people are not only ill-informed regarding foreign countries but credulous and the press reflects their state of mind a country like Russia might almost be in the moon to judge by current opinions concerning her. Doubtless it would be absurd to go to America to obtain information about Europe. On the other hand, education goes further in America than in any other country. You often hear exaggerated statements of what the Russian Bolsheviks are doing for the education of the Russian masses. They have voted and assigned and planned and they have no teachers. But America has teachers and schools the best equipped in the world. She is ready to spend money. She has faith in education. She has the will to get it. The high schools of America are very remarkable, both in the number of them and in their size. Americans who have not traveled in the old home countries of Europe can hardly measure what magnificent institutions they have in their public schools and what an advantage the average American child holds over the average child of any other nation. Again, the number of colleges and universities is phenomenal. It reflects no doubt the wealth of America and also the turning of the back upon America's raw, primitive, uncouth past. England, by virtue of her history, is too phlegmatic to do much for the higher education of the masses. I sent ye to school, and ye wouldna learn, I bought ye books, and ye wouldna read, is the traditional attitude of the Englishman. Too much of school makes Jack a dull boy, says he, and takes his boy away. In this, I believe the Englishman is largely wrong. The dull, ignorant part of our population is far larger than it ought to be and constitutes a national danger. How far education in America is ahead of education in England may be judged by the size of the reading public. Lytton Strachey's Queen Victoria has five readers in America for every one in England. A similar ratio existed for Maynard Keynes' Economic Consequences of the Peace Treaty and for Wells' Outline of History. There is, therefore, an educated class far in excess of the upper 40,000. There may be a whole million of well-read people, and the number progresses with the children who swarm through the new big schools and universities. Where is it all going? Is it drifting southward, as I am, to Mexico, to empire? Will it stay where it is and wax more illustrious? Tell me where you have come from, and I will tell you where you are going, saith the cynic. An evil crow, an evil egg. America as a nation was born in the throes of the war of North and South, or it rose out of Washingtonian independence and Jeffersonian idealism or it arose from the puritanism of the pilgrim fathers or from the adventure spirit of the gentlemen of virginia from such origins one could chart some kind of destiny but not with surety one must go further back to the spirit of elizabethan sailors to drake and a thousand others latin america derives from the conquistadores of spain but anglo-saxon america derives as surely from the English conquerors. America was imperial before she was democratic, and English before she was American. But then again the English, or at least the Saxons, were a sturdy, independent race, intolerant of bondage, urgent for their civil rights, always proud of freedom. 
If there is one thing that is with difficulty soluble in Anglo-Saxondom, it is character. It is by virtue of character that England has been a ruler of peoples, and possibly, again, it is character as much as business and excessive wealth and a leisured class that will lead America along her road of destiny. It is still in the air as to which road that will be, the way of Roosevelt or the way of Lincoln. End of chapter 16「Seventeen of In Quest of El Dorado by Stephen Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17. Across America, North to South. Ewart was much surprised by the politeness of Chicago. If he made a mistake in New York, such as to bring his lighted cigarette into a car of the overhead railway, he met with such rebukes as put that cigarette out, put it out. But as the porter puts our bags into the cab at Chicago, he cries out to us, good luck, boys, and gave us a cheery salute. Perhaps we overtipped him. And when we got to Santa Fe, a salesman in the shop selling Ewart a shirt called him brother. This pattern, brother, is what you want. I explained to my friend that the lower orders in New York were Lithuanians and the like, who had only just learned enough English to be impolite in it. He must not judge the manners of America by them. We spent a Chicago morning in Marshall Fields and the fair, trying to buy a pair of canvas shoes with rubber soles and brown leather facings, something Ewart had seen on the boat and fancied. The foreman of the floor walkers of the huge department store examined his chart, saw at a glance which salesmen were occupied and which were waiting, and assigned us to one who was straightaway called. That young man proceeded to try to sell to us not what Ewart wanted, but what he had got, brought out box after box of shoes, and even persuaded him to try on a pair of shoes of an entirely different style. But what I mean is a sort of tennis shoe with a leather toe caps. You know what I mean, said Ewart. You want Oxford's, decided the salesman, and passed him on to another department. Thence we were transferred to a subdivision of the athletic department, and then got back to shoes. Here another salesman proceeded to show us all that we had seen before, assuring us, however, that he had just what we wanted. After that, we spent an hour in that crowded, chaotic emporium called the fair, where the procedure was different. A very busy, preoccupied salesman, tending six or seven anxious bargain-hunting Chicagoans, assured us he had just the thing, got Ewart with his boots off, gave him a pair of white tennis shoes just to get his size, and left him stranded for a full quarter of an hour. Whilst, as it seemed all Chicago swirled past, gossiping, buying, clamoring, jostling, and in the midst of this great shop, crowds of children went up and down a moving staircase for fun. I believe that both in Marshall Fields and the fair, shoes of the kind wanted were in stock, but the salesman's habit was to show just what he was put in charge of. He had become incapable of the mental process of imagining what a customer might describe as his need. In England, a shopkeeper has to pay much more attention to individual wants. If he has not got a certain thing, he will get it. Americans buy much more from what is spread before them than by choice and need. However, without the shoes, we left the fair for the less crowded streets and had lunch in a restaurant on Dearborn. My friend had ordered roast beef. The thing to have here is a hot dog, said I. No, really? I say, I think I'll change that order. Have you, er, have you a hot dog? Sure, replied the waitress with alacrity, and she brought him back two large sausages, crisp and burst at one end. Some dogs, I'll say, smiled the girl as she put them before him. He did not put them away coldly from him. He ate his dogs and was amused. He was getting what they call an angle on America. Not bad eats, he said with a twinkle. I'll remember that. In Chicago, I ate dog. One can hardly see Chicago in two or three days. It is a more important place for studying America than is New York. 
for it is more characteristic. The lights of the capitals of Europe all shine in New York. It is a city of a hundred goodbyes, but in Chicago one light burns, and that is the light of America. It is the city of a hundred good mornings. But Chicago so much depends on your knowing what it was. The visitor who sees it for the first time is still likely to pass an adverse judgment upon it, especially if he wanders in its streets at random. There is dirt and a humanity that looks like dirt. There is appalling carelessness and lack of joy in life, rust and refuse uncounted. But that is not all. Chicago is a city rising to strong self-consciousness, a city getting under control and improving steadily. It is no longer the city which Steed saw when he wrote, If Christ came to Chicago, nor is it the city described in Upton Sinclair's Jungle. It is many streets better. It has gone several blocks west. In Chicago, people now talk of the city beautiful. Chicago has been the anvil of fortune, and that merely the smithy, the works, the place to which men went to make money, to lift themselves from a life of rough primitive toil to a life of clean clothes and ease. There they employed whom they could to help them, and incidentally helped their helpers often. It is true they exploited the foreign immigrant, and that they did not help him much, because he was largely helpless. And they attracted great numbers of Negroes, and exploited them, and did not help them much. They left the immigrant and the colored man to live round about their factories amid waste ends of material, and when that labor itself wore out, it lay around also as waste ends, waste ends of humanity. Hence, the vast aggregation of dirt and poverty in the city. But the point of view has changed. The people of business are so rich that America has become intolerant of poverty. Like the Prince of Monaco, she is determined to abolish the poor. She will not admit new poor into her country, and those she has, she is raising out of the slough. Everything and everyone is being cleaned up. Chicago is to become all middle class, and during the ten years since I first saw it, it has made enormous strides in that direction. Michigan Avenue and the Magnolia Walk, the long park-like waterfront, were very gratifying to our eyes after the clamor and bang of State Street and Dearborn, where there are still many at the anvil of fortune. In a hundred years, I hazarded, the whole city may have become a park. Kansas City, at which we stopped next, is, of course, far less problematical in aspect than Chicago. It is smaller. It grew up in a more prosperous era. It took advantage of all the new fixtures and technical appliances of a later stage. It is, therefore, cleaner and not so much littered with discarded material. The stockyards and tanning factories, however, charge the air heavily upon occasion with an odor which should surely be intolerable. No one could live for pleasure in a city of infected air. It must, therefore, be a city of business, money-making, and that only for most people. Yet it is a fine city on the high bank of the Kansas River overlooking rich farmland. It is the fringe of the West, and cowboys with their broad hats and sunburnt faces are not infrequent on its crowded streets. There is an air of expectancy, as if the gates of industrialism and bondage stood open, and the American nation was free to pour out onto the prairies and the wild places of the Rockies. It much astonished Ewart that while passing through the state of Kansas and Iowa, we could not buy cigarettes. There, no one smoked, and it appeared no one wanted to. Cigarette smoking was regarded as a vice and a shame. Betting has also been abolished, and so has immorality, observed a Kansan with a smile. Free speech also, said I. And I had him there, for America was then still excited by the arrest of William Allen White at Emporia, Kansas, for saying he was partly in favor of a railroad strike. Intolerance cuts into vice, but sometimes takes a slice of virtue, too, even in Kansas. I believe, however, that the Kansan is nearest to being an average normal American. He is the representative American. South of Kansas, the people are mostly Southerners. West of it, they are certainly Western. 
North of it and east of it, they are certainly Middle West, but Kansas itself is a New England seed in Middle Western soil. You are the people who have taken away our wine, say the Easterners reproachfully. The Kansans smile. We are the people, they say, and are not at all ashamed. You were denied traveled across Kansas and its many farms, and the vague thought of Quivera crossed my mind. This was the country in which Coronado and his followers in 1541 gave up their quest for gold, being brought to Wichita by an Indian who wished to lead them to their doom. In this country, the Indian said, lay the kingdom of Quivira, where the king and his princes wore golden armor, and he brought them to a camp of nomads near the great bend of the Arkansas River, and there was not there but the invisible possibility of what is now Kansas. The enraged Spaniards, therefore, strangled the Indian and turned their faces southward once more toward Cibola and the deserts in New Spain. But golden Quivira is golden today, golden with corn, and Kansas is the richest state in the Union, a state literally without poor, a state of empty prisons without doss houses, without outdoor relief. Kansas of today wears golden armor against fate and has proved the Indian to be right. Ho for Kansas, land that restored us, as Lindsay cried. And then farewell. The train on its iron tracks rolls onward, following its predecessor, followed inevitably by its successor, sootily, dustily, heavily, to the steeps of Colorado, out of the green country, up to the gray and bare, up to the hills and broken cliffs, to the pasture lands and the cowboys. The pipe smokers of Colorado fill the black leather section of the ordinary cars, the smoking section. In come horse-faced men who have lived with horses so much that their features have caught a reflection of horses' features, men with sun-dried complexions and bodies, not so witty as the people of the East, more humorous, though, and full of a new kind of talk. All the linen collars have gone, and with them the comparative stiffness of business life. Not that there are not collars on the train, God forbid. There are Pullman cars lagging on to us somewhere, and respectability sitting perched on plush as everywhere else. But in the smoking section of the ordinary car is the real life of the country. Ewart would have liked to dismount at Trinidad, Colorado, and at Dodge City, but our tickets were nearly out of date. So we let ourselves be hoisted on to the New Mexican plateau with its wide stretches of sand dotted with dwarf pines, with its dried-up river channels, its mudheads of mountains and strange bluffs, its Mexicans and Indians. Next day, we were at Santa Fe. End of chapter 17「Chapter eighteen of In Quest of El Dorado by Stephen Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter eighteen The Dance of the Jemez Indians. One of the poets at Santa Fe had decided to return east and finish a university course which he had broken by a year of freedom and poetry in New Mexico. So Wilfred Ewart bought his horse, an Indian pony white, small-footed, and wiry, and named, as it were, facetiously, George. He proved too short for a man of six feet two, but except at starting, when he sometimes refused to budge for five minutes, he went as well as the other two horses, Billy and Buck. He proved to be branded with the mark of the Santo Domingo Indians, and there were many horses of his size and gait in their pueblo. Every time we met any of the Indians, however, they would ask suspiciously, Where did you get that horse? George gave us some amusement, for he jumped sideways with all four feet at once when the car passed him, and though slow by habit, he would upon occasion jump to an impulse that he was in a race with my impetuous Billy. The mile home from the post office, we would sometimes find ourselves in a wild gallop, chased for moments by starved dogs who drove Billy to additional excitement. We had a pleasant autumn at Santa Fe, pierced though it was by shafts of winter cold. The sun heat was great, but there was frost every night. Ewart had brought literary work, and he sat with his papers in a profuse sunbath. 
he became deeply sunburned and the skin peeled from the back of his writing hand but it was good for him arriving in indifferent health it was remarkable how he had improved it was unfortunate that winter came so rapidly though so far south we began to have weather much colder than that of new york and the snow from the mountain summits crept lower snow swept down from the heights driven by the wind on to our valleys there were several october days when the whole desert was clad in unnatural white then the sun came out and like magic uncovered the desert again and the thirsty sand drank up what dissolved and soon all was as before in a pleasant interlude between snowstorms in early november we set off for the Jemez dance, the annual trading fair and fiesta of November 12th. My wife and I were on Buckskin and Billy. As we took no pack horse along with us, we had all our impedimenta strapped onto our saddles. We had been told we should find no water or provisions on the way, and so we carried more than we needed to have done. Ewart had four pounds of ham tied to the pommel of his saddle, as well as a waterproof and toilet case, and his saddle pockets behind him were stuffed. I carried bags before and behind, and Buck also was much encumbered, though his rider was so much lighter. Buck made a bad start by falling into the Asaquia Madre, the irrigation ditch, with four feet in front of a wretched rustic bridge and hind legs hanging in the air. In this posture, I had to undo his girths and liberate him from his packs ere we could get him on to his feet. He started, therefore, in a melancholy and cautious mood, and we walked him a good deal of the way. Indeed, in the evening, convinced that he was suffering from sprain, I persuaded Mrs. Graham to ride Billy whilst I led Buck by the reins. In this way, we reached La Cienega and put up at a Mexican farm where we were happily regaled, although we had to go to bed at eight o'clock and all slept in the same room. Next morning, Buckskin showed that he had no sprain. I had led the horses to water and had returned to set our coffee pot on the Mexican's kitchen fire, and I had left them barely ten minutes when the farmer's wife came in and said two of the horses had got out of the enclosure. They were Billy and Buck. Lightly clad as I was, I threw my saddle on George and bridled him and went off at once, for I knew that the two miscreants would make for home at a good pace. George proved his worth that morning. Chasing other horses was what he was made for. He went like the wind after these horses. In a mile we got them in a view. They were trotting steadily together. In a mile and a half they stopped and turned to consider us, and Buck stopped the hesitation by breaking into a hearty canter joined by Billy. But we overhauled them, and George, without any guidance from me, turned them both. If only I had been a cowboy and could have hauled the rope which I held in my hand. Alas, I missed the chance, and all three horses settled down for a cross-country gallop. I reflected that we should thus gallop up the main street of Santa Fe and up the canyon road and unto a familiar yard at noon. It was a perplexing thought. I slowed down George, therefore, and noticed that Billy and Buck did the same. I hastened again, and they hastened slowed they slowed but at five miles from la cienega my second opportunity came and i took it a deep arroyo was spanned by a bridge it could be reached across country without my appearing to pursue the horses at the bridge i dismounted and idled and appeared to be interested in the view whilst the two runaways approach both suddenly stopped and stared billy raised his head very high and kicked out friskily with his hind legs Buck made a wily detour, but I showed not the least interest, so they began to graze here and there where a tuft of grass appeared. I thereupon made a cup of my hand as if it held corn, and approached Billy, calling him, keeping the hand out of view of the inquisitive, greedy, but very crafty buckskin. Billy, however, intoxicated by freedom and the morning air, cut a wild cantrip and fled. But Buck really thought I had corn, and when I approached him, I got near enough to put a rope over his neck. Secured and tied to the bridge, he looked a repentant horse. It took another ten minutes to capture Billy, then I changed the saddle on his back and started all three back to Cienega at a smart trot. Then, of course, 
I could reflect how pleasant an adventure it was, the best two hours of the day. It was a pity, however, that the horses should lose their freshness before the real riding of the morning commenced. We all set off at once for Peña Blanca on the Rio Grande. We had hoped to ford the river that day, but now hope of that was gone. Yet it was a very pleasant day's riding, following over sand and boulders, and running water the scores of zigzags of streams which threatened a profound ravine. All was gray. Tumultuous piles of rock stared down at us as we clattered along. The horses lapped at the water and made deep hoof marks in the wet sand. There were no birds, no flowers, no evergreens, no life but that of ourselves and the sunlight on the gray pebbles. Even the fire which we made of water-washed wood burned with invisible flames, and the steam did not show till the water raised the lid of our coffee pot and boiled over. We sat together in the early afternoon, quaffed coffee, and ate down our weight of provisions. We had even got hay for our horses at a farmhouse, and we eased their girths and fed them a little and watered them ere we resumed our way. We reached Peña Blanca at night, led o'er the moor by flickering lights. We nearly went to the Indian village of Cochiti, as its lights on the other side of the Rio Grande beckoned much more certainly. But after traversing a mile of deep sand, we turned our horses and made for other lights, which we judged, rightly, must indicate the settlement of the Mexicans. Piña Blanca is a squatter's village, extensive and substantial, though none of the settlers there have adequate legal title to the land they hold as theirs. Their forefathers came there to obtain the protection of the Cochiti Indians from the raiding Navajos, and they stopped there and took to themselves a large fertile slice of the lands of the Indians. It was not too easy to obtain shelter for the night, but Ewart was taken in at a house where there was to be a wedding next day, and nobody there except he slept a wink all night long. He had hot coffee and a substantial breakfast before dawn. We were not so lucky, but we had a mattress and a floor in a room of an empty house. The horses fared best of all, being put into a cozy corral with heaps of alfalfa and corn and a grand disarray of corn husks. Next morning... We had them saddled at dawn and rode to the fording of the river as sunrise was breaking over the mountains. That day was a glorious one. First through the brown-leaved woods of the river shore, then up over sandbanks and crags, through copes and boscage, ever higher to wild rocky country and vast wastes where no man lived and no cattle of any kind found pasture. The morning sun was overswept by snow clouds, the winds hurried over mountainsides in white capes of flurrying snow. Snow blew lustily in our faces and over our horses. We rode into fast dropping curtains of thick snow and rode through them and out of them into radiant sunlight again. There joined us on the way many Indians clad in cotton shirts and breeches and with old scarlet and orange blankets swathed about their shoulders like capes. Their polished ebony hair hung in long, rough-tied plates from their highly turbaned heads. I say turbaned, but the turban was no more than a gaily-colored kerchief tied like a bandage around their temples. How, how, they cried in little yelps as they drew abreast of us. Hello, we replied. Going to Jemez dance? Si, si, they answered. You going? Few spoke any English, but they were delighted to have us of their company, and we went with various parties for many miles. Once there were more than twelve of us all cantering together over the vague trail, and it was a pretty sight. Poco frío, a little cold, was a favorite remark of ours. Si, sí, mucho frío, they replied. Not a little, but very cold. They stopped and lit five-minute bonfires of dried weeds just to warm their hands and bodies. Round these blazes, they fairly danced. In the twilight of the late afternoon among the snow patches, these bonfire dances were most eerie in appearance. The Indians were so cold, they made their horses go faster and faster to keep warm. But as ours were more heavily burdened, we kept a more moderate pace and let the Indians go ahead. We made a big pot of coffee in the afternoon, and that kept warm our toes, otherwise chilled in the stirrups. 
The Indians, on in front, had been eating melons and throwing down chunks of rind. In this rind and mouthfuls of snow, Billy and Buck took enormous pleasure, simply guzzling over them. George, however, seemed to have a toothache and turned his head away. One of the Indians helped us greatly when we rode on. He was from San Felipe and named Lorenzo. He turned out of the party he belonged to and watched us, lest we should go astray. Possibly he saved us from a night wandering in the mountains, for when we had taken a wrong trail and gone some way upon it, our attention was arrested by long, persistent cries which we felt had references to us. And looking about, we saw the silhouette of Lorenzo on the top of a little mountain and saw that he was signaling us to come toward him. This we did, and we found we had been going on a dangerous, precipitous trail, which in truth led no whither except to goat pastures and hideous abysses. Lorenzo went with us the rest of the way, and we descended into the Jemez Valley by a track that none but Mexican ponies could follow, down narrow gullies, along broken ledges, down sharp slides and drops. The whole countryside dropped in tumultuous crags and steeps, shale slopes, cliffs, precipices, to the Jemez River. The last light of evening gleamed on us, and we left our fate to Lorenzo and the horses to do with it what they would, an adventurous and, as it seemed, a perilous ride. At nightfall, as the village church was ringing for vespers, we rode into the crowded pueblo and were four out of many who had come to the great dance and fiesta. The Jemez dance used to be one of the finest and most elaborate of the Indian dances, and the tribe, living more remotely, had kept itself more fresh and vivid and unspoiled than, for instance, the Tezuka Indians, the pets of artists, who dance on the same day. But the growth of the great city of Albuquerque and the development of the high road to Jemez Springs have attracted the gaze of the white man in all its vulgar curiosity and ignorance. I do not speak of artists and poets, who are as reverent at a dance as the most pious at mass, but of those who think of life as a colored supplement to a Sunday paper, a chaplainade, a burlesque, something over which to be facetious. There's a bunch of dudes coming over from a dude branch, said a cowboy, referring to a touring party from a fashionable resort. A speculator come here last week from Albuquerque and booked up every spare room in the Pueblo, said another. But the road's nigh blocked with snow. Guess we shan't see any Albuquerque folk this year. Too much scare to be in stranded. Once a party got snowed up here for a week. There's a man here I'd like to insult, said Ewart with a laugh. He is Babbitt himself. I'd like to go up to him and say, Mr. Babbitt, I believe, with a courtly bow. Babbitt was certainly there with his wife and Kodak and furs and waiting automobile, but he was not duplicated. He stood out in relief against all the rest, for all the lesser Babbitts had been scared by the snow. November 12th, the Spanish festival of St. Diago, festival of the war cry by which the country was conquered, St. Diago Saeos, up and at them, St. James, was the great day at Jemez. It was a bleak Sunday morning, and the stark, jagged hills, pedestals of rock, standing places which encompassed the dark village, were lit by radii of a flashing sunrise. Silhouetted up there stood solitary Indians, watching religiously, and they remained till night had fled, and the living sanguine of the mountains was revealed. Down below, in the streets of the Pueblo, you would think there were a hundred wild horses, for the visiting Indians, unable to find stabling, had turned their horses loose, and they ran about like dogs, hunting for provender, whinnying to one another, biting one another, kicking, scampering from yard to yard. Our three horses were set upon by droves, which I sought to keep off whilst they ate. Usually in the morning, the Jemez Indians dance a horse dance, very fitting in such a place of horses. One Indian is made up as a horse, and he is accompanied by a drummer with a soot-colored face and a naked mirth-maker. And these parade the mud-built town. But this year, that dance was omitted. Instead, the traders and the Navajos chaffered over the price of blankets. 
snowflakes fell indolently on to the gray streets on to the horse's back on to the many hogs on to the quaint mud domes of the bread ovens the estufas in front of the houses but it settled most of all on the gorgeous hand-woven blankets of the navajos every year hundreds of navajos ride in from their country which lies between the jemez river and the grand canyon and bring a year's product in woven blankets and there come to meet them here many indians from santo domingo for the domingo indians mine turquoise and are clever craftsmen in silver the navajos want silver and turquoise ornaments the domingos want blankets so a great barter takes place besides these the white trader comes and buys in dozens and makes many profitable deals don't tell anybody said mrs babbitt i bought these parrot feathers don't you think i might get a bracelet with them and she did meanwhile from a squatter's village came a meager crowd of mexicans in black and filled the seats of the little indian church and gave to the fiesta the appearance of a christian festival a priest also appeared and a roman mass was sung a group of mexican youths with guns waited to fire a volley in the air at the elevation of the host but they were discouraged and took to random firing instead i think we'd better give these fellows a wide berth said ewart as he watched the way they were fooling with their rifles they were neither pious nor careful for they continued taking shots at sparrows and crows while the figures of St. Iago and the emblems of the church were carried past them in procession. Curiously irrelevant seemed the diminutive black-dressed procession following a white surpliced priest, a man with a lantern, a man with a cross, and two men with figures of the saint, a Mexican carrying a modern machine-made St. James, and an Indian carrying the original Indian-made image of wood. The Navajos, all between six and seven feet tall, swathed from head to ankles in voluminous bright-colored blankets looked exceedingly morosely at the spectacle only their dark cavernous eyes staring from faces which they covered even to their noses with the flaps of their blankets the wind blew the dust rose and the snow came slanting down and the black-robed mexicans turned their faces away as they trudged the cross and the flickering lantern wavered in the air as they went there met them accidentally the heralds of the dance the ugliest and squattest of the jemez indians their faces blackened out with soot and bearing in their hands tiny homemade drums which they beat with a will the tom-tom was beaten by two of them and a third with widely dilated eyes and old strained carved out face and flying hair sang in a pagan voice hoy hoy ho ho ha 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 the church went one way they went another without a salute as if one were invisible to the other at noon the presbyterian missionary made his annual visit and with the agent and the district nurse and the aid of a harmonium struck up rock of ages cleft for me the indians had marched out in their beauty no ugliness now no devil frightening but a serene picture of physical loveliness the koshare spirits of ancestors mirth-makers leaders of the dance had been prohibited this year their nakedness having been considered unseemly by the white onlookers but the youth of the village were nearly naked and nothing short of glory to their creator the dance was like a wind in the corn or fast-travelling shadows on the hills it was like the dimpling of the waves where many waters meet together it was like the arching of the necks the waving of the manes of many horses on the prairie it was like the trembling of morning light upon the mountains and the sea the snowflakes emulated it but did not succeed and all who watched seemed turned to stone to perfect immobility by the perfection of the movement that they saw the hundreds of tall navajos were like statues and those on the roofs looking down on the wide brown sandy open place of the dance there were many on the roofs looked like figures that had survived centuries and looked on unmoved hundreds of times hundreds of years they were completely and sharply silhouetted against the mountains and the sky the jemez men were painted a dark yellow and wore white moccasins threaded with silver bells in their hands they carried gourds with peas in them which they rattled 
Twixt their bare arms and an armlet, they carried slips of green pine. They were crowned with leaves and feathers. They had turquoise necklaces on their smooth round necks, and their long, coal-black hair hung on their backs to the mount of their hips. The barefooted women wore green tablitas, like crowns on their heads, and colored fajas about their waists. They had bracelets and rings. They held green branches in their hands. Their dance was a tremble, a departure from calm. The men's dance between them, a prolonged ecstasy, a descending out of eternal movement into calm. They surged up the village street, ever forward, ever more of them, more strung out, more beautiful, accompanying at the side were dramatic groups in everyday attire, chanting, exhorting the unseen powers, roaring together fantastic choruses of semi-musical gibberish. And the drums beat inexorably, as if they were the voice of the gods, the control whom no one at any time had ever disobeyed. You are changed to stone, yes, to stone of the Stone Age. Babbitt has gone. There is only this that you see, and no, for somewhere a church bell has been set a ringing, and a harmonium is playing a hymn. Yes, there it is, in much rebellion and compliant, nearer my God to thee. Mr. Babbitt nonchalantly strides in among the dancers and distributes cigarettes, which the dancers, being nearly naked, cannot put away. He will not be denied. He photographs the scene. He has a knowing look. The Indian governor is angered, but what can he do? There is nothing the white man understands except force, neither manners nor reason nor what is sacred. So the will of the white man will prevail. The beautiful dancing will cease. I give it ten years, said the forestry agent of the government. By that time they will all be citizens. It will be a Presbyterian village. Just like a village in the highlands of Scotland, I hazarded. The agent smiled, for he was a highlander by extraction. The Scot, though sentimental at home about the snowflake that softly reposes on his native hills, about the heather, the kilt, the bagpipe, and the rest, is often the most unsentimental and prosaic fellow when in the presence of another nation's romance. However, the Presbyterians have it not all their own way in Jemez. The Catholics claim it as their ground, sanctified by the blood of Franciscan martyrs. They are educating the children and making them, therefore, extremely naughty and ill-behaved during the dance for they are taught to despise paganism. The pranks played by the children on their dancing fathers and mothers I should prefer not to mention in describing the beautiful dance. Yet they were there and were signs of the times. The night after the dance there was a fight between the Navajos and the Apaches, two or three score of the latter having ridden in and begun strutting through the Pueblo with their orange-colored scarves and big feathers in their dark sombreros. They and the Navajos were the fiercest of the Indians and used to ravage the whole country, even down as far as Chihuahua and Old Mexico. And they are still warlike people, ready to start strife on a slight pretext. The Navajos are especially untamable. The horses also, this night, got into trouble, their exasperation and hunger seeming to possess them. Juan Luis Pecos, the Indian who had charge of our three steeds, did the best he could, but that was not much. George and Buck were tied to a post. Billy had been put in hobbles and turned loose. But the Indian horses constantly invaded the yard of the house where we were staying, and the unhobbled ones drove Billy away from his feed. Juan, having taken part in the dance, was very late in bringing the alfalfa, and when he brought it, it proved to be of a very thorny nature, reaped with abundant weeds from Indian fields. Just after nine at night, we had an exciting half hour. Billy, having been dispossessed, vented his rage on George, whom in any case he regarded as an interloper, and drove him round and round the post to which he was tied until the rope was wound tight. The little white pony looked as if he were going to strangle himself, and he was in a violent excitement, kicking out with his hind legs and straining with all his neck muscles. Buck, tied near him, craftily avoided all entanglements, but Billy, hobbled as he was, could not be restrained. 
You were at untied buck, and he scampered off, and I cut George's rope, sawing it for several seconds, for it was a very stout, fine line of an unbreakable kind. George, meanwhile, let out at all and sundry, and when cut loose, dashed away with Billy after him. Mrs. Graham happily recaptured buckskin at the drinking trough. Fortunately, he had not grasped the geography of the large ramshackle yard, else he would no doubt forthwith have set off for home. Ewart and I chased the other two horses to the accompaniment of the clangor of Billy's chain hobbles. They got into the main street of the Pueblo, and Billy made such a pace, even hobbled, that we could not overtake them. He leapt like a hobby horse, he trotted in short rapid steps, and he certainly made the white pony go. George, however, doubled on us, and Billy doubled across our tracks also. We cried to Apaches and Navajos to aid us, but they looked on gloomily from their blankets. Dogs rushed about and barked and gave chase, and we, with electric torches in our hands, strove to see the horses we were after. Billy was audible by the sound of his hobbles, but suddenly, to my horror, I saw his big shadowy body leap in air and heard a sickening thud. He seemed to have gone neck over crop. I could not surmise what had happened to him. There was, however, a chance to run down George in a corner of a waste field, and I ran to assist Ewart. George was recaptured. Then, with torches, we sought the form of Billy. He made not a sound now, and might be dead. I found him at last, lying stretched out as if he had breathed his last. But he was far from dead. Seeing me, he made a great effort to get up, but fell back helpless. Then I saw what had happened. He had cut the shoe of one of his hind legs in the chain which held his two forelegs, and a link was firmly embedded between the iron and the hoof. I felt much relieved, petted in, and then with a the big stone in one hand and the electric light in his hind leg in the other, I started the awkward job of knocking the bit of chain out of his hoof. Ewart held George and shed his light also on the scene. Indians came and peered at us out of the darkness, and the hubbub of dog barking continued all over the village. Billy was freed without further accident, and the three horses were tied up in separate places, and in a repentant mood they stood and watched till morning. They looked very miserable at dawn, for they had had no corn, and the other horses had stolen their hay, and they had had a series of frights in the night. I went with an old Indian on to the top of his roof, and we filled a sack with ripe corn on the cobs, some yellow, some scarlet, some almost blue, and we fed the horses personally, each of us his own, and that was a great comfort. Then we settled up and rode on to the trading post of San Ysidro. Here an enormous trade was being done by white traders buying up all manner of Indian wares and selling store goods in exchange. We took refuge in Miller's trading store and put our horses in charge of Velvet Joe, who led them to happy quarters. Buck rolled on his back for a long time and then sat on the soft ground and looked around him like a contented dromedary. Velvet Joe came and told us the horse was ill, but he did not understand the joy of the escape from that exasperating Pueblo with its wild horses. Billy and George, having contemplated buckskin for a while, followed his example and took a good roll also. The next day we rode on to Zia on sand dunes over the Jemez River in a fullness of sunshine. In the evening we made the Pueblo of Santa Ana and slept in an Indian house all on the floor of a mud-built room. An ex-governor was our host, a very gentle and indeed beautiful Indian. At dawn the day following we climbed the dark table mountain, having to lead our horses and coax them to mount the steep slopes of volcanic scoriae and boulders. Looking backward, we saw Santa Ana removed to obscurity and littleness far away on the yellow evenness of the river shore. We, with our horses, were exalted on black and dreadful cliffs. Cold winds sprang at us from the ravines. Persistent winds blew against us and athwart us. We achieved, nevertheless, the summit, and the summit was a new country, a wide, grassy plateau miles across, but without view except cloud and sky. Perhaps we were lucky. 
but we rode on to the faint sheep trail to san felipe and came at last after an hour or two of riding to a plunging rocky stairway leading downward a nosedive down to the rio grande river and there like a moorish city lay the beautiful yellow pueblo of san felipe the horses did not object to the steep descent all three in single file we descended slowly and processionally down to the village of our friend lorenzo and the first indian we met there was he lorenzo took us where we could get food and happily put us on the way to santo domingo which at nightfall we reached we still rode to the mexican stores and in two or three miles nearer santa fe and there feeling pretty tired we did justice to a hot summer of ham and eggs and coffee and potatoes and other good things the next day was the last day of our ride and we experienced a violent snowstorm climbing labahata hill in an up flutter of snowflakes and finding the moor above it deep in snow a pitiless east wind drove a blizzard against us caking our right-hand sides with ice and snow the horses grew all white domes of silence raised their hoofs and additional snow boots fixed on their hoofs they stumbled repeatedly twenty miles in a raging blizzard was an ordeal for them as much as for us but they knew they were nearing home and comfortable happy quarters there's no place like home was written on the knowing features of buck and billy who was none the worse for his adventure with his hobbles encouraged buck onward as it seemed that night when we had all changed our clothes and the horses were fed and housed and we sat and watched three foot logs flaming from a broad hearth we felt we had had an adventure we had gone far we had seen new life we had lived intimately with our horses for a week and it had been greatly worth while cigarette smoke rose from our chairs in meditative rings end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of in quest of el dorado by stephen graham this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nineteen the dance of the zuni indians at the end of november i went to cibola which had been the goal four hundred years ago of coronado and his companions i had hoped to ride over the ground of cortez's conquest of mexico first and then follow the adventures of coronado and his companions who followed the golden vision of cibola northward thus i should have kept to the historical sequence columbus in the indies fourteen ninety two balboa in the pacific fifteen thirteen Cortes and Montezuma, 1521, Coronado, 1541. But life and death break up elaborate plans. Since Wilfred Ewart had joined us in New Mexico, we decided to follow Coronado first and seek, as he did, the far-famed Seven Cities. We read the quaint Spanish narrative of Coronado's journey, and we set off, and it was at the time of the wonderful Chaleco dance. A colored gentleman in 1540 was greatly responsible for the legend of the Seven Cities, though he paid for it with his life. But it may be that the friars Marcos of Nice and Antonio of Santa Maria, who accompanied him, were more credulous. The black man is generally known as Stephen the Moor. All set off together, but the friars, not liking the smell of their companion's skin, bade him go ahead, and they would follow at a convenient distance. Stephen the Moor was not loth, and being of an adventurous spirit, he improved his opportunity, made love to Indian girls as he went along, and filled his bags with their turquoise. The friars lagged behind and spent so much time in prayers and hesitation that Stephen the Moor got to be 240 miles ahead of them. When he arrived at Cibola, they were only at Chichitacali. The Indians of Cibola would not believe the Blackamoor when he said he represented a white race and had a great white emperor. His complexion belied it. The Indians concluded it would be safer to kill him. They had never seen a black man before and were much perplexed. They did not believe Stephen the Moor's story, perhaps he could not understand it, but they evidently thought it safer to kill him than to let him go back to his tribe. 
So Stephen the Moor was choked, and the first discoverer of Cibola perished. His harem and the bags of turquoise were scattered. When the friars, toiling through the desert, heard of it, they were stricken with fear and gave away to the newsbearers all that they had except their vestments. They turned about precipitately and fled incontinently back to court, bringing the tale of a mighty race of Indians and another Montezuma, of riches incredible and a sway mightier than the empire of the Aztecs. Strangely enough, the friars believed their own story. Straight away, an expedition was fitted out of braggadocios and gallants, of noble desperados and desperate nobles, in short, the best blood in all New Spain. Coronado took the head, and would not Coronado outdo the deeds of the great Cortes himself? The almost fabulous wealth and splendor of Mexico had prepared the naturally credulous minds of the Spaniards for even the most fantastic things. So it did not prove difficult to man and equip an army to conquer Cibola. The vanguard was all of heroes. The rear was an ever-swelling army of camp followers. They rode five hundred leagues, the honored friars no longer timid accompanying. Their plump horses grew thin and weak, and the riders walked beside them and shouldered their own empty treasure sacks, hoping ever to feed and fill in the rich country beyond. But every day was one of cactus and wild, dusty waste. The hands of the prickly pears were dusty. Water was the rarest thing in the earth. But what did it matter? The rich, rare Cibola was near. Scores of times were the friars called upon to retell their story, and they abated no jot of the splendors. They sustained the courage of the army to cross one of the most dreadful wildernesses in the New World and the Spaniards thought themselves well on the way to India or the fabulous approaches to Tibet and Turkestan. When one reflects that this adventurous army, like that of Cortes, asked nothing else but gold, real fortune, one can understand the extent of their disillusion and chagrin. From a historical and geographical view, it was a most valuable and interesting expedition. But what did that matter to them? When they found Cibola and realized that it had no treasure, they journeyed another thousand miles in quest of it, the even more fantastic kingdom of Cadira, and the people of a weaker race than Spaniards would have vanished away and disappeared in the deserts, like the streams of the Rockies. There was a Cibola, there is a Cibola, and Cibola will be. It is one of the most undisturbed spots in the world. The Zuni Indians, who inhabited the seven cities, and who still live among the ruins of them, hold a remarkable belief. They are geoplanarians, and have always considered the earth to be flat, and at the extremities there is a danger of falling off. Our London, New York, Tokyo, San Francisco, Cape Town, Milbourne, and the rest, they would reckon highly dangerous, and quite truly. Ages ago, it is said, the guardian spirit led the Zuni tribes to the safest spot, that is, to the very center of the earth, the point furthest away from the edge. The sacred rock, Hepatana, in the Zuni land, today, as then, marks the center. There were a few thousand Indians in those cities when the Spaniards came, and there are a few thousand still. They live in houses of dried mud and of quarried stone. They are heavily and beautifully adorned with turquoise and silver. They are gentle and mild in character, but very firm of will, people of changeless purpose, and they have successfully withstood soldiers, missionaries, pioneers, commercial travelers, and tourists for 400 years. They are worshipers of nature gods and have a religion which is all playfulness, dance, and drama, very beautiful in its expression and evidently more real to them than the faith of the missionaries. I set out for Cibola on foot. Wilfred Ewart went by car. My starting point was the Penitente village of San Rafael in New Mexico. Nearly all the inhabitants there practice self-flagellation in Lent and are Spanish-speaking, not that their forefathers were followers of Coronado. The upper Rio Grande country was settled at a much later date, and then very sparsely and by people whose Catholicism was not entirely orthodox. The penitentes are a peculiar people, said by some to be an attempt to realize the third order of St. Francis, 
and quite possibly having their causa prima in the zeal of the Franciscans. Be that as it may, San Rafael is a widespread, untidy, and inhospitable settlement on a plain covered otherwise with innumerable volcanic cinders. The cactus alone of all the vegetable world seems at home among the gnarled and crusted and broken rocks and the blue-black cakes and slabs of volcanic asphalt. There are lines of tumble-down adobe houses down below, and three moradas or penitente chapels on the hills above. Among the inhabitants is a Jewish storekeeper, Solomon Bebo, once governor of the Indian Pueblo of Acoma nearby, and lord of the enchanted Mesa. Mesa, by the way, is our old friend Mensa, a table, with the end left out, and it means in Spanish, a table land. As the main characteristic of the country is the dark, sharp-edged tableland, we may have frequently to refer to mesas. As a young man, Solomon Bebo came into these parts and sold goods by the wayside, sold them to the Indians, started a trading post, married an Indian girl, won his way to the hearts and the councils of the Acoma Indians, who, by the way, 400 years before, from the height of their mesa, fiercely withstood Coronado. And Solomon, who must have learned their language and danced their dances, entered the tribe and was elected governor. That partly answers the question of why Jews are not seen to go to Aberdeen. Why should they, when they can go to Acoma and become, as it were, princes? However, Saul Bebo had had his day at the Pueblo, and was now leading storekeeper in San Rafael among these less congenial, though not less profitable, penitente Spaniards. Epiphany brought me my horse, and we set off. To Cibola from San Rafael is somewhat over 80 miles, through the Zuni Mountains and the Mormon village of Rama, getting on to what used to be a great but desolate highway in Spanish times from the south to the north. The trail climbed upward from the warmer lower levels of the lava beds and wound into mazes of great rock debris, up to banks of unmelted snow and long snow trails where spruce and pinion blurted from the rocks. We reached wide, untrammeled fields of snow and entered a snowstorm which enveloped us in white veils. Epiphany took a blanket from under his horse and tied it about his shoulders, and I put on my gloves and turned up my collar. We cantered the horses through the snow, even galloped, for the snow made the Spaniard uneasy, and he urged speed. His horse, Diamond, did not look as if he would last out, but his master had no doubts, and though he plunged and stumbled and got into holes, Epiphany merely swore at him, pulled him up, and urged him on the faster. When the snowstorm lifted, Epiphany seemed to be more at ease, but he had broken one of his stirrups, and that forced him to a steady trot. We rode across to a deserted cabin, and he sought some wire to mend the stirrup whilst I opened a can of tongue and cut up a rough lunch. Epiphany then admitted he had never been to Rama before in his life, though he had heard that it was Mormon and you could have more than one wife. This tickled his mind a good deal, and he said, I'll write to my girl when we get there to come and be my first wife. And while he spoke, he arduously wound alfalfa wire about the wooden foot cage of his stirrup. We must go much faster now, he cried, for the Mexican who is so slow over everything else is very impatient on horseback. Epiphany cantered uphill or downhill and over stones and holes in a mad style, not merely for a hundred yards or so, but over leagues. We emerged onto a magnificent snow-covered plateau and plunged gaily across it, not guessing that there were twenty miles of it, and that it was not to be conquered in an hour. Over all the white prairie the tops of withered stems poked through the snow, and you knew the trail by the absence of the stems and a shadow of vague indentation. Rosy mesas called to the woods and to us from a far horizon, and slowly, as we rode, there came into view what looked like a great white castle or cathedral, fully ten miles away, but glittering in late sunlight. I felt I could not be mistaken. This must be the famous Mesa Escrita, or inscription rock, as the Americans call it, whereon Spanish explorers and travelers have written their names even from the time of Oñate. 
as it stands hard by the road to rama we made for it and rode nearly two hours toward it before it seemed to grow near us but by then the snow clouds had returned eager air swept the plateau with earfuls of snow and wisps of brown drift evening dusk was closing rapidly in and it looked as if we should be out in the storm all night when we espied a mexican rancher coming toward us on a horse this was Queromillo, returning from Rama to his cabin with a sack of flour, and he advised us to spend the night with him. So we rode back to a tiny adobe hut whose door was bolted from within, and the little old man let himself in at a window and then undid the bolt. It was like an ice house inside, but we readily unsaddled our horses and led them into the corral and then lit a fire in the hut and put on pots to boil. It then rapidly grew hot, and we stretched ourselves out on the clay floor, drank coffee, munched bread and cheese, and fried salmon from a tin. Night had come down outside and hid the great rock, which we were so near, and when I went out to look at the horses, a three ways blowing snow tempest made whirls of snow dust in the air. Curiously enough, the moon was shining behind the storm and lit up the snow-swept little cabin and barn with a dim turnip lantern light. There was not much comfort in Caromillo's house. We slept on the clay floor, but even it could impart a feeling of home in the midst of such a storm. But the Mexicans were strange men to be quartered with. Epiphany, who had torn a shirt riding through the thorns, took that garment off with some idea of mending it, and his bare back was all scarred with the marks of his penitente creed. Flippant and cynical in his conversation, light-hearted certainly, and yet he was bound in the ascetic traditions and gloomy piety of his people. I would not ask him about his religion, yet I wondered if he ever would be crucified and hang on a penitente cross till he fainted, as so many of them do. Next morning there was a silver dawn. The Mesa Escrita was all encrusted and hanging with snow. It had taken on an aspect of the fantastic and hardly belonged to this world. And as we rode toward it, because of the mists, it grew further away. I saw it, as it were, removed into the past with wanderers remaining there from a bygone age. I would have liked to write my name also on the great rock. I came and I passed. But being on our horses, we did not stay. We left our footprints in the snow. The snow was deep, the silence was utter, even our horses made not the slightest sound as they padded over the trackless waste of snow. Snow veils hurried across the mesas, snow descended upon us and hid us all from view. Thus it was that on Thanksgiving morning we got lost and neither of us could say which was the way. We rode up to the stone giants, a hundred or a hundred and fifty feet high, standing at the entrance to the canyon de los gigantos, and they looked down at us with their snow-crowned heads. We rode to ranch houses, only to find them empty of human beings as their buyers were devoid of cattle. Epiphany saw a dark figure in the snow and spurred hard after it, and I followed, and we came up with a fleeing Indian squaw and a dog, and she would say nothing but plunged abruptly into the bush. When we found her again, it was in a hogan, a shelter only one-third covered from the snow. There was a fire burning, and the squaw sat herself down in front of it and would answer not either to Spanish or to English questions. Her little children stared at us, and her dog sat on their haunches about the fire. We got nothing from her, but, to cut a story short, we went after that by compass and map and got to Voigt's ranch, and being Thanksgiving Day, there was a grand spread of turkey and cranberry sauce and many preserves, and very pretty girls to look at and intelligent people to talk to. The storm and the wilderness had been suddenly changed for civilization. I went that night to a Mormon wedding dance at Rama. Mr. Voigt is the official curator of Inscription Rock, and has done a great deal to preserve the remarkable surface, which is scrawled not only with the names of famous Spaniards, but with the pictographs and hieroglyphics of the cave dwellers. It has certainly been a great cave-dwelling region at one time. Voigt took me behind his ranch house to a well-preserved village of cave dwellings. 
he found when he bought the property he had bought this prehistoric village also natural caves had been added to by the hollowing out of the rock and the houses partitioned off and the wind walled off with piled rocks and mud the theory is that the people of cibola to defend themselves from the apaches comanches and navajos took to caves at one time but of course theories innumerable could be brought forward no one has learned to read the hieroglyphics one especially good service mr voigt has performed as curator of the rock and that is to have erased the names of a score or so of modern visitors who with a nonchalance which is almost sublime had written their names down with those of the conquistadores the winklesteins of chicago the joneses of jonesville this mesa escrita is however little visited for it is thirty or forty miles from cibola or zuni and those who go to the indian pueblo seldom go further it is in part of the most remote country of america as the zunis themselves think it is the place furthest from the edge hence i suppose the mormon settlement of rama for the mormons being a persecuted sect have ever sought out places where they were not likely to be disturbed rama is an american village not a mexican or indian in type but a bit of north america all little wooden houses and neatly fenced yards we drove to the wedding dance and i talked to the bishop and the elders and found a rather sad lot of mormons where after all far from polygamy being practiced there were not enough girls to go around the eligible brides seemed mostly pale and thin with what devotion the mormon young men clasped betty and catherine who unlike the mormon girls were well-formed open-air girls full of life and desire another day passed and we drove to zuni it was the last stage there was deep snow and mist over it with vague sunset lights wandering in the mist upon the mesas i saw the first two of the cities of cibola in the ruins in which coronado left them and there in the midst i saw a third of the cities but greater and grander with towers and domes and unlike anything indians ever built golden and rose lights of sunset tinted the shadowy outline i said to voigt and his nieces look cibola but even as i did so it had gone melted into the general configuration of the mesas of zuni it was coronado's mirage seen again and his disillusionment it was dark when we arrived at the real cibola the strange and unwanted city which the spaniards found the home far from the haunts of other men of the wonderful zuni tribe with their coal-black hair bright-colored little turbans turquoise earrings bead necklaces and silver rings and bracelets and brooches and cinctures with their elaborate dances and religious rituals and a nature worship against which catholicism has never been able to make way when we entered the first large house we saw that the chaleco birds had already come down from the mountains and in each of the chaleco houses prayers were being chanted by the indians Zuni's halls were all alight with large lamps and hung with every kind of glittering wampum. There were great white beams and white walls decorated with dados of printed cotton. There were ropes along the walls, and there hung silver belts and sarapes, waist swaths, deerskins, shawls, beautiful blankets, necklaces. There were bowls of the sacred meal upon the floor, and a long line of sprinkled meal led up to what seemed to be an altar, the chaleco altar in front of that stood motionless the framework and vest of the chaleco bird as it was being consecrated and the indians chanted unendingly prayers and incantations along the wall stood visiting indians chiefly navajos wrapped in their resplendent blankets waiting and silent up till midnight however the chief activity seemed to be in the kitchens where a great feast was being prepared the kitchens were large enough for stacks of joints of meat to be piled up, and along the whole length of the walls flamed log fires with a dozen high old earthenware pots simmering upon them. The odor of the joints was almost overpowering, but it was pleasantly blended with the smoke which went up the vast vent to the hollow wall. Old squaws with bent backs tended pots and flames, and they wore long, bright, 
kerchiefs on their heads and down their backs. Certainly, they never knew how cold it was outside. We went to Pablito and Emily, fanciful names of an Indian and his wife. Their true names they will seldom divulge. They gave us a room and blankets, in case we could snatch a few hours' sleep now and then. Pablito's house was a strange hive of activity. It had a long corridor which led to a bakehouse, and through our room and along this corridor went a procession of squaws carrying pumpkins so heavy we interceded now and then to help them, and carrying tubs of chili con carne, roast meat and chili, and the frijoles, beans. At eleven we all lay down to try to sleep, the girls chaffing one another a great deal. I had expected to meet Wilfred Ewart and the poet Whitner Biner at the Zuni dance, and we heard they had arrived, but in these first hours they eluded us. I do not know whether it was the expectation of meeting Ewart or Biner or merely the spirit of the age, but the two pretty nieces, of which perhaps Betty was the more vain, though who can say, insisted on curling their hair at one in the morning. They had brought curling tongs with them, and so relit the oil lamp and heated the tongs in the glass chimney and laboriously curled each beautiful lock. We men watched them from the floor with half-closed eyes. Then we got up also and sallied forth into the ice-bound streets and visited the shrines again. By that time, the Indians had feasted their guests, and all the dances were in full activity where before in the hall of a chaleco house had been the drone and the stillness of prayers before a shrine there was now the gaiety of marvelous ritual dances and nature ballets the chaleco and the mudheads were dancing together i imagine that chaleco is the spanish name for the bird god of the zuni indians chaleco is spanish for a vest and the chief characteristic of the bird god is his beautiful embroidered vests which hang over interior hoops and fold over one another. The bird is nine or ten feet high. Imagine, therefore, how high the rooms in which he dances. He is an astonishing bird. He wears a sun halo of eagle's feathers, he has horns of turquoise color, and at his throat is a voluminous black ruff of thickly clustered little feathers. Black holes are his eyes, and his beak is a long, straight, cleft piece of wood, which opens and shuts and clack clacks in menace or in mirth. The embroidered vests below are of turquoise color fading toward green. Inside all this, of course, is a hidden Indian, hidden in all except his moccasins. The mudheads, in contrast to the chalecos, were almost naked and were ugly. Their bodies were painted mud color, adobe color, and they wore over their natural heads a mask of misshapenness. They looked like badly made men of mud, as if some journeyman had made the man. There were knobs on their heads, finger holes for eyes. They had protruding bottleneck mouths. They wore no jewelry, but round their middles they hung a slit kilt of black material, and as they danced their bare mud-colored hips slipped in and out. I was told they represented in mythology the offspring of a brother and a sister. Their function, however, was that of clowns. I took their real symbolism to mean human beings in the presence of the nature god, absurd and ugly. When the Chalecos had returned to the mountains, I noticed that the mudheads took off their masks and danced seriously and beautifully again. But in the strange midnight, the chalecos in the dance constantly chased them. There was something whimsical in the expression of the chaleco, especially when it leaped forward dancing from the shrine. It ran like a bird and squeaked and clack-clacked as it ran. Catherine Voigt took the attention of the chaleco directly as she entered the first hall. Was it her bright red tam o' shanter or her curled locks? I cannot say but he flew at her across the room so that she retreated whilst the bird with the lightest of turns had checked its speedy advance and was returning to the shrine and the four mud heads present were murmuring and spluttering and step dancing back and forth in ungainly gestures and the chorus of singers and drummers at the back of the room kept the throb of time scores of indians watched from the sides Scores crowded the doorways, the light of the large lamps above was warm and bright, and the dancing never ceased. 
we went from house to house. At another house, a band of Zunis were dancing a Navajo dance in honor of the Navajo's president. At another, the Longhorns were dancing. The Longhorns had mitered heads of red and blue, masked, hidden faces, black feather ruffs at the throat like that of the chaleco, but bare body and legs and beautiful brown moccasins. They carried in their hands spears of horn and a bunch of twigs. In their dance, the chief movement was a running forward with bent knees like a Roman soldier, spear in hand. But they smote no one till the dance was over next day. Then, I believe, they smote every one they could. In another hall danced a buckskin-headed child of Don with a white taper-like point on the height of his head and a crimson diadem set with silver conches about his brow. A beautiful and serene figure and one of the most delicate of the dancers. It was in the house where he was dancing that I met the poet Biner, tired and yet spellbound. This is the most beautiful of them all, I think, he said. The dance was pure poetry to him. In another room danced the fire god, naked, black, and ugly. His whole body was soot-colored, and he had, like a string about his middle, the meanest of loincloths. Far from being a fire god, he seemed an uncouth savage. But with him danced two chaleco birds, a longhorn and six mudheads, and they made an astonishing medley. Away in a corner, long-haired, long-faced, sat the chorus, with wide-open mouths, never ceasing their ho-i-o, ho-ho-ho, ha-ha-ha, and beating on their tiny drums. Resplendent scarlet and orange colors lined the walls, the blanket cloaks of the tall, moorish-looking Navajo Indians. Wampum glittered on every wall. Eyes glittered also, Glittered also the embroidered vests and strange blue horns of the chaleco birds. Only the mudheads made dissonance and disharmony, bubbling through their mud masks and calling out obscenities and bad jokes and posturing misshapenness. But all moved back and forth, back and forth, tripping it, turning, marking time, waving hands to the time of the tom-toms in the corner. What the Spaniards of Coronado thought of all this has not been recorded. Their eyes sought gold, but this is not a gold country. The Indians do not wear it, do not seek it. Even to take all their silver and turquoise away is not to equal one or even one-tenth of the value of one of Montezuma's presents to Hernán Cortés. They must have been annoyed. The chalecos, the mudheads, the longhorns, had they ridden five hundred leagues to see these? They had no poets with them only brutal soldiers and vulgar priests. They were even capable of burning these innocent Indians alive and proposed, as a lesson in their Christianity, to burn two hundred of them at once in one day. Even that was a waste of time when the question of gold was in the mind. Behold, a clever Indian has started the story of Golden Cavira and will lead Coronado a thousand miles further into the desert, away from Cibola, which asks only to be left in peace. The Spaniards in southern Mexico found gems innumerable and gold without price, and they obliterated without a thought Aztec culture. But in the north they found nothing but sand and cactus, and so left the Indians, for the most part, at peace. So today, at the center of the earth, the Chalecos still come down from the mountains and dance for the children of Cibola. We watched them till dawn, then we returned to our room. Emily, our little Zuni hostess, was sleeping in my blanket on the floor and was alarmed and about to get up again when she saw us return, but I gently put her back down on the floor and patted her on the cheek so that she settled down to sleep again. The rest of us lay down on the floor in the miscellany of blankets and wraps and slept as we could for an hour or two till the sun came up. For it had been a tiring night even for us, who merely looked on. Only next noon did I encounter Wilfred Ewart, though he also had been pilgrimaging from room to room and dance to dance the whole night long, which shows how much was happening in Zuni when two friends could thus miss one another all night. What happens today? he asked of a tall, friendly Indian standing bareheaded in the snow. Shall I go way back up into the mountains, not come for another year? 
said he playfully, way up, no come for another year. Next year Shaleko come again. And in a little while the six Shaleko birds came out of the houses and crossed the river, and the Longhorns came, and the Fire God, and the one I call Child of Dawn, and they danced in the snow which had melted under noonday sun and in the mud. First the Longhorns danced alone, then they returned to the Pueblo and its streets and roofs, and smote men and women on their backs. Once, thwack, twice, thwack, while the fleet-footed Chalecos danced by the river's edge. Hundreds of men and women watched from the housetops of the Pueblo. Over a hundred horsemen, with gay kerchiefs about their brows, stood on the further side of the river with the Chalecos, and five or six cars with American sightseers were drawn up also. The mighty mountains, the Butte and the Twin Butte, immemorially sacred, looked down at the scene across the snows. Then the Longhorns returned from smiting the village and danced again with the great strange Chaleco birds. The hundred horsemen suddenly galloped away toward the mountains, and the Chalecos and Longhorns began to move rapidly away from the Pueblo. And I stood with Wilfred Ewart in the snow and shine of that fair afternoon and watched them fade from our eyes. Shalaiko has gone away to the mountains. Shalaiko not come again for another year, said I softly, echoing the Indian. By Jove, cried Wilfred, as if waking from a reverie. That was fine. This has been the best of all. And then Wilfred had to go, for he was one in a crowd in a car and I was left behind when almost everyone else had gone. And at night I saw the mudheads dance again, this time without their masks and showing their true features. Two old men stood, one on each side of the sacred shrine. They balanced eagle feathers while they danced, now and then dipping the feathers in the sacred meal. The drum men beat the drums and hallooed, and the brown men danced and perspired. The shalekos, alas, were gone. The mudheads had become ourselves, now repentant and prayerful, and asking the blessings from the bird. End of chapter 19。Chapter 20 of In Quest of El Dorado by Stephen Graham。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Chapter 20 – Descent into the Grand Canyon its discovery was part of the fruitless quest of El Dorado by Coronado, the greatest hole in the world and nothing in it. He had hoped to find another Mexico in the north and to spoil it of its jewels. Like the vandal he was, he plunged into the American Sahara to loot another Rome. Cibola and Cavira were his glittering dreams. He rode, in all, two thousand miles, cactus and alkali-whitened plains all the way. He fought not men, but deserts. Instead of storied Cibola, he found the mud huts of the Zuni Indians, rich only in their personal adornments of turquoise and silver. And instead of fantastic Kavira with princes and golden arbor, he found, near the great bend of the Arkansas River, the tent dwellers of what is now Wichita. The mirage of El Dorado appeared constantly before him and his followers. His horsemen wandered in many directions, seeking tidings of gold or of kingdoms to conquer. And one of them came, as was inevitable, to the great gap in the earth, hundreds of miles long, leagues across, leagues, as it seemed, downward, the Canyon del Grande, and the descent of it was a descent to the hidden heart of the world. It added one more fantastic page to the story of the King of Spain's new lands, wherein of entres vast and deserts idle, much was spoken. Geologists do not agree as to the number of thousands of years ago the accident occurred which made the canyon. We shall, therefore, appear pathetically human in our narrow gaze if we say, now nearly 400 years have passed since the Spaniards discovered it. There are dwellings of cavemen on the northern cliff, inaccessible as the nests of the white eagles who stare from the ledges. And yet it does mean something to us living now that it is nearly 400 years since our civilization took cognizance of the Grand Canyon, this bit of chaos left over at the creation of the world. 
we have tamed niagara with powerhouses and they have put lunch counters among the branches of the giant trees of california nearly all the natural wonders of america have been altered but the grand canyon remains changeless and unchangeable it is true it has become a wonder gaze for tourists a stopover twixt los angeles and chicago but there is nothing in that ninety-six in every hundred of those who visit the canyon merely look at it go along the rim spend a night at the railway hotel and resume their journey the next day but four in a hundred venture down into the abyss after going to Cibola, Ewart and I decided to leave this part of the country, but before departing, we went to the Grand Canyon together. So, with knapsacks on our shoulders, we left New Mexico for the wilderness of northern Arizona, and we determined to walk down into the depths of the canyon from the snow and ice of the dreadful plateau down to the flowers blooming and gentle airs. Early one morning in December, therefore, we stood on the verge and in its sublimity its first awful grandeur was disclosed its gigantic abysses and gray-green pyramids its rosy castellated heights gleaming with sunshine some hole in the wall i'd say cried a mr babbitt consuming a stack of hot cakes at the harvey lunch counter me to hike it down there not on your life the trail is heavily frosted steep and narrow it is even difficult to stop oneself in the first slides that are strides. Both of us sat down suddenly and unpremeditatedly once or twice. We held on to scrub and jagged rock, footing the snow gingerly. But something of a magic had taken us. The rock walls and long slabs looked at us, came up to us, stared at us. There was a new morning silence in which occasionally we heard the wings of tiny birds fluttering as it were climbing the outer stairway or stone spiral of some great dungeon or keep built on a mighty rock so we looked out over abysses and were granted at moments unexpected views of frowning and dreadful cliffs the eyes spoke to the mind of vaster surfaces and greater bulks of rock than it had yet known and an intellectual perspective was obtained going downward rapidly we met trees made tiny, and they started to our feet like feathers. Rocks, which from above had been merely formalized bulks, gained in character as if we were approaching drawbridges of fantastic castles. Old red pyramids, torn by ages, stood before us in awful actuality, exhibiting the myriad scars and crusts of time. The trail, an Indian one, was there before Spaniards came, for the Indians used it and walked it nearly a hundred miles. But it is improved now and made safe for the tourist on a mule, safer still for the man upon his feet. The descent is naturally rapid. One strides over hundreds, over thousands of feet, which it is labor indeed to climb up. One moment, one is facing the great cream and pale green fissured wall of the upper limestone, the keystone, as it is called, at the next breathing space, you are below that and facing Red Cliff, which develops before the downward-going eyes into a mighty wall, whilst the cream rock is left far above you, a cliff in the sky. At 3,000 feet below, all the cold airs have gone. There are green leaves on the trees. The flowers of the willow herb have gone to seed, but the leaves are tender. Japanese sunflowers are still poised, blooming in the sunshine, and where spring water comes freshening from rock walls, the gentle violet snuggles and is at home. But we come out on an exposed plateau above the madly rushing Colorado River, but below the main masses of the ravine. Between wall and wall of the canyon rise gigantic isolated rocks as if there were a city built in the trough of the river. Rim to rim, the gap is 16 miles across, so there is verge enough and ample space for adamantine temples, pavilions, and towers. The plateau is boulder-strewn and only enlivened by the iris-like yucca stems and by small pink cactus and prickly pear. On our left is an appalling great red fortress of stone whose sheer wall cuts across the life-light of the zenith, and on our right and below us 
is the rock cleavage of the hidden Colorado River, whilst above us, in a seraphically serene noonday, bask the domes of isolated rocks fantastically named, and yet aptly named, too, the Temple of Shiva, the Temple of Isis, the Temple of Buddha. On the left, as we walk on, comes into view, far aloft, a cream-colored sky castle, all happy in the sun. But, lowering the eyes, there resumes its sway the fortress whose great wall we are turning, and we begin to see its vast blood-red and green base. We walk into a cold shadow which seems as substantial as the rocks themselves, and we cross the broad, stony scarp of precipitous cliffs, going downward till we come right under what seems an ancient castle. Out of fairyland or the England of the Mort de Arthur, a quadrilateral of blood in a hideous pool of darkness. But no giant sallied forth with blood-stained axe. No one is at home in any fortress, castle, tower, or temple, no more than in the rooms of the stone and mud-closed caves of the cliff-dwellers. Not even a tourist, no, not a mule. Only, certainly, wild asses in great numbers, wherever there is any pasture, uncatchable donkeys who sneeze at you at the most unexpected moments. Ewart and I sat by a spring at noon and rested and talked whilst the tumbling water spoke to us also, and we boiled a pot over dry weeds and bits of cactus later on and had our lunch. It was a happy moment. There was a sense of escape as if we had gone to Southern California or Mexico and got away from the rigorous winter of the exalted deserts of the South. My George, Ewart cried, I nearly took a toss-up above. What have you on your boots? I have nails. I had rubber on mine. Yes, I could not get a foothold on that ice. I was reduced to hands and knees. Curious, they say they have no human accidents here. The last accident was when eight horses yoked together and laden with TNT went over the brink and fell a sheer five hundred feet. I did not hear that. Yes, one of the horses was new to the canyon and proved unruly. He fouled his neighbor and he slipped over the side, pulling all seven horses after him. That must have been a terrible splash. But the TNT did not explode. No. The horses were all killed instantaneously, though. They jumped right out of their skins. You'd think the Grand Canyon would tempt suicides. It's certain and sudden death. Dramatic and spectacular, too. Too much time for reflection and meditation before you get here, I hazarded. The man coming to commit suicide changes his mind before he gets here and goes down on a mule instead. Ewart laughed. You are a fellow who ought to be cautious, I said after a while. Why, especially? Because I don't think, strictly speaking, that you are over-lucky. You are a person who has had bad accidents. I've known you in three, any one of which might have cost you your life. Well, I don't know, said Ewart. I'd say I was lucky. I've come through the war and two motor accidents and escaped with my life up till now. He jumped nervously. Oh, he cried unexpectedly. Uber oofen. He turned around him to find a piece of wood to touch. But there was no wood handy. We were in a woodless ravine. He seemed quite anxious and snatched at a piece of dead cactus. I laughed heartily. What do you mean by uber oofen? I cried. I think one ought not to be too sure, said Wilfred solemnly. What a fix to be in a place with no wood to touch, I said mirthfully. Supposing under such circumstances one was to touch one's head, implying modestly that it was the nearest thing to wood one could find, do you think the fate that watches over us would be appeased? Ewart smiled. We talked of President Wilson, who was superstitiously unsuperstitious. An extraordinary thing. He did things for preference on the 13th of the month, sat down to 13 at dinner, sailed on the 13th of the month in cabin number 13, all set of purpose. He has turned out to be frightfully unlucky, we agreed. Time to make a move now, if we're going to reach shelter for the night. What do you think? Again, we lifted our knapsacks and footed it across the stones, to rose-red mountains and cream and green pavilions of stone. 
Next time we sat to rest and to share an orange together, we faced, as it were, an encampment of all the mountains. There were giant steps from the northern heights down, down to the Black River, and there was a sound of rivers running in the rocks like many rats. We walked to the great slides which overtopped the waters, to the hundred ledges of the serried gray rock which makes the river's bed. Then we passed into vast mountain chambers where, despite company, you felt you were alone whilst judges and distributors of dooms considered you. Afternoon grew to dusk of evening, and the trail was harder to keep. Monument Creek rushed from underground and its short course to the receiving Colorado. We were baffled with the way. Sunset rays far above made roseate the peaks and the ridges, but rapidly faded down below as if the light would not carry to us. And night closed sharply in with starlight and the swelling magnificence of all that was material in the womb of the earth. Our quest had then become the hermit cabin, or camp as it is called, a place wherein to spend the night. Darkness almost hid the vague Tonto Trail, and the way as we traced it grew much wilder. There were many slippery rocks and queer drops which it seemed to us not even a mule could have taken. We began to think, not unhappily, of a night in a cave or under some overhanging ledge of the cliff, when, far away, we espied a lost light that flickered uncertainly in the darkness. That, indubitably, must be the little rest house on the fast-running Hermit River, and we took heart from the light and made for it. We came to the door, and no dog barked. All was utterly silent. We opened the door and faced a man and his wife who were working at a kitchen table on which was spread the most unlikely things to find at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Sugar plums, yes, bright red, green, and yellow squares of candy dusted with white sugar. In their spare time in the long winter evenings, the keeper and his spouse made these sugar plums from the pith of the cactus and sold them later for a fair reward. For cactus candy is a good sweet, one made by the Indians before the white man came. So we dined with the keeper and were given candy for dessert and we listened to many curious tales of the canyon and admired the skins of the wildcats the keeper had shot. Then we walked out into the balmy night air and looked up to the flame points of the stars and the golden lines of their rays. The moon came up slowly from behind some black, vast prison wall of stone, and she dimmed the stars. Then the grandeur of moonlight filled the canyon as if it were a precious basin. We slept down below the moon and stars and crags upon a happy earth, and all night long the temples of Shiva and Isis and Buddha and the blood-red castle and the white cliff palaces stared into the Arizona sky. And we heard no coyote cry, nor felt one chill breath of the snowland above us. Next day the naked light of dawn lighted up stark cliffs and jagged sky pointers and the green cabins of hermit camp, under their yellow umbrellas of wilted aspens. And we climbed up from the depth into the cold heights once more. The mountains on all hands grew up with us as we climbed, and towered above and were measured by us, and sank at last beneath us and remained down in the gap with the rushing river and the silences that are below. We looked down at sunset four thousand feet from the rim to the river, and we reflected that, in a way, the canyon had possessed us wholly and we in our hearts possessed only part of it. It voided us out at the top. It plumbed our hearts. It took away our breaths. It turned the last page of the word books of our minds. End of chapter 20